Chapter 1 of Louise de la Vallière. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snoza, Houston, Texas, February 2013. Louise de la Vallière by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 1. Malaga. During all these long and noisy debates between the opposite ambitions of politics and love, one of our characters, perhaps the one least deserving of neglect, was, however, very much neglected, very much forgotten, and exceedingly unhappy. In fact, D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan, we say, for we must call him by his name to remind our readers of his existence, D'Artagnan, we repeat, had absolutely nothing whatever to do amidst these brilliant butterflies of fashion. After following the king during two whole days at Fontainebleau, and critically observing the various pastoral fancies and heroic comic transformations of his sovereign, the musketeer felt that he needed something more than this to satisfy the cravings of his nature. At every moment, assailed by people asking him, "'How do you think this costume suits me, Monsieur d'Artagnan?' he would reply to them in quiet, sarcastic tones. "'Why, I think you're quite as well-dressed as the best-dressed monkey to be found at the fair at Saint Laurent. It was just such a compliment d'Artagnan would choose when he did not feel disposed to pay any other, and whether agreeable or not, the inquirer was obliged to be satisfied with it. Whenever anyone asked him, How do you intend to dress yourself this evening? He replied, I shall undress myself, at which the ladies all laughed, and a few of them blushed. But after a couple of days passed in this manner, the musketeer, perceiving that nothing serious was likely to arise which would concern him, and that the king had completely, or at least appeared to have completely forgotten Paris, saint mandé and Belle-Isle, that Monsieur Colbert's mind was occupied with illuminations and fireworks, that, for the next month at least, the ladies had plenty of glances to bestow, and also to receive in exchange, D'Artagnan asked the king for leave of absence for a matter of private business. At the moment D'Artagnan made his request, his majesty was on the point of going to bed, quite exhausted from dancing. "'You wish to leave me, Monsieur D'Artagnan?' inquired the king, with an air of astonishment, for Louis XIV could never understand why anyone who had the distinguished honor of being near him could wish to leave him. "'Sire,' said D'Artagnan, "'I leave you simply because I am not of the slightest service to you in anything. Ah!' If I could only hold the balancing pole while you were dancing, it would be a very different affair. But, my dear Monsieur d'Artagnan, said the king gravely, people dance without balancing poles. Ah, indeed, said the musketeer, continuing his imperceptible tone of irony. I had no idea such a thing was possible. You have not seen me dance, then? inquired the king. Yes, but I always thought dancers went from easy to difficult acrobatic feats. I was mistaken. All the more greater reason, therefore, that I should leave for a time. Sire, I repeat, you have no present occasion for my services. Besides, if your majesty should have any need of me, you would know where to find me. Very well, said the king, and he granted him leave of absence. We shall not look for d'Artagnan, therefore, at Fontainebleau, for to do so would be useless, but with the permission of our readers, follow him to the Rue de Lombard, where he was located at the sign of the Pilon d'Or, in the house of our old friend Planchet. It was about eight o'clock in the evening, and the weather was exceedingly warm. There was only one window open, and that one belonging to a room on the entresol. A perfume of spices mingled with another perfume, less exotic, but more penetrating, namely, that which arose from the street, ascended to salute the nostrils of the musketeer. D'Artagnan, reclining in an immense straight-backed chair, with his legs not stretched out, but simply placed upon a stool, formed an angle of the most obtuse form that could possibly be seen. Both his arms were crossed over his head, his head reclining upon his left shoulder like Alexander the Great. His eyes, usually so quick and intelligent in their expression, were now half-closed, and seemed fastened, as it were, upon a small corner of blue sky that was visible behind the opening of the chimneys, there was just enough blue, and no more, to fill one of the sacks of lentils or haricot, which formed the principal furniture of the shop on the ground floor. 
Thus extended at his ease, and sheltered in his place of observation behind the window, D'Artagnan seemed as if he had ceased to be a soldier, as if he were no longer an officer belonging to the palace, but was, in the contrary, a quiet, easy-going citizen in a state of stagnation between his dinner and supper, or between his supper and his bed, one of those strong, ossified brains which have no more room for a single idea. So fiercely does animal matter keep watch at the doors of intelligence, narrowly inspecting the contraband trade which might result from the introduction into the brain of a symptom of thought. We have already said night was closing in. The shops were being lighted, while the windows of the upper apartments were being closed, and the rhythmic steps of a patrol of soldiers forming the night watch could be heard retreating. D'Artagnan continued, however, to think of nothing except the blue corner of the sky. A few paces from him, completely in the shade, lying on his stomach upon a sack of Indian corn, was Planchet, with both arms under his chin and his eyes fixed on D'Artagnan, who was either thinking, dreaming, or sleeping with his eyes open. Planchet had been watching him for a tolerably long time, and by a way of interruption, he began by exclaiming, Hm, hm! But D'Artagnan did not stir. Planchet then saw it was necessary to have recourse to more effectual means still, after a prolonged reflection on the subject. The most ingenious means that suggested itself to him under the present circumstances was to let himself roll off the sack onto the floor, murmuring at the same time against himself the word stupid. But, notwithstanding the noise produced by Planchet's fall, D'Artagnan who had in the course of his existence heard many other and very different falls, did not appear to pay the least attention to the present one. Besides, an enormous cart laden with stones passing from the Rue Saint-Médéric absorbed in the noise of its wheels the noise of Planchet's tumble. And yet, Planchet fancied that, in token of tacit approval, he saw him imperceptibly smile at the word stupid. This emboldened him to say, Are you asleep, Monsieur d'Artagnan? "'No, Planchet, I am not even asleep,' replied the musketeer. "'I am in despair,' said Planchet, "'to hear such a word as even.' "'Well, and why not? "'Is it not a grammatical word, Monsieur Planchet?' "'Of course, Monsieur d'Artagnan. "'Well?' "'Well, then, the word distresses me beyond measure.' "'Tell me why you are distressed, Planchet,' said d'Artagnan. "'If you say that you are not even asleep, "'it is as much to say that you have not even.' Even the consolation of being able to sleep, or better still, it is precisely the same as telling me that you are getting bored to death. Planchet, you know that I am never bored, except today and the day before yesterday. Bah! Monsieur d'Artagnan, it is a week since you returned here from Fontainebleau. In other words, you have no longer your orders to issue or your men to review and maneuver. You need the sound of guns drums, and all that din of confusion. I, who have myself carried a musket, can easily believe that. Planchet replied d'Artagnan, I assure you that I am not bored in the least in the world. In that case, what are you doing lying there as if you were dead? My dear Planchet, there was once upon a time, at the seas of La Rochelle, when I was there, when you were there, when we both were there, a certain Arab, who was celebrated for the manner in which he adjusted Culvertin, he was a clever fellow, although of a very odd complexion, which was the same color as your olives. Well, this Arab, whenever he had done eating or working, used to sit down to rest himself, as I am resting myself now, and smoked, I cannot tell you what sort of magical leaves, in a large amber-mouthed tube, and if any officers happening to pass reproached him for being always asleep, he used to quietly reply, Better to sit down than to stand up, to lie down than to sit down, to be dead than to lie down. He was an acutely melancholy Arab, and I remember him perfectly well, from the color of his skin and the style of his conversation. He used to cut off the heads of Protestants with the most singular gusto. Precisely, and then he used to embalm them when they were worth the trouble, and when he was thus engaged with his herbs and plants around him, he looked like a basket-maker making baskets." You are quite right, Planchet, he did. Oh, I can remember things very well at times. I have no doubt of it. But what do you think of his mode of reasoning? I think it is good in one sense, but very stupid in another. Expound your meaning, Monsieur Planchet. Well, Monsieur, in point of fact, then, better to sit down than to stand up is plain enough, especially when one may be fatigued. 
and Planchet smiled in a roguish way. As for better to be lying down, let that pass. But for the last proposition, that is, better to be dead than alive, it is, in my opinion, very absurd, my own undoubted preference being for my bed, and if you are not of my opinion, it is simply as I have already had the honor of telling you, because you are boring yourself to death. Planchet, do you know Monsieur de La Fontaine, the chemist at the corner of the Rue Saint-Médéric? No, the writer of fables. Oh, Maître Corbeau! Exactly. Well, then, I am like his hair. He has got a hair also, then? He has all sorts of animals. Well, what does his hair do, then? Monsieur La Fontaine's hair thinks. Ah, ah! Planchet, I am like that hair. I am thinking. What are you thinking, you say? said Planchet uneasily. You are thinking, you say, said Planchet uneasily. Yes, your house is dull enough to drive people to think. You will admit that, I hope. And yet, monsieur, you have a look out upon the street. Yes, and wonderfully interesting that is, of course. But it is no less true, monsieur, that if you were living at the back of the house, you would bore yourself. I mean, you would think more than ever. Upon my word, Planchet, I hardly know that. Still, said the grocer, if your reflections are at all like those which led you to restore King Charles the Second, and Planchet finished with a little laugh that was not without its meaning. Ah, Planchet, my friend, returned D'Artagnan, you are getting ambitious. Is there no other king to be restored, Monsieur D'Artagnan? No second monk to be packed up like a salted hog in a deal box? No, my dear Planchet, all the kings are seated on their respective thrones, less comfortably so, perhaps, than I am upon this chair, but in all events there they are, and D'Artagnan sighed deeply. Monsieur D'Artagnan, said Planchet, you are making me very uneasy. You are very good, Planchet. I begin to suspect something. What is it? Monsieur D'Artagnan, you are getting thin. Oh, said D'Artagnan, striking his chest which sounded like an empty curiosity. It is impossible, Planchet. Ah, said Planchet, slightly overcome, if you were to get thin in my house, well, I should do something rash. What would you do? Tell me. I should look out for the man who was the cause of all your anxieties. Ah, uh, according to your account, I am anxious now. Yes, you are anxious, and you are getting thin, visibly getting thin, Malaga. If you go on getting thin in this way, I will take my sword in my hand and go straight to Monsieur d'Arblay and have it out with him. What? said Monsieur d'Artagnan, starting in his chair. What's that you say? And what has Monsieur d'Arblay's name got to do with your groceries? Just as you please. Get angry if you like, or call me names if you prefer it. But the deuce is in it. I know what I know. D'Artagnan had, during this second outburst of Planchet's, so placed himself as not to lose a single look on his face. That is, he sat with both his hands resting on both his knees, and his head stretched out toward the grocer. Come, explain yourself, he said, and tell me how you could possibly utter such a blasphemy. Monsieur de your old master, my friend, an ecclesiastic, a musketeer turned bishop, what do you mean to say you would raise your sword against him, Planchet? I could raise my sword against my own father when I see you in such a state as you are now. Monsieur d'Arblay, a gentleman. It is all the same to me whether he's a gentleman or not. He gives you the blue devils, and that is all I know, and the blue devils make people get thin. Malaga, I have no notion of Monsieur d'Artagnan leaving my house thinner than when he entered it. How does he give me the blue devils, as you call it? Come, explain, explain. You have had the nightmare during the last three nights. I? Yes, you. And in your nightmare you called out several times, Aramis, deceitful Aramis. Ah, uh, I said that, did I? murmured D'Artagnan uneasily. Yes, those very words, upon my honor. Well, what else? You know the saying, Planchet, dreams go by contraries. Not so, for every time during the last three days when you were out, you have not once failed to ask me, on your return, have you seen Monsieur d'Herblay, or else have you received any letters for me from Monsieur d'Herblay? Well, it is very natural I should take an interest in my old friend, said D'Artagnan. Of course, 
but not to such an extent as to get thin on that account. Planchet, I'll get fatter. I give you my word of honor, I will. Very well, monsieur, I accept it. For I know that when you give your word of honor, it is sacred. I will not dream of Aramis any more, and I will never ask you again if there are any letters from Monsieur d'Herblay, but on condition that you explain one thing to me. What is it, monsieur? I am a great observer, and just now you made use of a very singular oath, which is unusual for you. You mean Malaga, I suppose? Precisely. It is the oath I have used ever since I have been a grocer. Very proper, too. It is the name of a dried grape or raisin, I believe. It is my most ferocious oath. When I have once said Malaga, I am a man no longer. Still, I never knew you to use that oath before. Very likely not, monsieur. I had a present made me of it, said Planchet, and as he pronounced these words, he winked his eye with a cunning expression, which thoroughly awakened D'Artagnan's attention. Come, come, monsieur Planchet. Why, I am not like you, monsieur, said Planchet. I don't pass my life in thinking. You do wrong, then. I meant in boring myself to death. We have but a very short time to live. Why not make the best of it? You are an Epicurean philosopher, I begin to think, Planchet. Why not? My hand is still as steady as ever. I can write, and I can weigh out my sugar and spices. My foot is firm. I can dance and walk about. My stomach has its teeth still, for I eat and digest very well. My heart is not quite hardened. Well, monsieur? Well, what, Planchet? Why, you see, said the grocer, rubbing his hands together. D'Artagnan crossed one leg over the other, and said, Planchet, my friend, I am unnerved with extreme surprise, for you are revealing yourself to me under a perfectly new light. Planchet, flattered to the highest degree by this remark, continued to rub his hands very hard together. Ah, ah, he said, because I happen to be slow, you think me perhaps a positive fool. Very good, Planchet, very well reasoned. Follow my idea, monsieur, if you please. I said to myself, continued Planchet, that without enjoyment there is no happiness on this earth. Quite true what you say, Planchet, interrupted D'Artagnan. At all events, if we cannot obtain pleasure, for pleasure is not so common a thing, after all, let us at least get consolation of some kind or another. And so you console yourself? Exactly so. Tell me how you console yourself. I put on a buckler for the purpose of confronting ennui. I place my time at the direction of patience, and on the very eve of feeling I am going to get bored, I amuse myself. And you don't find any difficulty in that? None. And you found it out quite by yourself? Oh, quite so. It is miraculous. What do you say? I say that your philosophy is not to be matched in the Christian or pagan world in modern days or in antiquity. You think so? Follow my example, then. It is a very tempting one. Do as I do. I could not wish for anything better, but all minds are not of the same stamp, and it might possibly happen that if I were required to amuse myself in the manner that you do, I should bore myself horribly. Bah! At least try first. Well, tell me what to do. Have you observed that I leave home occasionally? Yes. In any particular way? Well, periodically. That is the very thing. You have noticed it, then. My dear Planchet, you must understand that when people see each other every day, and one of those two absents himself, the other misses him. Do you not feel the want of my society when I am in the country? Prodigiously, that is to say, I feel like a body without a soul. That being understood, then. Proceed. What are the periods when I absent myself? On the 15th and 30th of every month, and I remain away? Sometimes two, sometimes three, and sometimes four days at a time. Have you ever given it a thought why I was absent? Oh, to look after your debts, I suppose. And when I returned, how did you think I looked, as far as my face was concerned? Exceedingly self-satisfied. You admit, you say, that I always look satisfied, and what have you attributed my satisfaction to? That your business was going on very well, that your purchases of rice, prunes, raw sugar, dried apples, pears, and treacle were advantageous. You were always very picturesque in your notions and ideas, Planchet, 
and I was not in the slightest degree surprised that you had selected grocery as an occupation which is of all trades the most varied and the most pleasantest as far as the character is concerned, inasmuch as one handles so many natural and perfumed productions. Perfectly true, monsieur, but you are greatly mistaken. In what way? In thinking that I'd leave here every fortnight to collect my money or to make purchases. Ho, ho! How could you possibly have ever thought such a thing? Ho, ho, ho! And Planchet began to laugh in a manner that inspired D'Artagnan with very serious misgivings as to his sanity. I confess, said the musketeer, that I do not precisely catch your meaning. Very true, monsieur. What do you mean, very true? It must be true, since you say it, but pray be assured that it in no way lessens my opinion of you. Oh, that is lucky. No, you are a man of genius, and whenever the question happens to be of war, tactics, surprises, or good honest blows to be dealt with, why, kings are marionettes compared to you. But for the consolations of the mind, the proper care of the body, and agreeable things of the like, if one may say so, ah, uh, monsieur, don't talk to me about men of genius. They are nothing short of executioners. Good, said D'Artagnan, really fidgety with curiosity. Upon my word, you interest me to the highest degree. You feel already less bored than you did just now, do you not? I was not bored. Yet, since you have been talking to me, I feel more animated. Very good, then. It is not a bad beginning. I will cure you. Rely upon that. There is nothing I should like better. Will you let me try, then? Immediately, if you like. Very well. Have you any horses here? Yes, ten, twenty, thirty... Oh, there is no occasion for so many as that. Two will be quite sufficient. They are quite at your disposal, Planchet. Very good. Then I shall carry you off with me. When? Tomorrow. Where? Ah, uh, you are asking too much. You will admit, however, that it is important. I should know where I am going. Do you like the country? Only moderately, Planchet. Is it the case that you like town better? That is as may be. Very well, I am going to take you to a place half town and half country. Good. To a place where I am sure you will amuse yourself. Is it possible? Yes, and more wonderful still, to a place from which you have just returned, for the purpose only, it would seem, of getting bored here. Is it to Fontainebleau you are going, then? Exactly, to Fontainebleau. And in heaven's name, what are you going to do at Fontainebleau? Planchet answered D'Artagnan by a wink full of sly humor. You have some property there, you rascal? Oh, a very paltry affair, a little bit of a house, nothing more. I understand you, but it is tolerably enough, after all. I am going to Planchet's country seat, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Whenever you like. Did we not fix tomorrow? Let us say tomorrow, if you like, and then, besides, tomorrow is the fourteenth, that is to say, the day before the one when I am afraid of getting bored, so we will look upon it as an understood thing. Agreed, by all means. You will lend me one of your horses? The best I have. No, I prefer the gentlest of all. I never was a very good rider, as you know, and in my grocery business I have got more awkward than ever. Besides, besides what? Why, added Planchet, I do not wish to fatigue myself. Why so, D'Artagnan ventured to ask? "'because I should lose half the pleasure I expect to enjoy,' replied Planchet, and thereupon he arose from the sack of Indian corn, stretching himself and making all of his bones crack one after the other with a sort of harmony. "'Planchet, Planchet!' exclaimed D'Artagnan. "'I do declare that there is no Sybarite on the face of the globe who can for a moment be compared to you. Oh, Planchet, it is very clear that we have never yet eaten a ton of salt together.' "'Why so, monsieur? Because, even now, I can scarcely say I know you,' said D'Artagnan, "'and because, in point of fact, I return to the opinion which, for a moment, I had formed of you that day at Boulogne, when you strangled, or did so as nearly as possible, monsieur de Ward's valet, Lubin, in plain language, Planchet, that you are a man of great resources.' Planchet began to laugh with a laugh full of self-conceit, bade the musketeer good night and went down to his back shop which he used as a bedroom d'artagnan resumed his original position upon the chair and his brow which had been unruffled for a moment became more pensive than ever he had already forgotten the whims and dreams of planchet yes said he taking up again the thread of his thoughts which had been broken by the whimsical conversation in which we have just permitted our readers to participate yes 
Yes, those three points include everything. First, to ascertain what Basmo wanted with Aramis. Secondly, to learn why Aramis does not let me hear from him. And thirdly, to ascertain where Portos is. The whole mystery lies in these three points. Since, therefore, continued D'Artagnan, our friends tell us nothing, we must have recourse to our own poor intelligence. I must do what I can, mordu, or rather, Malaga, as Planchet would say. End of chapter 1Chapter 2 of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Griffiths. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 2 A Letter from Monsieur Bassemeau. D'Artagnan, faithful to his plan, went the very next morning to pay a visit to Monsieur de Bassemeau. It was cleaning up or tidying day at the Bastille. The cannons were furbished up, the staircases scraped and cleaned, and the jailers seemed to be carefully engaged in polishing the very keys. As for the soldiers belonging to the garrison, they were walking about in different courtyards under the pretense that they were clean enough. The governor, Bassemeau, received d'artagnan with more than ordinary politeness but he behaved towards him with so marked a reserve of manner that all d'artagnan's tact and cleverness could not get a syllable out of him the more he kept himself within bounds the more d'artagnan's suspicion increased the latter even fancied he remarked that the governor was acting under the influence of a recent recommendation Basimo had not been at the Palais Royal with D'Artagnan, the same cold and impenetrable man which the latter now found in the Basimo of the Bastille. When D'Artagnan wished to make him talk about the urgent money matters which had brought Basimo in search of D'Artagnan, and had rendered him expansive, notwithstanding what had passed on that evening, Basimo pretended that he had some orders to give in the prison and left D'Artagnan so long alone waiting for him, that our musketeer, feeling sure that he should not get another syllable out of him, left the Bastille without waiting until Bassemeau returned from his inspection. But D'Artagnan's suspicions were aroused, and when once that was the case, D'Artagnan could not sleep or remain quiet for a moment. He was, among men, what the cat is among quadrupeds, the emblem of anxiety and impatience at the same moment. A restless cat can no more remain the same place than a silk thread wafted idly to and fro with every breath of air. A cat on the watch is as motionless as death stationed at its place of observation, and neither hunger nor thirst can draw it from its meditations. D'Artagnan, who was burning with impatience, suddenly threw aside the feeling, like a cloak which he felt too heavy on his shoulders, and said to himself that that which they were concealing from him was the very thing it was important he should know. And consequently, he reasoned that Bassamo would not fail to put Aramis on his guard if Aramis had given him any particular recommendation, and this was, in fact, the very thing that happened. Bassimo had hardly had time to return from the donjon than D'Artagnan placed himself in ambuscade close to the Rue de Petit Musque, so as to see everyone who might leave the gates of the Bastille. After he had spent an hour on the lookout from the Golden Portcullis, under the penthouse of which he could keep himself a little in the shade, D'Artagnan observed a soldier leave the Bastille. This was indeed the surest indication he could possibly have wished for, as every jailer or warder has certain days and even certain hours for leaving the Bastille, since all are alike prohibited from having either wives or lodgings in the castle, and can accordingly leave without exciting any curiosity. But a soldier once in barracks is kept there for four and twenty hours when on duty, and no one knew this better than D'Artagnan. The guardsman in question, therefore, 
was not likely to leave his regimentals except on an express and urgent order. The soldier, we were saying, left the Bastille at a slow and lounging pace, like a happy mortal, in fact, who, instead of mounting sentry before a wearisome guardhouse, or upon a bastion no less wearisome, has the good luck to get a little liberty, in addition to a walk, both pleasures being luckily reckoned as part of his time on duty. He bent his steps towards the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, enjoying the fresh air and the warmth of the sun, and looking at all the pretty faces he passed. D'Artagnan followed him at a distance. He had not yet arranged his ideas as what was to be done. I must, first of all, he thought, see the fellow's face. A man seen is a man judged. D'Artagnan increased his pace, and, which was not very difficult, by the by, soon got in advance of the soldier. Not only did he observe that his face showed a tolerable amount of intelligence and resolution, but he noticed also that his nose was a little red. He has a weakness for brandy, I see, said D'Artagnan to himself. At the same moment that he remarked his red nose, he saw that the soldier had a white paper in his belt. Good, he has a letter, added D'Artagnan. The only difficulty was to get hold of the letter. But a common soldier would, of course, be only too delighted at having been selected by M. de Bassemeau as a special messenger, and would not be likely to sell his message. As D'Artagnan was biting his nails, the soldier continued to advance more and more into the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. He is certainly going to saint mande he said to himself, and I shall not be able to learn what the letter contains. It was enough to drive him wild. If I were in uniform, said D'Artagnan to himself, I would have this fellow seized and his letter with him. I could easily get assistance at the very first guardhouse. But the devil take me if I mention my name in an affair of this kind. If I were to treat him to something to drink, his suspicions would be roused. And besides, he might drink me drunk. Mon Dieu, my wits seem to have left me, said D'Artagnan. It is all over with me. Yet, supposing I were to attack this poor devil, make him draw his sword and kill him for the sake of his letter. No harm in that if it were a question of a letter from a queen to a nobleman, or a letter from a cardinal to a queen. But what miserable intrigues are those of Messieurs Aramis and Fouquet with Monsieur Colbert? A man's life for that? No, no, indeed, not even ten crowns. As he philosophized in this manner, biting first his nails and then his moustaches, he perceived a group of archers and a commissary of the police engaged in carrying away a man of very gentlemanly exterior who was struggling with all his might against them. The archers had torn his clothes and were dragging him roughly away. He begged they would lead him along more respectfully, asserting that he was a gentleman and a soldier, and observing our soldier walking in the street, he called out, Help, comrade! The soldier walked on with the same step towards the man who had called out to him, followed by the crowd. An idea suddenly occurred to D'Artagnan. It was his first one, and we shall find it was not a bad one either. During the time the gentleman was relating to the soldier that he had just been seized in a house as a thief, when the truth was he was only there as a lover, and while the soldier was pitying him, and offering him consolation and advice with that gravity which a French soldier has always ready whenever his vanity or his esprit de corps is concerned. D'Artagnan glided behind the soldier, who was closely hemmed in by the crowd, and with a rapid sweep, like a sabre slash, snatched the letter from his belt. As at this moment the gentleman with the torn clothes was pulling about the soldier to show how the commissary of police had pulled him about, D'Artagnan effected his pillage of the letter without the slightest interference. He stationed himself about ten paces distant, behind the pillar of an adjoining house, and read on the address, To Monsieur de Vallon, at Monsieur Fouquet's, 
Saint-Mande. Good, he said, and then he unsealed, without tearing the letter, drew out the paper, which was folded in four from the inside, which contained only these words. Dear Monsieur de Vallon, will you be good enough to tell Monsieur d'Herblay that he has been to the Bastille and has been making inquiries? Your devoted de Bassimo. Very good. All right, exclaimed D'Artagnan. It is clear enough now. Porthos is engaged in it. Being now satisfied of what he wished to know, Mordieu, thought the musketeer, what is to be done with that poor devil of a soldier? That hot-headed, cunning fellow de Bassimo will make him pay dearly for my trick. If he returns without the letter, what will they do to him? Besides, I don't want the letter. When the egg has been sucked, what is the good of the shell? D'Artagnan perceived that the commissary and the archers had succeeded in convincing the soldier and went on their way with the prisoner, the latter being still surrounded by the crowd and continuing his complaints. D'Artagnan advanced into the very middle of the crowd, let the letter fall without anyone having observed him, and then retreated rapidly. The soldier resumed his route towards Saint-Mande, his mind occupied with the gentleman who had implored his protection. Suddenly he thought of his letter, and looking at his belt, saw that it was no longer there. D'Artagnan derived no little satisfaction from his sudden, terrified cry. The poor soldier, in the greatest anguish of mind, looked round him on every side, and at last, about twenty paces behind him, he perceived the lucky envelope. He pounced on it like a falcon on its prey. The envelope was certainly a little dirty and rather crumpled, but at all events the letter itself was found. D'Artagnan observed that the broken seal attracted the soldier's attention a good deal, but he finished apparently by consoling himself and returned the letter to his belt. Go on, said D'Artagnan. I have plenty of time before me, so you may precede me. It appears that Aramis is not in Paris, since Bassimo writes to Porthos. Dear Porthos, how delighted I shall be to see him again, and to have some conversation with him, said the Gascon. And regulating his pace, according to that of the soldier, he promised himself to arrive a quarter of an hour after him at Monsieur Fouquet's. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Griffiths. Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Three, in which the reader will be delighted to find that Porthos has lost none of his muscularity. D'Artagnan had, according to his usual style, calculated that every hour is worth sixty minutes, and every minute worth sixty seconds. Thanks to this perfectly exact calculation of minutes and seconds, he reached the superintendent's door at the very moment the soldier was leaving it with his belt empty. D'Artagnan presented himself at the door which a porter with a profusely embroidered livery held half opened for him. D'Artagnan would very much have liked to enter without giving his name, but this was impossible, and so he gave it. Notwithstanding this concession, which ought to have removed every difficulty in the way, at least D'Artagnan thought so, the concierge hesitated. However, at the second repetition of the title, captain of the king's guards, the concierge, without quite leaving the passage clear for him, ceased to bar it completely. D'Artagnan understood that orders of the most positive character had been given. He decided, therefore, to tell a falsehood, a circumstance, moreover, which did not seriously affect his peace of mind, when he saw that beyond the falsehood the safety of the state itself or even purely and simply his own individual personal interest, might be at stake. 
He moreover added to the declarations he had already made that the soldier sent to Monsieur de Vallon was his own messenger, and that the only object that letter had in view was to announce his intended arrival. From that moment, no one opposed D'Artagnan's entrance any further, and he entered accordingly. A valet wished to accompany him, but he answered that it was useless to take that trouble on his account, inasmuch as he knew perfectly well where Monsieur du Vallon was. There was nothing, of course, to say to a man so thoroughly and completely informed on all points, and D'Artagnan was permitted, therefore, to do as he liked. The terraces, the magnificent apartments, the gardens, were all reviewed and narrowly inspected by the musketeer. He walked for a quarter of an hour in this more than royal residence, which included as many wonders as articles of furniture, and as many servants as there were columns and doors. Decidedly, he said to himself, this mansion has no other limits than the pillars of the habitable world. Is it probable Porthos has taken it into his head to go back to Pierrefonds without even leaving Monsieur Fouquet's house? He finally reached a remote part of the chateau, enclosed by a stone wall, which was covered with a profusion of thick plants, luxuriant in blossoms as large and solid as fruit. At equal distances on the top of this wall were placed various statues in timid or mysterious attitudes. These were vestals, hidden beneath the long Greek peplum, with its thick, sinuous folds, agile nymphs, covered with their marble veils, and guarding the palace with their fugitive glances. A statue of Hermes, with his finger on his lips, one of Iris, with extended wings, another of Night, sprinkled all over with poppies, dominated the gardens and outbuildings, which could be seen through the trees. All these statues threw in white relief their profiles upon the dark ground of the tall cypresses which darted their sombre summits towards the sky. Around these cypresses were entwined climbing roses whose flowering rings were fastened to every fork of the branches and spread over the lower boughs and the various statues, showers of flowers of the rarest fragrance. These enchantments seemed to the musketeer the result of the greatest efforts of the human mind. He felt in a dreamy, almost poetical frame of mind. The idea that Porthos was living in so perfect an Eden gave him a higher idea of Porthos, showing how tremendously true it is that even the very highest orders of minds are not quite exempt from the influence of surroundings. D'Artagnan found the door, and on, or rather in the door, a kind of spring which he detected. Having touched it, the door flew open. D'Artagnan entered, closed the door behind him, and advanced into a pavilion built in a circular form, in which no other sound could be heard but cascades and the songs of birds. At the door of the pavilion he met a lackey. It is here, I believe, said D'Artagnan without hesitation, that Monsieur le Baron du Vallon is staying? Yes, Monsieur, answered the lackey. Have the goodness to tell him that Monsieur le Chevalier d'Artagnan, captain of the King's Musketeers, is waiting to see him. D'Artagnan was introduced into the salon, and had not long to remain in expectation. A well-remembered step shook the floor of the adjoining room. A door opened, or rather flew open, and Porthos appeared and threw himself into his friend's arms with a sort of embarrassment which did not ill become him. You here? he exclaimed. And you, replied D'Artagnan. Ah, you sly fellow. Yes, said Porthos, with a somewhat embarrassed smile. Yes, you see, I am staying in Monsieur Fouquet's house, at which you are not a little surprised, I suppose. Not at all. Why should you not be one of Monsieur Fouquet's friends? Monsieur Fouquet has a very large number, particularly among clever men. Porthos had the modesty not to take the compliment to himself. Besides, he added, you saw me at Belle Isle. 
a greater reason for my believing you to be one of Monsieur Fouquet's friends. The fact is, I am acquainted with him, said Porthos, with a certain embarrassment of manner. Ah, friend Porthos, said D'Artagnan, how treacherously you have behaved towards me. In what way? exclaimed Porthos. What? You complete so admirable a work as the fortifications of Belle Isle, and you did not tell me of it? Porthos colored. Nay, more than that, continued D'Artagnan. You saw me out yonder. You know I am in the king's service, and yet you could not guess that the king, jealously desirous of learning the name of the man whose abilities had wrought a work of which he heard the most wonderful account, you could not guess, I say, that the king sent me to learn who this man was? What? The king sent you to learn? Of course, but don't let us speak of that any more. Not speak of it, said Porthos. On the contrary, we will speak of it. And so the king knew that we were fortifying Belle Isle. Of course, does not the king know everything? But he did not know who was fortifying it. No, he only suspected, from what he had been told of the nature of the works, that it was some celebrated soldier or another. The devil, said Porthos. If I had only known that. You would not have run away from Van, as you did, perhaps? No. What did you say when you couldn't find me? My dear fellow, I reflected. Ah, indeed. You reflect, do you? Well, and what did that reflection lead to? It led me to guess the whole truth. Come then, tell me, what did you guess after all? said Porthos, settling himself into an armchair and assuming the airs of a sphinx. I guessed, in the first place, that you were fortifying Belle Isle. There was no great difficulty in that, for you saw me at work. Wait a minute, I also guessed something else that you were fortifying Belle Isle by Monsieur Fouquet's orders. Mm, that's true. But even that is not all. Whenever I feel myself in trim for guessing, I do not stop on my road, and so I guessed that Monsieur Fouquet wished to preserve the most absolute secrecy respecting those fortifications. I believe that was his intention, in fact, said Porthos. Yes. But do you know why he wished to keep it secret? In order that it should not become known, perhaps, said Porthos. That was his principal reason. But his wish was subservient to a bit of generosity. In fact, said Porthos, I have heard it said that Monsieur Fouquet was a very generous man. To a bit of generosity he wished to exhibit towards the king. Oh, oh, you seem surprised at that. Yes. And you didn't guess? No. Well, I know it then. You are a wizard. Not at all, I assure you. How do you know it then? By a very simple means. I heard Monsieur Fouquet himself say so to the king. Say what to the king? That he fortified Belle Isle on his majesty's account, and that he had made him a present of Belle Isle. And you heard Monsieur Fouquet say that to the king? In those very words, he even added, Belle Isle has been fortified by an engineer, one of my friends, a man of a great deal of merit whom I shall ask your majesty's permission to present to you. What is his name? said the king. The Baron du Vallon, Monsieur Fouquet replied. 
Very well, returned his majesty. You will present him to me. The king said that? Upon the word of D'Artagnan. Oh, oh, said Porthos. Why have I not been presented then? Have they not spoken to you about this presentation? Yes, certainly. But I am always kept waiting for it. Be easy, it will be sure to come. Hm, hm, grumbled Porthos, which D'Artagnan pretended not to hear. And, changing the conversation, he said, You seem to be living in a very solitary place here, my dear fellow. I always preferred retirement. I am of a melancholy disposition, replied Porthos with a sigh. Really, that is odd, said D'Artagnan. I never remarked that before. It is only since I have taken to reading, said Porthos with a thoughtful air. But the labours of the mind have not affected the health of the body, I trust? Not in the slightest degree. Your strength is as great as ever? Too great, my friend, too great. Ah, I had heard that for a short time after your arrival. That I could hardly move a limb, I suppose? How was it, said D'Artagnan, smiling, and why was it you could not move? Porthos, perceiving that he had made a mistake, wished to correct it. Yes, I came from Belle Isle upon very hard horses, he said, and that fatigued me. I'm no longer astonished, then, since I, who followed you, found seven or eight lying dead on the road. I am very heavy, you know, said Porthos, so that you were bruised all over. My marrow melted. That made me very ill. Poor Porthos. But how did Aramis act towards you under those circumstances? Very well indeed. He had me attended to by Monsieur Fouquet's own doctor. But just imagine, at the end of a week, I could not breathe any longer. What do you mean? The room was too small. I had absorbed every atom of air. Indeed. I was told so, at least. And so I was removed into another apartment. Where you were able to breathe, I hope and trust. Yes, more freely. But no exercise, nothing to do. The doctor pretended that I was not to stir. I, on the contrary, felt that I was stronger than ever. That was the cause of a very serious accident. What accident? Fancy, my dear fellow, that I revolted against the directions of that ass of a doctor, and I resolved to go out, whether it suited him or not. And... Consequently, I told the valet who waited on me to bring me my clothes. You were quite naked then? Oh, no, on the contrary, I had a magnificent dressing gown to wear. The lackey obeyed. I dressed myself in my own clothes, which had become too large for me. But a strange circumstance had happened. My feet had become too large. Yes, I quite understand. And my boots too small. You mean your feet were still swollen? Exactly. You have hit it. Ah, Dieu! And is that the accident you were going to tell me about? Oh, yes. I did not make the same reflection you have done... I said to myself, since my feet have entered my boots ten times, there is no reason why they should not go in the eleventh. 
allow me to tell you, my dear Porthos, that on this occasion you failed in your logic. In short, then, they placed me opposite to a part of the room which was partitioned. I tried to get my boot on. I pulled it with my hands. I pushed with all the strength of the muscles of my leg, making the most unheard of efforts. Then suddenly the two tags of my boot remained in my hands and my foot struck out like a ballista. How learned you are in fortification, dear Porthos. My foot darted out like a ballista and came against the partition, which it broke in. I really thought that, like Samson, I had demolished the temple. And the number of pictures, the quantity of china, vases of flowers, carpets and window panes that fell down were really wonderful. Indeed. Without reckoning that on the other side of the partition was a small table laden with porcelain which you knocked over which i dashed to the other side of the room said porthos laughing upon my word it is as you say astonishing replied d'artagnan beginning to laugh also whereupon porthos laughed louder than ever i broke said porthos in a voice half choked from his increasing mirth more than three thousand francs worth of china. Ha, ha, ha. Good, said D'Artagnan. I smashed more than four thousand francs worth of glass. Ho, 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 ho. Excellent. Without counting a luster which fell on my head and was broken into a thousand pieces. Ha, ha, ha. Upon your head, said D'Artagnan, holding his sides. On top. But your head was broken, I suppose. No, since I tell you, on the contrary, my dear fellow, that it was the luster which was broken, like glass, which, point of fact, it was. Ah, the luster was glass, you say. Venetian glass, a perfect curiosity, quite matchless indeed, and weighed two hundred pounds. And it fell upon your head? Upon my head. Just imagine a globe of crystal gilded all over, the lower part beautifully encrusted, perfumes burning at the top, with jets from which flames issued when they were lighted. I quite understand, but they were not lighted at the time, I suppose. Happily not, or I should have been grilled prematurely. And you were only knocked down flat instead? Not at all. How not at all? Why, the luster fell on my skull... It appears that we have, upon the top of our heads, an exceedingly thick crust. Who told you that, Porthos? The doctor. A sort of dome which would bear Notre Dame. Bah! Yes, it seems that our skulls are made in that manner. Speak for yourself, my dear fellow. It is your own skull that is made in that manner, and not the skulls of other people. Well, that may be so, said Porthos conceitedly. So much, however, was that the case, in my instance, that no sooner did the luster fall upon the dome which we have at the top of our head, than there was a report like a cannon. The crystal was broken to pieces, and I fell covered from head to foot with blood poor porthos not at all with perfumes which smelt like rich creams it was delicious but the odor was too strong and i felt quite giddy from it 
Perhaps you have experienced it sometimes yourself, D'Artagnan. Yes, in inhaling the scent of the lily of the valley, so that, my poor friend, you were knocked over by the shock and overpowered by the perfumes? Yes, but what is very remarkable, for the doctor told me he had never seen anything like it. You had a bump on your head, I suppose, interrupted D'Artagnan. I had five. Why five? I will tell you, the luster had, at its lower extremity, five gilt ornaments, excessively sharp. Oh, well, these five ornaments penetrated my hair, which, as you see, I wear very thick. Fortunately so. And they made a mark on my skin. But just notice the singularity of it. These things seem really only to happen to me. Instead of making indentations, they made bumps. The doctor could never succeed in explaining that to me satisfactorily. Well then, I will explain it to you. You will do me a great service if you will, said Porthos winking his eyes, which, with him, was the sign of the profoundest attention. Since you've been employing your brain in studies of an exalted character, in important calculations and so on, the head has gained a certain advantage, so that your head is now too full of science. Do you think so? I'm sure of it. The result is that Instead of allowing any foreign matter to penetrate the interior of the head, your bony box or skull, which is already too full, avails itself of the openings which are made in allowing this excess to escape. Ah, said Porthos, to whom this explanation appeared clearer than that of the doctor. The five protuberances caused by the five ornaments of the luster must certainly have been scientific globules brought to the surface by the force of circumstances. In fact, said Porthos, the real truth is that I felt far worse outside my head than inside. I will even confess that when I put my hat upon my head, clapping it on my head with that graceful energy which we gentlemen of the sword possess, if my fist was not very gently applied, I experienced the most painful sensations. I quite believe you, Porthos. Therefore, my friend, said the giant, Monsieur Fouquet decided, seeing how slightly built the house was, to give me another lodging, and so they brought me here. It is the private park, I think, is it not? Yes. Where the rendezvous are made. That park, indeed, which is so celebrated in some of those mysterious stories about the superintendent. I don't know. I have had no rendezvous or heard mysterious stories myself, but they have authorised me to exercise my muscles, and I take advantage of the permission by rooting up some of the trees. What for? To keep my hand in, and also to take some birds' nests. I find it more convenient than climbing. You are as pastoral as Tersis, my dear Porthos. Yes, I like the small eggs. I like them very much better than larger ones. You have no idea how delicate an omelette is if made of four or five hundred eggs of linnets, chaffinches, starlings, blackbirds and thrushes. But five hundred eggs is perfectly monstrous. A salad bowl will hold them easily enough, said Porthos. D'Artagnan looked at Porthos admiringly for full five minutes as if he had seen him for the first time, while Porthos spread his chest out joyously and proudly. 
they remained in this state several minutes, Porthos smiling and D'Artagnan looking at him. D'Artagnan was evidently trying to give the conversation a new turn. Do you amuse yourself much here, Porthos? he asked at last, very likely after he had found out what he was searching for. Not always. I can imagine that. But when you get thoroughly bored, by and by, what do you intend to do? Oh, I shall not be here for any length of time. Aramis is waiting until the last bump on my head disappears in order to present me to the king, who, I am told, cannot endure the sight of a bump. Aramis is still in Paris, then? No. Whereabouts is he, then? At Fontainebleau. Alone? With Monsieur Fouquet? Very good. But do you happen to know one thing? No. Tell it me, and then I shall know. Well, then, I think Aramis is forgetting you. Do you really think so? Yes, for at Fontainebleau yonder, you must know, they are laughing, dancing, banqueting, and drawing the corks of Monsieur de Mazarin's wine in fine style. Are you aware they have a ballet every evening there? The deuce they have! I assure you that your dear Aramis is forgetting you. Well, that is not at all unlikely, and I have myself thought so sometimes. Unless he is playing you a trick, the sly fellow. Oh, you know that Aramis is as sly as a fox. Yes, but to play me a trick? Listen, in the first place, he puts you under a sort of sequestration. He sequestrates me. Do you mean to say I am sequestrated? I think so. I wish you would have the goodness to prove that to me. Nothing easier. Do you ever go out? Never. Do you ever ride on horseback? Never. Are your friends allowed to come and see you? Never. Very well, then. Never to go out, never to ride on horseback, never to be allowed to see your friends. That is called being sequestrated. But why should Aramis sequestrate me? inquired Porthos. Come, said D'Artagnan, be frank, Porthos. As gold. It was Aramis who drew the plan of the fortifications at Belle Isle, was it not? Porthos coloured as he said, Yes, but that was all he did. Exactly, and my own opinion is that it was no very great affair after all. That is mine too. Very good. I am delighted we are of the same opinion. He never even came to Belle Isle, said Porthos. There now, you see. It was I who went to Van, as you may have seen. Say, rather, as I did see. Well, that is precisely the state of the case, my dear Porthos. Aramis, who only drew the plans, wishes to pass himself off as the engineer, whilst you, who stone by stone built the wall, the citadel, and the bastions, he wishes to reduce to the rank of a mere builder. By builder, you mean mason, perhaps. Mason, the very word. Plasterer, in fact. Hodman. Exactly. Oh, oh, my dear Aramis, you seem to think you are only five and twenty years of age still. Yes, and that is not all for he believes you are fifty. I should have amazingly liked to have seen him at work. Yes, indeed. A fellow who has got the gout? Yes. Who has lost three of his teeth? 
four. While I look at mine. And Porthos, opening his large mouth very wide, displayed two rows of teeth, not quite as white as snow, but even, hard and sound as ivory. You can hardly believe, Porthos, said D'Artagnan, what a fancy the king has for good teeth. Yours decide me. I will present you to the king myself. You? Why not? Do you think I have less credit at court than Aramis? Oh, no. Do you think I have the slightest pretensions upon the fortifications at Belle Isle? Certainly not. It is your own interest alone which would induce me to do it. I don't doubt it in the least. Well, I am the intimate friend of the king, and a proof of that is that whenever there is anything disagreeable to tell him, it is I who have to do it. But, dear D'Artagnan, if you present me, well... Aramis will be angry. With me? No, with me. Bah! Whether he or I present you, since you are to be presented, what does it matter? They were going to get me some clothes made. Your own are splendid. Oh, those I had ordered were far more beautiful. Take care. The king likes simplicity. In that case, I will be simple. But what will Monsieur Fouquet say when he learns that I have left? Are you a prisoner, then, on parole? No, not quite that. But I promised him I would not leave without letting him know. Wait a minute, we shall return to that presently. Have you anything to do here? I? Nothing. Nothing of any importance, at least. Unless, indeed, you are our Mrs. representative for something of importance. By no means. What I tell you, pray understand that, is out of interest for you. I suppose, for instance, that you are commissioned to send messages and letters to him? Ah, letters, yes. I send certain letters to him. Where? To Fontainebleau. Have you any letters, then? But, nay, let me speak. Have you any letters, I say? I have just received one for him. Interesting? I suppose so. You do not read them, then? I am not at all curious, said Porthos, as he drew out of his pocket the soldier's letter, which Porthos had not read, but D'Artagnan had. Do you know what to do with it? said D'Artagnan. Of course. Do as I always do. Send it to him. Not so. Why not? Keep it, then. Did they not tell you that this letter was important? Very important. Well, you must take it yourself to Fontainebleau. To Aramis? Yes. Very good. And since the king is there, you will profit by that. I shall profit by the opportunity to present you to the king. Ah, D'Artagnan, there is no one like you for expedience. Therefore, instead of forwarding to our friend any messages, which may or may not be faithfully delivered, we will ourselves be the bearers of the letter. I had never even thought of that, and yet it is simple enough. And therefore, because it is urgent, Porthos, we ought to set off at once. In fact, said Porthos, the sooner we set off, the less chance there is of Aramis's letter being delayed. Porthos, your reasoning is always accurate, and in your case, logic seems to serve as an auxiliary to the imagination. Do you think so? said Porthos. 
It is the result of your hard reading, replied D'Artagnan. So, come along, let us be off. But, said Porthos, my promise to Monsieur Fouquet, which? Not to leave Saint-Mande without telling him of it. Ah, Porthos, said D'Artagnan, how very young you still are. In what way? You are going to Fontainebleau, are you not, where you will find Monsieur Fouquet? Yes. Probably in the king's palace? Yes, repeated Porthos, with an air full of majesty. Well, you will accost him with these words. Monsieur Fouquet, I have the honor to inform you that I have just left Saint-Mont. And, said Porthos, with the same majestic mien, seeing me at Fontainebleau at the king's, Monsieur Fouquet will not be able to tell me I am not speaking the truth. My dear Porthos, I was just on the point of opening my lips to make the same remark, but you anticipate me in everything. Oh, Porthos, how fortunately you are gifted. Years have made not the slightest impression on you. Not over much, certainly. Then there is nothing more to say? I think not. All your scruples are removed? Quite so. In that case, I shall carry you off with me. Exactly. And I will go and get my horse saddled. You have horses here, then? I have five. You had them sent from Pierre Fons, I suppose? No. Monsieur Fouquet gave them to me. My dear Porthos, we shall not want five horses for two persons. Besides, I have already three in Paris, which would make eight, and that will be too many. It would not be too many if I had some of my servants here. But, alas, I have not got them. Do you regret them, then? I regret Mousqueton. I miss Mousqueton. What a good-hearted fellow you are, Porthos, said D'Artagnan. But the best thing you can do is to leave your horses here, as you have left Mousqueton out yonder. Why so? Because, by and by, it might turn out a very good thing if Monsieur Fouquet had never given you anything at all. I don't understand you, said Porthos. It is not necessary you should understand. But yet, I will explain to you later, Porthos. I'll wager it is some piece of policy or other, and of the most subtle character, returned D'Artagnan. Porthos nodded his head at this word policy. Then, after a moment's reflection, he added, I confess, D'Artagnan, that I am no politician. I know that well. Oh, no one knows what you told me yourself, you the bravest of the brave. What did I tell you, Porthos? That every man has his day. You told me so, and I have experienced it myself. There are certain days when one feels less pleasure than others in exposing oneself to a bullet or a sword thrust. Exactly my own idea. And mine too, although I can hardly believe in blows or thrusts that kill outright. The deuce, and yet you have killed a few in your time. Yes, but I have never been killed. Your reason is a very good one. Therefore, I do do not believe I shall ever die from a thrust of a sword or a gunshot. In that case, then, you are afraid of nothing. Ah, water, perhaps? Oh, I swim like an otter. Of a quartan fever, then. I have never had one yet, and I don't believe I ever shall. But there is one thing I will admit, and Porthos dropped his voice. What is that? asked D'Artagnan, 
adopting the same tone of voice as Porthos. I must confess, repeated Porthos, that I am horribly afraid of politics. Ah, bah, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Upon my word, it's true, said Porthos in a stentorian voice. I have seen his eminence, Monsieur le Cardinal de Richelieu, and his eminence, Monsieur le Cardinal de Mazarin. The one was a red politician, the other a black politician. I never felt very much more satisfied with the one than with the other. The first struck off the heads of Monsieur de Marillac, Monsieur de Thou, Monsieur de Saint Mars, Monsieur Chalet, Monsieur de Bouteville, and Monsieur de Montmorency. The second got a whole crowd of frondeurs cut in pieces, and we belonged to them. On the contrary, we did not belong to them, said D'Artagnan. Oh, indeed, yes, for if I unsheathed my sword for the cardinal, I struck it for the king. My good Porthos. Well, I have done. My dread of politics is such that if there is any question of politics in the matter, I should greatly prefer to return to Pierre Fonds. You would be quite right if that were the case. But with me, my dear Porthos, no politics at all. That is quite clear. You've laboured hard in fortifying Belle Isle. The king wished to know the name of the clever engineer under whose directions the works were carried out. You are modest, as all men of true genius are. Perhaps Aramis wishes to put you under a bushel. But I happen to seize hold of you. I make it known who you are. I produce you. The king rewards you. And that is the only policy I have to do with. And the only one I will have to do with either said Porthos, holding out his hand to D'Artagnan. But D'Artagnan knew Porthos's grasp. He knew that once imprisoned within the baron's five fingers, no hand ever left it without being half crushed. He therefore held out not his hand, but his fist, and Porthos did not even perceive the difference. The servants talked a little with each other in an undertone and whispered a few words, which D'Artagnan understood but which he took very good care not to let Porthos understand. Our friend, he said to himself, was really and truly Aramis's prisoner. Let us now see what the result will be of the liberation of the captive. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snowza, Houston, Texas, March 2013. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 4. The Rat and the Cheese. D'Artagnan and Porthos returned on foot, as D'Artagnan had set out. When D'Artagnan, as he entered the shop of the Pilon d'Or, announced to Planchet that Monsieur de Vallon would be one of the privileged travellers, and, as the plume in Porthos's hat made the wooden candle suspended over the front jingle together, a melancholy presentiment seemed to eclipse the delight Planchet had promised himself for the morrow. But the grocer had a heart of gold, ever mindful of the good old times, a trait that carries youth into old age. So, Planchet, notwithstanding a sort of internal shiver checked as soon as experienced, received Porthos with respect mingled with the tenderest cordiality. Porthos, who was a little cold and stiff in his manners at first on account of the social difference existing at that period between a baron and a grocer, soon began to soften when he perceived so much good feeling and so many kind attentions in Planchet. He was particularly touched by the liberty which was permitted him to plunge his great palms into boxes of dried fruits and preserves, into sacks of nuts and almonds, and into the drawers full of sweetmeats, so that, notwithstanding Planchet's pressing invitations to go upstairs to the entresol, he chose as his favorite seat during the evening which he had to spend at Planchet's house, the chop itself, where his fingers could always fish up whatever his nose detected, the delicious figs from Provence, 
Filberts from the forest, Tours plums were subjects of his uninterrupted attention for five consecutive hours. His teeth, like millstones, cracked heaps of nuts, the shells of which were scattered all over the floor, where they were trampled by every one who went in and out of the shop. Porthos pulled from the stalk with his lips at one mouthful bunches of the rich muscatel raisins at their beautiful bloom, half a pound of which passed in one gulp from his mouth to his stomach. In one of the corners of the shop, Planchet's assistants huddled together, looking at each other without venturing to open their lips. They did not know who Porthos was, for they had never seen him before. The race of those titans who had worn the curios of Hugh Capet, Philip Augustus, and Francis I had already begun to disappear. They could hardly help thinking he might be the ogre of a fairy tale who was going to turn the whole contents of Planchet's shop into his insatiable stomach, and that, too, without in the slightest degree displacing the barrels and chests that were in it. Cracking, munching, chewing, nibbling, sucking, and swallowing, Porthos occasionally said to the grocer, "'You do a very good business here, friend Planchet. "'He will very soon have none at all to do if this sort of thing continues,' grumbled the foreman." who had Planchet's word that he should be his successor. In the midst of his despair, he approached Porthos, who blocked up the whole of the passage leading from the back shop to the shop itself. He hoped that Porthos would rise, and that this movement would distract his devouring ideas. "'What do you want, my man?' asked Porthos affably. "'I should like to pass you, monsieur, if it is not troubling you too much.' "'Very well,' said Porthos. "'It does not trouble me in the least.' At the same moment, he took hold of the young fellow by the waistband, lifted him off the ground, and placed him very gently on the other side, smiling all the while with the same affable expression. As soon as Porthos had placed him on the ground, the lad's legs so shook under him that he fell back upon some sacks of corks, but noticing the giant's gentleness of manner, he ventured again and said, "'Ah, monsieur, pray be careful!' "'What about?' inquired Porthos. "'You are positively putting a fiery furnace into your body. "'How is that, my good fellow? "'All those things are very heating to the system. "'Which? "'Raisins, nuts, and almonds. "'Yes, but if raisins, nuts, and almonds are heating, "'there's no doubt at all of it, monsieur. "'Honey is very cooling,' said Porthos. "'Stretched out his hand towards a small barrel of honey which was open, "'and he plunged the scoop with which the wants of the customers were supplied into it, and swallowed a good half-pound at one gulp. "'I must trouble you for some water now, my man,' said Porthos. "'In a pail, monsieur?' asked the lad simply. "'No, in a water-bottle. That will be quite enough.' And raising the bottle to his mouth, as a trumpeter does his trumpet, he emptied the bottle in a single draught. Planchet was agitated in every fibre of propriety and self-esteem. However, a worthy representative of the hospitality which had prevailed in early days, he feigned to be talking very earnestly with D'Artagnan, and incessantly repeated, "'Ah, monsieur, what a happiness! What an honor! "'What time shall we have supper, Planchet?' inquired Porthos. "'I feel hungry!' The foreman clasped his hands together. The two others got under the counters, fearing Porthos might have a taste for human flesh. "'We shall only take a sort of a snack here,' said D'Artagnan, and when we get to Planchet's country seat, we'll have supper. Ah, ah, we are going to your country house, Planchet, said Porthos. So much the better. You overwhelm me, Monsieur le Baron. The Monsieur le Baron had a great effect upon the men, who detected a personage of the highest quality in an appetite of that kind. This title, too, reassured them. They had never heard that an ogre was ever called Monsieur le Baron. "'I will take a few biscuits to eat on the road,' said Porthos carelessly, and he emptied a whole jar of aniseed biscuits into a huge pocket of his doublet. "'My shop is saved!' exclaimed Planchet. "'Yes, as the cheese was,' whispered the foreman. "'What cheese?' "'The Dutch cheese, inside which a rat had made his way, and we found only the rind left.' Planchet looked around his shop, and observing the different articles which had escaped Porthos's teeth, he found the comparison somewhat exaggerated. The foreman, who remarked what was passing in his master's mind, said, "'Take care, he has not gone yet.' "'Have you any fruit here?' said Porthos, as he went upstairs to the entresol, where it had just been announced that some refreshment was prepared. "'Alas!' thought the grocer, addressing a look at D'Artagnan, full of entreaty, which the latter half understood. As soon as they had finished eating, they set off. It was late when the three riders, who had left Paris about six in the evening, arrived at Fontainebleau. 
The journey passed very agreeably. Porthos took a fancy to Planchet's society, because the latter was very respectful in his manners, and seemed delighted to talk to him about his meadows, his woods, and his rabbit warrens. Porthos had all the taste and pride of a landed proprietor. When D'Artagnan saw his two companions in earnest conversation, he took the opposite side of the road, and, letting his bridle drop on his horse's neck, separated himself from the whole world as he had done from Porthos and from Planchet. The moon shone softly through the foliage of the forest. The breezes of the open country rose deliciously perfumed to the horses' nostrils, and they snorted and pranced along delightedly. Porthos and Planchet began to talk about hay crops. Planchet admitted to Porthos that in the advanced years of his life he had certainly neglected agricultural pursuits for commerce, but that his childhood had been passed in Picardy, in the beautiful meadows where the grass grew as high as the knees, and where he had played under the green apple trees covered with red-cheeked fruit, he went on to say that he had solemnly promised himself that as soon as he should have made his fortune, he would return to nature and end his days as he had begun them, as near as he possibly could to the earth itself, where all men must sleep at last. Eh, eh, said Porthos, in that case, my dear Monsieur Planchet, your retirement is not far distant. How so? Why, you seem to be in the way of making your fortune very soon. Well, we're getting on pretty well, I must admit, replied Planchet. Come, tell me what is the extent of your ambition, and what is the amount you intend to retire upon. There is one circumstance, monsieur, said Planchet, without answering the question, which occasions me a good deal of anxiety. What is it? inquired Porthos, looking all round him, as if in search of the circumstance that annoyed Planchet, and desirous of freeing him from it. Why, formerly, said the grocer, you used to call me Planchet quite short, and you would have spoken to me then in a much more familiar manner than you do now. Certainly, certainly, I should have said so formerly, replied the good-natured Porthos, with an embarrassment full of delicacy, but formerly, formerly, I was Monsieur d'Artagnan's lackey. Is not that what you mean? Well, if I am not quite his lackey, I am as much as ever I was his devoted servant, and more than that, since that time, I have had the honor of being in partnership with him. Oh, oh, said Porthos, what, has D'Artagnan gone into the grocery business? No, no, said D'Artagnan, whom these words had drawn out of his reverie, and who entered into the conversation with that readiness and rapidity which distinguished every operation of his mind and body. It was not D'Artagnan who entered into the grocery business, but Planchet who entered into a political affair with me. Yes, said Planchet, with mingled pride and satisfaction. We transacted a little business which brought me in a hundred thousand francs, and Monsieur d'Artagnan two hundred thousand. Oh, oh, said Porthos, with admiration. So that, Monsieur le Baron, continued the grocer, I again beg you to be kind enough to call me Planchet, as you used to do, and to speak to me as familiarly as in old times. You cannot possibly imagine the pleasure it would give me. If that be the case, my dear Planchet, I will do so, certainly, replied Porthos, and... As he was quite close to Planchet, he raised his hand as if to strike him on the shoulder in token of friendly cordiality, but a fortunate movement of the horse made him miss his aim, so that his hand fell on the crupper of Planchet's horse instead, which made the animal's legs almost give way. D'Artagnan burst out laughing as he said, "'Take care, Planchet, for if Porthos begins to like you too much, he will caress you, and if he caresses you, he will knock you flat as a pancake. Porthos is still as strong as ever, you know.' Oh, said Planchet, Mousqueton is not dead, and yet Monsieur le Baron is very fond of him. Certainly, said Porthos, with a sigh, which made all three horses rear, and I was only saying this very morning to D'Artagnan how much I regretted him. But tell me, Planchet. Thank you, Monsieur le Baron. Thank you. Good lad, good lad. How many acres of park have you got? Of park? Yes, we will reckon up on the meadows presently, and the woods afterwards. Whereabouts, Monsieur? At your chateau? Oh, Monsieur le Baron, I have neither chateau, nor park, nor meadows, nor woods. What have you got, then? inquired Porthos. And why do you call it a country seat? I did not call it a country seat, Monsieur le Baron, replied Planchet, somewhat humiliated, but a country box. Ah, ah, I understand. You are modest. No, Monsieur le Baron, I speak the plain truth. I have room for a couple of friends, that's all. But in that case, whereabouts do your friends walk? In the first place, they can walk about the king's forest, which is very beautiful. 
Yes, I know the forest will be fine, said Porthos, nearly as beautiful as my forest at Barry. Planchet opened his eyes very wide. You have a forest of the same kind as the forest at Fontainebleau, Monsieur le Baron, he stammered out. Yes, I have two, indeed, but the one at Barry is my favorite. Why so? asked Planchet. Because I don't know where it ends, and also because it is full of poachers. How can the poachers make the forest so agreeable to you? Because they hunt my game, and I hunt them, which in these peaceful times is for me a sufficiently pleasing picture of war on a small scale. They had reached this turn of conversation when Planchet, looking up, perceived the houses at the commencement of Fontainebleau, the lofty outlines of which stood out strongly against the misty visage of the heavens, whilst rising above the compact and irregularly formed mass of buildings, the pointed roofs of the chateau were clearly visible, the slates of which glistened beneath the light of the moon like the scales of an immense fish. Gentlemen, said Planchet, I have the honor to inform you that we have arrived at Fontainebleau. End of chapter 4《チャプター five of Louise de la Valliere》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snowza, Houston, Texas, April 2013. Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter five. Planchet's country house. The cavaliers looked up and saw that what Planchet had announced to them was true. Ten minutes afterwards, they were in the street called the Rue de Léon, on the opposite side of the hostelry of the Beaupéon. A high hedge of bushy elders, hawthorn, and wild hops formed an impenetrable fence, behind which rose a white house with a high-tiled roof. Two of the windows, which were quite dark, looked upon the street. Between the two, a small door with a porch supported by a couple of pillars formed the entrance to the house. The door was gained by a step raised a little from the ground. Planchet got off his horse, as if he intended to knock at the door, but, on second thoughts, he took hold of his horse by the bridle and led it about thirty paces further on, his two companions following him. He then advanced about another thirty paces until he arrived at the door of a cart house, lighted by an iron grating, and, lifting up a wooden latch, pushed open one of the folding doors. He entered first, leading his horse after him by the bridle, into a small courtyard, where an odor met them, which revealed their close vicinity to a stable. "'That smells all right,' said Porthos, loudly getting off his horse, "'and I almost began to think that I am near my own cows at Pierrefond.' "'I have only one cow,' Planchet hastened to say modestly. "'And I have thirty, said Porthos. "'Or rather, I don't exactly know how many I have.' When the two cavaliers had entered, Planchet fastened the door behind them. In the meantime, D'Artagnan, who had dismounted with his usual agility, inhaled the fresh perfumed air with the delight a Parisian feels at the sight of green fields and fresh foliage, plucked a piece of honeysuckle with one hand and a sweet briar with the other. Porthos clawed hold of some peas which were twined round poles stuck into the ground and ate, or rather browsed upon them, shells and all, and Planchet was busily engaged trying to wake up an old, infirm peasant who was fast asleep in a shed lying on a bed of moss and dressed in an old stable suit of clothes. The peasant, recognizing Planchet, called him the master to the grocer's great satisfaction. Stable the horses well, old fellow, and you shall have something good for yourself, said Planchet. Yes, yes, fine animals there are too, said the peasant. Oh, they shall have as much as they like. Gently, gently, my man, said D'Artagnan. We are getting on a little too fast. A few oats and a good bed, nothing more. "'Some bran and water for my horse,' said Porthos, "'for it is very warm, I think.' "'Don't be afraid, gentlemen,' replied Planchet. "'Daddy Celestine is an old gendarme, and he fought at Ivory. "'He knows all about horses, so come into the house.' "'And he led the way along a well-sheltered walk, "'which crossed a kitchen garden, then a small paddock, "'and came out into a little garden behind the house, "'the principal front of which, as we have already noticed, "'faced the street. "'As they approached,' They could see, through two open windows on the ground floor which led into the sitting-room, the interior of Planchet's residence. This room, softly lighted by a lamp placed upon a table, seemed, from the end of the garden, like a smiling image of repose, comfort, and happiness. In every direction where the rays of light fell, whether upon a piece of old china, or upon an article of furniture shining from excessive neatness, or upon the weapons hanging against the wall, 
The soft light was softly reflected, and its rays seemed to linger everywhere upon something or another agreeable to the eye. The lamp which lighted the room, whilst the foliage of jasmine and climbing roses hung in masses from the window frames, splendidly illuminated a damask tablecloth as white as snow. The table was laid for two persons. Amber-colored wine sparkled in a long cut glass bottle, and a large jug of blue china with a silver lid was filled with foaming cider. Near the table, in a high-backed armchair, reclined fast asleep, a woman of about thirty years of age, her face the very picture of health and freshness. Upon her knees lay a large cat with her paws folded under her and her eyes half-closed, purring in that significant manner which, according to feline habits, indicates perfect contentment. The two friends paused before the window in complete amazement, while Planchet, perceiving their astonishment, was in no little degree secretly delighted at it. "'Ah, Planchet, you rascal!' said D'Artagnan. "'I now understand your absences.' "'Oh, oh, there is some white linen,' said Porthos, in his turn, in a voice of thunder. At the sound of his gigantic voice, the cat took flight. The housekeeper woke up with a start, and Planchet, assuming a gracious air, introduced his two companions into the room where the table was already laid. "'Permit me, my dear,' he said, "'to present to you Monsieur le Chevalier d'Artagnan, my patron.' D'Artagnan took the lady's hand in his in the most courteous manner, and with precisely the same chivalrous air as he would have taken Madame's. Monsieur le Baron du Vallon de Brossu de Pierrefonds, added Planchet. Porthos bowed with a reverence which Anne of Austria would have approved of. It was then Planchet's turn, and he unhesitatingly embraced the lady in question, not, however, until he had made a sign as if requesting D'Artagnan and Porthos's permission, a permission, as a matter of course, frankly conceded. D'Artagnan complimented Planchet and said, You are indeed a man who knows how to make life agreeable. Life, monsieur, said Planchet, laughing, is capital, which a man ought to invest as sensibly as he possibly can. And you get very good interest upon yours, said Porthos, with a burst of laughter like a peal of thunder. Planchet turned to his housekeeper. "'You have before you,' he said to her, "'the two gentlemen who influenced the greatest, gayest, grandest portion of my life. "'I have spoken to you of both of them very frequently. "'And about two others as well,' said the lady, with a very decided Flemish accent. "'Madame is Dutch?' inquired D'Artagnan. "'Porthos curled his moustache, the circumstance, which was not lost upon D'Artagnan, who noticed everything. "'I am from Antwerp,' said the lady. "'And her name is Madame Grecher, said Planchet. "'You should not call her Madame,' said D'Artagnan. "'Why not?' asked Planchet. "'Because it would make her seem older every time you call her so. "'Well, I call her Truchen. "'And a very pretty name, too,' said Porthos. Truchen said Planchet, "'came to me from Flanders with her virtue and two thousand florines. "'She ran away from a brute of a husband who was in the habit of beating her. "'Being myself a Picard born, I was always very fond of the artesian women, and it is only a step from Artois and Flanders. She came crying bitterly to her godfather, my predecessor at the Rue des Lombards. She placed her two thousand florins in my establishment, which I have turned into a very good account, and which have brought her in ten thousand. Bravo, Planchet! She is free and well off. She has a cow, a maidservant, and old Celestine at her orders. She mends my linen, knits my winter stockings. She only sees me every fortnight and seems to make herself in all things tolerably happy. I am indeed, gentlemen, I am very happy and comfortable, said Truchen with perfect ingenuousness. Porthos began to curl the other side of his moustache. The deuce, thought D'Artagnan, can Porthos have any intentions in that quarter? In the meantime, Truchen had set her cook to work and had laid the table for two more and covered it with every possible delicacy that can convert a light supper into a substantial meal, a meal into a regular feast. Fresh butter, salt beef, anchovies, tourni, a shopful of Planchet's commodities, fowls, vegetables, salad, fish from the pond and the river, game from the forest, all the produce, in fact, of the province. Moreover, Planchet returned from the cellar laden with ten bottles of wine, the glass of which could hardly be seen for the thick coating of dust which covered them. Porthos's heart began to expand as he said, I am hungry, and he sat himself beside Madame Truchen whom he looked at in the most killing manner. D'Artagnan seated himself on the other side of her, while Planchet, discreetly and full of delight, took his seat opposite. 
Do not trouble yourselves, he said, if Cushin should leave the table now and then during supper, for she will have to look after your bedrooms. In fact, the housekeeper made her escape quite frequently, and they could hear on the first floor above them the creaking of the wooden bedsteads and the rolling of the casters on the floor. While this was going on, the three men, Porthos especially, ate and drank gloriously. It was wonderful to see them. The ten full bottles were ten empty ones by the time Truchin returned with the cheese. D'Artagnan still preserved his dignity and self-possession, but Porthos had lost a portion of his, and the mirth soon began to grow somewhat uproarious. D'Artagnan recommended a new descent into the cellar, and, as Planchet no longer walked with the steadiness of a well-trained foot soldier, the captain of the musketeers proposed to accompany him. They set off, humming songs wild enough to frighten anybody who might be listening. Truchin remained behind at the table with Porthos, while the two wine-bibbers were looking behind the firewood for what they wanted. A sharp report was heard like the impact of a pair of lips on a lady's cheek. Porthos fancies himself at La Rochelle, thought D'Artagnan, as they returned freighted with bottles. Planchet was singing so loudly that he was incapable of noticing anything. D'Artagnan, whom nothing ever escaped, remarked how much redder Truchin's left cheek was than her right. Porthos was sitting on Truchin's left and was curling with his both hands, both sides of his mustache at once, and Truchin was looking at him with a most bewitching smile. The sparkling white of Anjou very soon produced a remarkable effect upon the three companions. D'Artagnan had hardly enough strength left to take a candlestick to light Planchet up his own staircase. Planchet was pulling Porthos along, who was following Truchin, who was herself jovial enough. It was D'Artagnan who found out the rooms and the beds. Porthos threw himself onto the one destined for him after his friend had undressed him. D'Artagnan got into his own bed, saying to himself, Mordieu, I had made up my mind never to touch that light-colored wine which brings my early camp days back again. Fie! Fie! If my musketeers were only to see their captain in such a state, and drawing the curtains of his bed, he added, Fortunately enough, though, they will not see me. The country is very amusing, said Porthos, stretching out his legs which passed through the wooden footboard and made a tremendous crash, of which, however, no one in the house was capable of taking the slightest notice. By two o'clock in the morning, everyone was fast asleep. End of chapter five. Chapter six of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snoza, Houston, Texas, April 2013. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 6. Showing What Could Be Seen from Planchet's House The next morning found the three heroes sleeping soundly. Truchin had closed the outside blinds to keep the first rays of the sun from the leaden-lidded eyes of her guests, like a kind, good housekeeper. It was still perfectly dark, then, beneath Porthos's curtains and under Planchet's canopy, when D'Artagnan, awakened by an indiscreet ray of light which made its way through a peak hole in the shutters, jumped hastily out of bed as if he wished to be the first at a forlorn hope. He took by assault Porthos's room, which was next to his own. The worthy Porthos was sleeping with a noise like distant thunder. In the dim obscurity of the room, his gigantic frame was preeminently displayed, and his swollen fist hung down outside the bed upon the carpet. D'Artagnan awoke Porthos, who rubbed his eyes in a tolerably good humor. In the meantime, Planchet was dressing himself, and met at their bedroom doors his two guests, who were still somewhat unsteady from their previous evening's entertainment. Although it was very early yet, the whole household was already up. The cook was mercilessly slaughtering in the poultry yard. Celestine was gathering white cherries in the garden. Porthos, brisk and lively as ever, held out his hand to Planchet's, and D'Artagnan requested permission to embrace Madame Truchin. The latter, to show that she bore no ill will, approached Porthos, upon whom she conferred the same favor. Porthos embraced Madame Truchin, heaving an enormous sigh. Planchet took both of his friends by the hand. I am going to show you over the house, he said. When we arrived last night, it was dark as an oven, and we were unable to see anything, but in broad daylight, everything looks different, and you will be satisfied, I hope. If we begin by the view you have here, said D'Artagnan, that charms me beyond anything, I have always lived in royal mansions, you know, 
than royal personages have tolerably sound ideas upon the selection of good points of view. I am a great stickler for a good view myself, said Porthos. At my chateau at Pierrefonds, I have had four avenues laid out, and at the end of each is a landscape of an altogether different character from the others. You shall see my prospect, said Planchet, and he led his two guests to a window. Ah, said D'Artagnan, this is the Rue de Léon. Yes, I have two windows on this side, a paltry, insignificant view, for there was always that bustling and noisy inn which is a very disagreeable neighbor. I had four windows here, but I bricked up two. Let us go on, said D'Artagnan. They entered a corridor leading to the bedrooms, and Planchet pushed open the outside blinds. Hello, what is that out yonder, said Planchet. The forest, said Planchet. It is the horizon, a thick line of green, which is yellow in the spring, green in the summer, red in the autumn, and white in the winter. Ah, very well, but it is like a curtain which prevents one seeing a greater distance. Yes, said Planchet. Still, one can see, and at all events, everything that intervenes. Ah, the open country, said Porthos. But what is that I see out there, crosses and stones? That is the cemetery, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Precisely, said Planchet. I assure you that it is very curious. Hardly a day passes that someone is not buried there, for Fontainebleau is by no means an inconsiderable place. Sometimes we see young girls clothed in white carrying banners, at others some of the town council or rich citizens with chaucers and all the parish authorities, and then, too, we see some of the officers of the king's household. I should not like that, said Porthos. There is not much amusement in it at all events, said D'Artagnan. I assure you, it encourages religious thoughts, replied Planchet. Oh, I don't deny that. But, continued Planchet, we must all die one day or another, and I once met with a maxim somewhere which I have remembered, and the thought of death is a thought that will do us all good. I am far from saying the contrary, said Porthos. But, objected D'Artagnan, the thought of green fields, flowers, rivers, blue horizons, extensive and boundless plains is not likely to do us good. If I had any, I should be far from rejecting them, said Planchet, but possessing only this little cemetery, full of flowers, so moss-grown, shady and quiet, I am contented with it, and I think of those who live in town on the Rue des Lombards, for instance, and who have to listen to the rumbling of a couple of thousand vehicles every day, and to the soulless tramp, tramp, tramp of a hundred and fifty thousand foot passengers. But living, said Porthos, living, remember that. That is exactly the reason, said Planchet timidly, why I feel it does me good to contemplate a few dead. Upon my word, said D'Artagnan, that fellow Planchet is a born philosopher as well as a grocer. Monsieur, said Planchet, I am one of those good-humored sort of men whom heaven created for the purpose of living a certain span of days, and of considering all good that they meet with during their transitory stay on earth. D'Artagnan sat close to the window, and as there seemed to be something substantial in Planchet's philosophy, he mused it over. Ah, ah, said Planchet, if I am not mistaken, we are going to have a representation now, for I think I heard something like chanting. Yes, said D'Artagnan, I hear singing, too. Oh, it is only a burial of a very poor description, said Planchet, disdainfully. The officiating priest, the beadle, and the one chorister boy, nothing more. You observe, monsieur, that the defunct lady or gentleman could not have been of very high rank. No, no one seems to be following the coffin. Yes, said Porthos, I see a man. You are right, a man wrapped in a cloak, said D'Artagnan. It is not worth looking at, said Planchet. I find it interesting, said D'Artagnan, leaning on the window sill. Come, come, you are beginning to take a fancy to this already, said Planchet delightedly. It is exactly my own case. I was so melancholy at first that I could do nothing but make the sign of the cross all day, and the chants were like so many nails being driven into my head. But now they lull me to sleep, and no bird I have ever seen or heard can sing better than those which are met with in this cemetery. Well, said Porthos, this is beginning to get a little dull for me, and I prefer going downstairs. Planchet, with one bound, was beside his guest, whom he offered to lead into the garden. What, said Porthos to D'Artagnan, as he turned round, are you going to remain here? Yes, I will join you presently. Well, Monsieur D'Artagnan is right, after all, said Planchet. Are they not beginning to bury yet? Not yet. Ah, yes, the grave digger is waiting until the cords are fastened around the bier. But, see, a woman has just entered the cemetery at the other end. Yes, yes, my dear Planchet, said D'Artagnan quickly. Leave me. 
Leave me, I feel I am beginning already to be much comforted by my meditations, so do not interrupt me. Planchet left, and D'Artagnan remained, devouring with his eager gaze from behind the half-closed blinds what was taking place before him. The two bearers of the corpse had unfastened the straps by which they carried the litter, and were letting their burden glide gently into the open grave. At a few paces distant, a man with a cloak wrapped around him, the only spectator of this melancholy scene, was leaning with his back against a large cypress tree, and kept his face and person entirely concealed from the grave diggers and the priests. The corpse was buried within five minutes. The grave having been filled up, the priests turned away, and the grave digger, having addressed a few words to them, followed them as they moved away. The man in the mantle bowed as they passed him, and put a piece of gold in the grave digger's hand. Mardu, murmured D'Artagnan, it is Aramis himself. Aramis, in fact, remained alone on that side at least, for hardly had he turned his head when a woman's footsteps and the rustling of her dress were heard on the path close to him. He immediately turned around, took off his hat with the most ceremonious respect. He led the lady under the shelter of some walnut and lime trees, which overshadowed a magnificent tomb. Ah, who would have thought it, said D'Artagnan, the Bishop of Vannes at a rendezvous? He is still the same Abbe Aramis as he was at Nuis le Sec. Yes, he added, after a pause, but it is in a cemetery. The rendezvous is sacred, but he almost laughed. The conversation lasted for fully half an hour. D'Artagnan could not see the lady's face, for she kept her back turned toward him, but he saw perfectly well by the erect attitude of both the speakers, by their gestures, by the measured and careful manner which they had glanced at each other, either by way of attack or defense, that they must be conversing about any other subject than of love. At the end of the conversation, the lady rose and bowed profoundly to Aramis. Oh, oh, said D'Artagnan, this rendezvous finishes like one of their tender nature, though. The cavalier kneels at the beginning, the young lady by and by gets tamed down, and then it is she who has to supplicate who is this lady? I would give anything to ascertain. It seemed impossible, however, for Aramis was the first to leave, and the lady carefully concealed her head and face, and then immediately departed. D'Artagnan could hold out no longer. He ran to the window which looked along the Rue de Léon, and saw Aramis entering the inn. The lady was proceeding in quite the opposite direction, it seemed, in fact, to be about to rejoin the equipage, consisting of two horses and a carriage, which he could see standing close to the borders of the forest. She was walking slowly with her head bent down, absorbed in the deepest meditation. Mardu, Mardu, I must and will learn who that woman is, said the musketeer again, and then, without further deliberation, he set off in pursuit of her. As he was going alone, he tried to think how he could possibly contrive to make her raise her veil. She is not young, he said, and is a woman of high rank in society. I ought to know that figure and peculiar style of walk. As he ran, the sound of his spurs and of his boots upon the hard ground of the street made a strange jingling noise, a fortunate circumstance in itself, which he was far from reckoning upon. The noise disturbed the lady. She seemed to fancy she was being either followed or pursued, which is indeed the case, and turned round. D'Artagnan started as if he had received a charge of small shot into his legs, and turning suddenly round as if he were going back the same way as he come, he murmured, Madame de Chevreuse? D'Artagnan would not go home until he had learnt everything. He asked Celestine to inquire of the gravedigger whose body it was that they had buried that morning. A poor Franciscan mendicant friar replied the latter, who had not even a dog to love him in this world and to accompany him to his last resting place. If that were really the case, thought D'Artagnan, we should not have found Aramis present at the funeral. The Bishop of Vannes is not precisely a dog as far as devotion goes. His scent, however, is quite as keen, I admit. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Louise de la Valliere This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 7 How Porthos, Truchen, and Planchet parted with each other on friendly terms thanks to D'Artagnan. There was good living in Planchet's house. 
Porthos broke a ladder and two cherry trees, stripped the raspberry bushes, and was only unable to succeed in reaching the strawberry beds on account, as he said, of his belt. Truchen, who had become quite sociable with the giant, said that it was not the belt so much as his corporation, and Porthos, in a state of the highest delight, embraced Truchen, who gathered him a pailful of the strawberries and made him eat them out of her hands. D'Artagnan, who arrived in the midst of these little innocent flirtations, scolded Porthos for his indolence, and silently pitied Planchet. Porthos breakfasted with a very good appetite, and when he had finished, he said, looking at Truchen, I could make myself very happy here. Truchen smiled at his remark, and so did Planchet, but not without embarrassment. D'Artagnan then addressed Porthos. You must not let the delights of Capua make you forget the real object of our journey to Fontainebleau. My presentation to the king? Certainly. I am going to take a turn in the town to get everything ready for that. Do not think of leaving the house, I beg. Oh, no, exclaimed Porthos. Planchet looked at D'Artagnan nervously. Will you be away long? he inquired. No, my friend, and this very evening I will release you from two troublesome guests. Oh, Monsieur D'Artagnan, can you say— no, no, you are a noble-hearted fellow, but your house is very small. Such a house, with half a dozen acres of land, would be fit for a king and make him very happy too. But you were not born a great lord. No more was Monsieur Porthos, murmured Planchet. But he has become so, my good fellow. His income has been a hundred thousand francs a year for the last twenty years, and for the last fifty years Porthos has been the owner of a couple of fists and a backbone, which are not to be matched throughout the whole realm of France. Porthos is a man of the very greatest consequence compared to you, and, well, I need say no more, for I know you are an intelligent fellow. No, no, monsieur, explain what you mean. Look at your orchard, how stripped it is, how empty your larder, your bedstead broken, your cellar almost exhausted. Look, too, at Madame Truchen. Oh, my goodness gracious, said Planchet, Madame Truchen is an excellent person, continued D'Artagnan, but keep her for yourself, do you understand? And he slapped him on the shoulder. Planchet at this moment perceived Porthos and Truchen sitting close together in an arbor. Truchen, with a grace of manner peculiarly Flemish, was making a pair of earrings for Porthos out of a double cherry, while Porthos was laughing as amorously as Samson in the company of Delilah. Planchet pressed D'Artagnan's hand, and ran towards the door. We must do Porthos the justice to say that he did not move as they approached, and, very likely, did not think he was doing any harm. Nor, indeed, did Truchen move either, which rather put Planchet out, but he, too, had been so accustomed to see fashionable folk in his shop that he found no difficulty in putting a good countenance on what seemed disagreeable or rude. Planchet seized Porthos by the arm, and proposed to go and look at the horses. But Porthos pretended he was tired. Planchet then suggested that the Baron du Vallon should taste some noyau of his own manufacturer, which was not to be equaled anywhere, an offer the Baron immediately accepted. And in this way, Planchet managed to engage his enemy's attention during the whole day, by dint of sacrificing his cellar in preference to his amour propre. Two hours afterwards, D'Artagnan returned. "'Everything is arranged,' he said. "'I saw His Majesty at the very moment he was setting off for the chase. "'The King expects us this evening.' "'The King expects me?' cried Porthos, drawing himself up. "'It is a sad thing to have to confess, "'but a man's heart is like an ocean billow, "'for, from that very moment, Porthos ceased to look at Madame Truchen "'in that touching manner which had so softened her heart.' Planchet encouraged these ambitious leanings as best as he could, or rather gave exaggerated accounts of all the splendours of the last reign, its battles, sieges, and grand court ceremonies. He spoke of the luxurious display which the English made, the prizes the three brave companions carried off, and how D'Artagnan, who at the beginning had been the humblest of the four, finished by becoming the leader. He fired Porthos with a general feeling of enthusiasm, by reminding him of his early youth now passed away. He boasted as much as he could of the moral life his great lord had led, and how religiously he respected the ties of friendship. 
He was eloquent and skilful in his choice of subjects. He tickled Porthos, frightened Truchen, and made D'Artagnan think. At six o'clock, the musketeer ordered the horses to be brought round, and told Porthos to get ready. He thanked Planchet for his kind hospitality, whispered a few words about a post he might succeed in obtaining for him at court, which immediately raised Planchet in Truchen's estimation, where the poor grocer, so good, so generous, so devoted, had become much lowered ever since the appearance and comparison with him of the two great gentlemen. Such, however, is a woman's nature. They are anxious to possess what they have not got, and disdain it as soon as it is acquired. After having rendered this service to his friend Planchet, D'Artagnan said in a low tone of voice to Porthos, "'That is a very beautiful ring you have on your finger.' "'It is worth three hundred pistoles,' said Porthos. "'Madame Truchen will remember you better if you leave her that ring,' replied D'Artagnan, a suggestion which Porthos seemed to hesitate to adopt. "'You think it is not beautiful enough, perhaps?' said the musketeer. "'I understand your feelings. A great lord such as you would not think of accepting the hospitality of an old servant without paying him most handsomely for it. But I am sure that Planchet is too good-hearted a fellow to remember that you have an income of a hundred thousand francs a year. I have more than half a mind, said Porthos, flattered by the remark, to make Madame Truchon a present of my little farm at Brasseur. It has twelve acres. It is too much, my good Porthos, too much just at present. Keep it for a future occasion. He then took the ring off Porthos's finger, and approaching Truchen said to her, Madame, Monsieur le Baron hardly knows how to entreat you, out of your regard for him, to accept this little thing. Monsieur du Vallon is one of the most generous and discreet men of my acquaintance. He wished to offer you a farm that he has at Brasseur, but I dissuaded him from it. Oh, said Truchen, looking eagerly at the diamond. Monsieur le Baron, exclaimed Planchet, quite overcome. My good friend, stammered out Porthos, delighted at having been so well represented by D'Artagnan. These several exclamations, uttered at the same moment, made quite a pathetic winding up of a day which might have finished in a very ridiculous manner. But D'Artagnan was there, and on every occasion, wheresoever D'Artagnan exercised any control, matters ended only just in the very way he wished and willed. There were general embracings, Truchen, whom the baron's munificence had restored to her proper position, very timidly and blushing all the while, presented her forehead to the great lord, with whom she had been on such very pretty terms the evening before. Planchet himself was overcome by a feeling of genuine humility. Still, in the same generosity of disposition, Porthos would have emptied his pockets into the hands of the cook and of Celestine, but D'Artagnan stopped him. No, he said, it is now my turn, and he gave one pistole to the woman and two to the man, and the benedictions which were showered down upon them would have rejoiced the heart of Harpagon himself, and have rendered even him a prodigal. D'Artagnan made Planchet lead them to the chateau, and introduce Porthos into his own apartment, where he arrived safely without having been perceived by those he was afraid of meeting. End of chapter 7《ชั่วเจ็ of Louisa de la Valliere》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Eight: The Presentation of Porthos at Court. At seven o'clock the same evening, the king gave an audience to an ambassador from the United Provinces in the Grand Reception Room. The audience lasted a quarter of an hour. His Majesty afterwards received those who had been recently presented, together with a few ladies, who paid their respects first. In one corner of the salon, concealed behind a column, Porthos and D'Artagnan were conversing together, waiting until their turn arrived. "'Have you heard the news?' inquired the musketeer of his friend. "'No. Well, look, then.' Porthos raised himself on tiptoe, and saw Monsieur Fouquet in full court dress, leading Aramis toward the king. "'Aramis,' said Porthos, "'presented to the king by Monsieur Fouquet.' "'Ah!' 
ejaculated Porthos. "'For having fortified Belle Isle,' continued D'Artagnan. "'And I? You? Oh, you! "'As I have already had the honor of telling you, "'are the good-natured, kind-hearted Porthos. "'And so they begged you to take care of San Mon a little.' ah repeated porthos but happily i was there said d'artagnan and presently it will be my turn at this moment fouquet addressed the king sire he said i have a favor to solicit of your majesty monsieur d'herblay is not ambitious but he knows when he can be of service your majesty needs a representative at rome who would be able to exercise a powerful influence there may i request a cardinal's hat for monsieur d'herblay the king started i do not often solicit anything of your majesty said fouquet that is a reason certainly replied the king who always expressed any hesitation he might have in that manner and to which remark there was nothing to say in reply fouquet and aramis looked at each other the king resumed monsieur de blay can serve us equally well in france an archbishopric for instance sire objected fouquet with a grace of manner peculiarly his own your majesty overwhelms monsieur d'herblay the archbishopric may in your majesty's extreme kindness be conferred in addition to the hat the one does not exclude the other the king admired the readiness which he displayed and smiled saying d'artagnan himself could not have answered better he had no sooner pronounced the name than d'artagnan appeared did your majesty call me he said aramis and fouquet drew back a step as if they were about to retire will your majesty allow me said d'artagnan quickly as he led forward porthos to present to your majesty monsieur le baron du vallon one of the bravest gentlemen of france as soon as aramis saw porthos he turned as pale as death while fouquet clenched his hands under his ruffles d'artagnan smiled blandly at both of them while porthos bowed visibly overcome before the royal presence porthos here murmured fouquet in aramis's ear hush deep treachery at work hissed the latter sire said d'artagnan it is more than six years ago i ought to have presented monsieur du vallon to your majesty but certain men resemble stars they move not one inch unless their satellites accompany them the pleiades are never disunited and that is the reason i have selected for the purpose of presenting him to you the very moment when you would see monsieur d'herblay by his side aramis almost lost countenance he looked at d'artagnan with a proud haughty air as though willing to accept the defiance the latter seemed to throw down ah these gentlemen are good friends then said the king excellent friends sire the one can answer for the other ask monsieur de Vannes now in what manner belle isle was fortified fouquet moved back a step belle isle said aramis coldly was fortified by that gentleman and he indicated porthos with his hand who bowed a second time louis could not withhold his admiration though at the same time his suspicions were aroused yes said d'artagnan but ask monsieur le baron whose assistance he had in carrying the works out aramis's said porthos frankly and he pointed to the bishop what the deuce does all this mean thought the bishop and what sort of a termination are we to expect to this comedy what exclaimed the king is the cardinal's i mean this bishop's name aramis his nom de guerre said d'artagnan my nickname said aramis a truce to modesty exclaimed d'artagnan beneath the priest's robe sire is concealed the most brilliant officer a gentleman of the most unparalleled intrepidity and the wisest theologian in your kingdom louis raised his head and an engineer also it appears he said admiring aramis's calm imperturbable self-possession an engineer for a particular purpose sire said the latter my companion in the musketeers sire said d'artagnan with great warmth of manner the man who has more than a hundred times aided your father's ministers by his advice 
M. d'Herblay, in a word, who, with M. du Vallon, myself, and M. le Comte de la Fere, who is known to your majesty, formed that quartet which was a good deal talked about during the late king's reign, and during your majesty's minority. And who fortified Belle Isle, the king repeated in a significant tone. Aramis advanced and bowed, in order to serve the son as I served the father. D'Artagnan looked very narrowly at Aramis while he uttered these words, which displayed so much true respect, so much warm devotion, such entire frankness and sincerity, that even he, D'Artagnan, the eternal doubter, he, the almost infallible in judgment, was deceived by it. A man who lies cannot speak in such a tone as that, he said. Louis was overcome by it. In that case, he said to Fouquet, who anxiously awaited the result of this proof, the cardinal's hat is promised. Monsieur d'Herblay, I pledge you my honor that the first promotion shall be yours. Thank Monsieur Fouquet for it. Colbert overheard these words. They stung him to the quick, and he left the salon abruptly. And you, Monsieur de Vallon, said the king, what have you to ask? I am truly pleased to have it in my power to acknowledge the services of those who were faithful to my father. Sire, began Porthos, but he was unable to proceed with what he was going to say. Sire, exclaimed D'Artagnan, this worthy gentleman is utterly overpowered by your majesty's presence. He who so valiantly sustained the looks and the fire of a thousand foes. But knowing what his thoughts are, I, who am more accustomed to gaze upon the sun, can translate them. He needs nothing, absolutely nothing. His sole desire is to have the happiness of gazing upon your majesty for a quarter of an hour. You shall sup with me this evening, said the king, saluting Porthos with a gracious smile. Porthos became crimson from delight and pride. The king dismissed him, and D'Artagnan pushed him into the adjoining apartment after he had embraced him warmly. "'Sit next to me at table,' said Porthos in his ear. "'Yes, my friend. Aramis is annoyed with me, I think. Aramis has never liked you so much as he does now. Fancy, it was I who was the means of his getting the cardinal's hat.' "'Of course,' said Porthos. "'By the by, does the king like his guests to eat much at his table?' It is a compliment to himself if you do, said D'Artagnan, for he himself possesses a royal appetite. End of chapter 8 Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah Chapter 9 of Louisa de la Valliere This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 9. Explanations. Aramis cleverly managed to effect a diversion for the purpose of finding D'Artagnan and Porthos. He came up to the latter, behind one of the columns, and, as he pressed his hand, said, So you have escaped from my prison. Do not scold him, said D'Artagnan. It was I, dear Aramis, who set him free. Ah, my friend, replied Aramis, looking at Porthos, could you not have waited with a little more patience? D'Artagnan came to the assistance of Porthos, who already began to breathe hard, in sore perplexity. You see, you members of the church are great politicians. We mere soldiers come at once to the point. The facts are these. I went to pay Bazamou a visit. Aramis pricked up his ears at this announcement. Stay, said Porthos. You make me remember that I have a letter from Bazamou for you, Aramis. And Porthos held out the bishop the letter we have already seen. Aramis begged to be allowed to read it, and read it without D'Artagnan feeling in the slightest degree embarrassed by the circumstance that he was so well acquainted with the contents of it. Besides, Aramis's face was so impenetrable that D'Artagnan could not but admire him more than ever. After he had read it, he put the letter into his pocket with the calmest possible air. "'You were saying, Captain?' he observed. "'I was saying,' continued the musketeer, "'that I have gone to pay Bazamou a visit on His Majesty's service. 
on his majesty's service said aramis yes said d'artagnan and naturally enough we talked about you and our friends i must say that bazamou received me coldly so i soon took my leave of him as i was returning a soldier accosted me and said no doubt as he recognized me notwithstanding i was in private clothes captain will you be good enough to read me the name written on this envelope and i read to monsieur du vallon at monsieur fouquet's house saint mande the deuce i said to myself porthouse has not returned then as i fancied to belle isle or to pierre fons but is at monsieur fouquet's house at saint mande and as monsieur fouquet is not at saint mande porthos must be quite alone or at all events with aramis i will go and see porthos and i accordingly went to see porthos very good said aramis thoughtfully you never told me that said porthos i had no time my friend and you brought back porthos with you to fontainebleau yes to planchet's house does planchet live at fontainebleau inquired aramis yes near the cemetery said porthos thoughtfully what do you mean by near the cemetery asked aramis suspiciously come thought the musketeer since there is to be a squabble let us take advantage of it yes the cemetery said porthos planchet is a very excellent fellow who makes very excellent preserves but his house has windows which look out upon the cemetery and a confoundedly melancholy prospect it is so this morning this morning asked aramis more and more excited d'artagnan turned his back to them and walked to the window where he began to play a march upon one of the panes of glass yes this morning we saw a man buried there ah very depressing was it not i should never be able to live in a house where burials can always be seen from the window d'artagnan on the contrary seems to like it very much so d'artagnan saw it as well not simply saw it he literally never took his eyes off the whole time aramis started and turned to look at the musketeer but the latter was engaged in earnest conversation with san anon aramis continued to question porthos and when he had squeezed all the juice out of this enormous lemon he threw the peel aside he turned toward his friend d'artagnan and clapping him on the shoulder when saint aignan had left him the king's supper having been announced said d'artagnan yes my dear fellow he replied we do not sup with his majesty i believe we do can you give me ten minutes conversation twenty if you like his majesty will take quite that time to get properly seated at table where shall we talk then here upon these seats if you like the king has left we can sit down and the apartment is empty let us sit down then they sat down and aramis took one of d'artagnan's hands in his tell me candidly my dear friend whether you have not counseled porthos to distrust me a little i admit i have but not as you understand it i saw that porthos was bored to death and i wished by presenting him to the king to do for him and for you what you would never do for yourselves what is that speak in your own praise and you have done it most nobly i thank you and i brought the cardinal's hat a little nearer just as it seemed to be retreating from you ah i admit that said aramis with a singular smile you are indeed not to be matched for making your friends fortunes for them you see then that i only acted with the view of making porthos's fortune for him i meant to have done that myself but your arm reaches further than ours it was now d'artagnan's turn to smile come said aramis we ought to deal truthfully with each other do you still love me d'artagnan the same as i used to do replied d'artagnan without compromising himself too much by this reply in that case thanks and now for the most perfect frankness said aramis you visited belle isle on behalf of the king pardieu you wish to deprive us of the pleasure of offering belle isle completely fortified to the king but before i could deprive you of that pleasure i ought to have been made acquainted with your intention of doing so 
you came to belle isle without knowing anything of you yes how the devil could i imagine that aramis had become so clever an engineer as to be able to fortify like polybius or archimedes true and yet you smelt me out over yonder oh yes and porthos too i did not divine that aramis was an engineer i was only able to guess that porthos might have become one there is a saying one becomes an orator one is born a poet but it has never been said one is born porthos and one becomes an engineer your wit is always amusing said aramis coldly well i will go on do when you found out our secret you made all the haste you could to communicate it to the king i certainly made as much haste as i could since i saw that you were making still more when a man weighing two hundred and fifty pounds as porthos does rides post when a gouty prelate i beg your pardon but you yourself told me you were so when a prelate scours the highway i naturally suppose that my two friends who did not wish to be communicative with me had certain matters of the highest importance to conceal from me and so i made as much haste as my leanness and the absence of gout would allow did it not occur to you my dear friend that you might be rendering porthos and myself a very sad service yes i thought it not unlikely but you and porthos made me play a very ridiculous part at belle isle i beg your pardon said aramis excuse me said d'artagnan so that pursued aramis you now know everything no indeed you know i was obliged to inform m fouquet of what had happened in order that he would be able to anticipate what you might have to tell the king that is rather obscure not at all m fouquet has his enemies you will admit that i suppose certainly and one in particular a dangerous one a mortal enemy well in order to counteract that man's influence it was necessary that m fouquet should give the king a proof of his great devotion to him and of his readiness to make the greatest sacrifices he surprised his majesty by offering him belle isle if you had been the first to reach paris the surprise would have been destroyed it would have looked as if we had yielded to fear i understand that is the whole mystery said aramis satisfied that he had at last quite convinced the musketeer only said the latter it would have been more simple to have taken me aside and said to me my dear d'artagnan we are fortifying belle isle and intend to offer it to the king tell us frankly for whom you are acting are you a friend of m colbert or of m fouquet perhaps i should not have answered you but you would have added are you my friend i should have said yes aramis hung down his head in this way continued d'artagnan you would have paralyzed my movements and i should have gone to the king and said sire m fouquet is fortifying belle isle and exceedingly well too but here is a note which the governor of belle isle gave me for your majesty or m fouquet is about to wait upon your majesty to explain his intentions with regard to it and i should not have been placed in an absurd position you would have enjoyed the surprise so long planned and we should not have had any occasion to look askant at each other when we met while on the contrary replied aramis you have acted altogether as one friendly to m colbert and you really are a friend of his i suppose certainly not indeed exclaimed the captain m colbert is a mean fellow and i hate him as i used to hate mazarin but without fearing him well then said aramis i love m fouquet and his interests are mine you know my position i have no property or means whatever m fouquet gave me several livings a bishopric as well m fouquet has served and obliged me like the generous-hearted man he is and i know the world sufficiently well to appreciate a kindness when i meet with one m fouquet has won my regard and i have devoted myself to his service you could not possibly do better you will find him a very liberal master aramis bit his lips and then said 
the best a man could possibly have. He then paused for a minute, D'Artagnan taking good care not to interrupt him. I suppose you know how Porthos got mixed up in all this. No, said D'Artagnan. I am curious, of course, but I never question a friend when he wishes to keep a secret from me. Well, then, I will tell you. It is hardly worth the trouble, if the confidence is to bind me in any way. Oh, do not be afraid. There is no man whom I love better than Porthos, because he is so simple-minded and good-natured. Porthos is so straightforward in everything. Since I have become a bishop, I have looked for these primeval natures, which make me love truth and hate intrigue. D'Artagnan stroked his mustache, but said nothing. I saw Porthos, and again cultivated his acquaintance, his own time hanging idly on his hands. His presence recalled my earlier and better days, without engaging me in any present evil. I sent for Porthos to come to Vanet. Monsieur Fouquet, whose regard for me is very great, having learnt that Porthos and I attached to each other by old ties of friendship, promised him increase of rank at the earliest promotion, and that is the whole secret. I shall not abuse your confidence, said D'Artagnan. I am sure of that, my dear friend. No one has a finer sense of honor than yourself. I flatter myself that you are right, Aramis. And now, and here the prelate looked searchingly and scrutinizingly at his friend, now let us talk of ourselves and for ourselves. Will you become one of Monsieur Fouquet's friends? Do not interrupt me until you know what that means. Well, I am listening. Will you become a marshal of France, peer, duke, and the possessor of a duchy with a million of francs? But, my friend, replied D'Artagnan, what must one do to get all that? Belong to Monsieur Fouquet. But I already belong to the king. Not exclusively, I suppose. Oh, a d'Artagnan cannot be divided. You have, I presume, ambitions, as noble hearts like yours have. Yes, certainly I have. Well? Well, I wish to be a marshal. The king will make me a marshal, duke, peer. The king will make me all that. Aramis fixed a searching look upon d'Artagnan. Is not the king master? said d'Artagnan. No one disputes it but louis the thirteenth was master also oh my dear friend between richelieu and louis the thirteenth stood no d'artagnan said the musketeer very quietly there are many stumbling blocks round the king said aramis not for the king's feet very likely not still one moment aramis i observe that every one thinks of himself and never of his poor prince i will maintain myself maintaining him and if you meet with ingratitude the weak alone are afraid of that you are quite certain of yourself i think so still the king may some day have no further need for you on the contrary i think his need of me will soon be greater than ever and hearken my dear fellow if it became necessary to arrest a new conde who would do it this this alone in france and d'artagnan struck his sword which clanked sullenly on the tessellated floor you are right said aramis turning very pale and then he rose and pressed d'artagnan's hand that is the last summons for supper said the captain of the musketeers will you excuse me aramis threw his arm round the musketeer's neck and said a friend like you is the highest jewel in the royal crown and they immediately separated i was right mused d'artagnan there is indeed something strangely serious stirring we must hasten the explosion breathed the coming cardinal for d'artagnan has discovered the existence of a plot end of chapter nine recording by dion johns salt lake city utah chapter ten of louise de la Vallière. this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Louise de la Vallière by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 10. Madame and de Guiche. 
it will not be forgotten how comte de guiche left the queen mother's apartments on the day when louis the fourteenth presented la valliere with the beautiful bracelets he had won in the lottery the comte walked to and fro for some time outside the palace in the greatest distress from a thousand suspicions and anxieties with which his mind was beset presently he stopped and waited on the terrace opposite the grove of trees watching for madame's departure more than half an hour passed away and as he was at that moment quite alone, the comte could hardly have had any very diverting ideas at his command. He drew his tables from his pocket, and, after hesitating over and over again, determined to write these words. Madame, I implore you to grant me one moment's conversation. Do not be alarmed at this request, which contains nothing in any way opposed to the profound respect with which I subscribe myself, etc., etc. He had signed and folded this singular love-letter, when he suddenly observed several ladies leaving the chateau, and afterwards several courtiers, too. In fact, almost every one that formed the queen's circle. He saw La Valliere herself, then Montalais walking with Malicorne. He watched the departure of the very last of the numerous guests that had a short time before thronged the queen mother's cabinet. Madame herself had not yet passed. She would be obliged, however, to cross the courtyard in order to enter her own apartments, and from the terrace, where he was standing, de guiche could see all that was going on in the courtyard at last he saw madame leave attended by a couple of pages who were carrying torches before her she was walking very quickly as soon as she reached the door she said let some one go and look for de guiche he has to render an account of a mission he had to discharge for me if he should be disengaged request him to be good enough to come to my apartment de guiche remained silent hidden in the shade but as soon as madame had withdrawn he darted from the terrace down the steps and assumed a most indifferent air so that the pages who were hurrying towards his rooms might meet him ah it is madame then who is seeking me he said to himself quite overcome and he crushed in his hand the now worse than useless letter monsieur le comte said one of the pages approaching him we are indeed most fortunate in meeting you why so messieurs a command from madame from madame said de guiche looking surprised "'Yes, Monsieur le Comte, Her Royal Highness has been asking for you. She expects to hear, she told us, the result of a commission you had to execute for her. Are you at liberty?' "'I am quite at Her Royal Highness's orders.' "'Will you have the goodness to follow us, then?' When de Guiche entered the Princess's apartments, he found her pale and agitated. Montalais was standing at the door, evidently uneasy about what was passing in her mistress's mind. De Guiche appeared. "'Ah, is that you, Monsieur de Guiche?' said Madame. "'Come in, I beg. Mademoiselle de Montalais, I do not require your attendance any longer.' Montalais, more puzzled than ever, curtsied and withdrew. De Guiche and the princess were left alone. The comte had every advantage in his favour. It was Madame who had summoned him to a rendezvous. But how was it possible for the comte to make use of this advantage? Madame was so whimsical, and her disposition so changeable. She soon allowed this to be perceived, for suddenly, opening the conversation, she said, "'Well, have you nothing to say to me?' He imagined she must have guessed his thoughts. He fancied, for those who are in love are thus constituted, being as credulous and blind as poets or prophets, he fancied she knew how ardent was his desire to see her, and also the subject uppermost in his mind. "'Yes, madame,' he said, "'and I think it very singular.' "'The affair of the bracelets,' she exclaimed eagerly. "'You mean that, I suppose?' "'Yes, madame. "'And you think the king is in love, do you not?' De Guiche looked at her for some time. Her eyes sank under his gaze, which seemed to read her very heart. "'I think,' he said, "'that the king may possibly have had an idea of annoying someone. Were it not for that, the king would hardly show himself so earnest in his attention as he is. He would not run the risk of compromising, for mere thoughtlessness of disposition, a young girl against whom no one has hitherto been able to say a word.' "'Indeed, the bold, shameless girl,' said the princess haughtily. "'I can positively assure your royal highness,' said de guiche with a firmness marked by great respect that madame de la valliere is beloved by a man who merits every respect for he is a brave and honourable gentleman bragelonne my friend yes madame well and though he is your friend what does that matter to the king the king knows that bragelonne is affianced to mademoiselle de la valliere and as raoul has served the king most valiantly the king will not inflict an irreparable injury upon him madame began to laugh in a manner that produced a sinister impression upon de guiche i repeat madame do not believe the king is in love with mademoiselle de la valliere and the proof that i do not believe it is that i was about to ask you whose a more propre it is likely the king is desirous of wounding 
you who are well acquainted with the whole court can perhaps assist me in ascertaining that and assuredly with greater sincerity since it is everywhere said that your royal highness is on very friendly terms with the king madame bit her lips and unable to assign any good and sufficient reasons changed the conversation prove to me she said fixing on him one of those looks in which the whole soul seems to pass into the eyes prove to me i say that you intend to interrogate me at the very moment i sent for you de guiche gravely drew from his pocket the now crumpled note that he had written and showed it to her sympathy she said yes said the comte with an indescribable tenderness of tone sympathy i have explained to you how and why i sought you you however have yet to tell me madame why you have sent for me true replied the princess she hesitated then suddenly exclaimed those bracelets will drive me mad you expected the king would offer them to you replied de guiche why not but before you madame before you his sister-in-law was there not the queen herself to whom the king should have offered them before la valliere cried the princess wounded to the quick could he not have presented them to me was there not the whole court indeed to choose from i assure you madame said the comte respectfully that if any one heard you speak in this manner if any one were to see how red your eyes are and heaven forgive me to see too the tear trembling on your eyelids it would be said that your royal highness was jealous jealous said the princess haughtily jealous of la valliere she expected to see de guiche yield beneath her scornful gesture and her proud tone but he simply and boldly replied jealous of la valliere yes madame am i to suppose monsieur she stammered out that your object is to insult me it is not possible madame replied the comte slightly agitated but resolved to master that fiery nature leave the room said the princess thoroughly exasperated de guiche's coolness and silent respect having made her completely lose her temper de guiche fell back a step bowed slowly but with great respect drew himself up looked as white as his lace cuffs and in a voice slightly trembling said it was hardly worth while to have hurried here to be subjected to this unmerited disgrace and he turned away with hasty steps he had scarcely gone half a dozen paces when madame darted like a tigress after him seized him by the cuff and making him turn round again said trembling with passion as she did so the respect you pretend to have is more insulting than the insult itself insult me if you please but at least speak madame said the comte gently as he drew his sword thrust this blade into my heart rather than kill me by degrees at the look he fixed upon her a look full of love resolution and despair even she saw how readily the comte so outwardly calm in appearance would pass his sword through his own breast if she added another word she tore the blade from his hands and pressing his arm with a feverish impatience which might pass for tenderness said do not be too hard upon me comte you see how i am suffering and yet you have no pity for me tears the cries of this strange attack stifled her voice as soon as de guiche saw her weep he took her in his arms and carried her to an armchair in another moment she would have been suffocated oh why he murmured as he knelt by her side why do you conceal your troubles from me do you love any one tell me it would kill me i know but not until i should have comforted consoled and served you even and do you love me to that extent she replied completely conquered i do indeed love you to that extent madame she placed both her hands in his my heart is indeed another's she murmured in so low a tone that her voice could hardly be heard but he heard it and said is it the king you love she gently shook her head and her smile was like a clear bright streak in the clouds through which after the tempest has passed one almost fancies paradise is opening but she added there are other passions in a high-born heart love is poetry but the real life of the heart is pride comte i was born on a throne i am proud and jealous of my rank why does the king gather such unworthy objects round him once more i repeat said the comte you are acting unjustly towards that poor girl who will one day be my friend's wife are you simple enough to believe that comte if i did not believe it he said turning very pale bragelonne should be informed of it to-morrow indeed he should if i thought that poor la valliere had forgotten the vow she had exchanged with raoul but no it would be cowardly to betray a woman's secret it would be criminal to disturb a friend's peace of mind you think then said the princess with a wild burst of laughter that ignorance is happiness i believe it he replied prove it to me then she said hurriedly it is easily done madame it is reported through the whole court that the king loves you and that you return his affection 
Well, she said, breathing with difficulty. Well, admit for a moment that Raoul, my friend, had come to me and said to me, Yes, the king loves Madame and has made an impression upon her heart. I possibly should have slain Raoul. It would have been necessary, said the princess, with the obstinacy of a woman who feels herself not easily overcome, for Monsieur de Bragelonne to have had proofs before he ventured to speak to you in that manner. Such, however, is the case, replied de Guiche with a deep sigh, that, not having been warned, I have never examined into the matter seriously, and now I find that my ignorance has saved my life. So, then, you drive selfishness and coldness to that extent, said Madame, that you would let this unhappy young man continue to love La Valliere? I would, until La Valliere's guilt were revealed. But the bracelets? Well, Madame, since you yourself expected to receive them from the king, what can I possibly say? The argument was a telling one, and the princess was overwhelmed by it, and from that moment her defeat was assured. But as her heart and mind were instinct with noble and generous feelings, she understood de Guiche's extreme delicacy. She saw that in his heart he really suspected that the king was in love with La Valliere, and that he did not wish to resort to the common expedient of ruining a rival in the mind of a young woman by giving the latter the assurance and certainty that this rival's affections were transferred to another woman. She guessed that his suspicions of La Valliere were aroused, and that, in order to leave himself time for his convictions to undergo a change so as not to ruin Louise utterly, he was determined to pursue a certain straightforward line of conduct. She could read so much real greatness of character, and to such true generosity of disposition in her lover, that her heart really warmed with affection towards him, whose passion for her was so pure and delicate. Despite his fear of incurring her displeasure, de Guiche, by retaining his position as a man of proud independence of feeling and deep devotion, became almost a hero in her estimation, and reduced her to the state of a jealous and little-minded woman. She loved him for this so tenderly that she could not refuse to give him a proof of her affection. "'See how many words we have wasted!' she said, taking his hand. "'Suspicions, anxieties, mistrust, sufferings. I think we have enumerated all those words.' "'Alas, madame, yes.' Efface them from your heart as I drive them from mine. Whether La Valliere does or does not love the king, and whether the king does or does not love La Valliere, from this moment you and I will draw a distinction in the two characters I have to perform. You open your eyes so wide I am sure you hardly understand me. You are so impetuous, madame, that I always tremble at the fear of displeasing you. And see how he trembles now, poor fellow, she said, with the most charming playfulness of manner. Yes, monsieur, I have two characters to perform. I am the sister of the king the sister-in-law of the king's wife. In this character, ought I not to take an interest in these domestic intrigues? Come, tell me what you think. As little as possible, madame. Agreed, monsieur. But it is a question of dignity, and then you know I am the wife of the king's brother. De Guiche sighed. A circumstance, she added with an expression of great tenderness, which will remind you that I am always to be treated with the profoundest respect. De Guiche fell at her feet, which he kissed with the religious fervor of a worshipper. And I begin to think that, really and truly, I have another character to perform. I was almost forgetting it. Name it, oh, name it, said de Guiche. I am a woman, she said in a voice lower than ever, and I love. He rose. She opened her arms, and their lips met. A footstep was heard behind the tapestry, and Mademoiselle de Montalais appeared. What do you want? said Madame. Monsieur de Guiche is wanted, replied Montalais, who was just in time to see the agitation of the actors of these four characters for de Guiche had consistently carried out his part with heroism. End of chapter 10by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 11. Montalais and Malicorne. Montalais was right. Monsieur de Guiche, thus summoned in every direction, was very much exposed, from such a multiplication of business, to the risk of not attending to any. It so happened that, considering the awkwardness of the interruption, Madame, notwithstanding her wounded pride and secret anger, could not, for the moment at least, reproach Montalais for having violated, in so bold a manner, the semi-royal order in which she had been dismissed on de Guiche's entrance. De Guiche also lost his presence of mind, or it would have been more correct to say, had already lost it, before Montalais's arrival. 
for scarcely had he heard the young girl's voice than, without taking leave of madame as the most ordinary politeness required, even between persons equal in rank and station, he fled from her presence, his heart tumultuously throbbing and his brain on fire, leaving the princess with one hand raised as though to bid him adieu. Montalais was at no loss, therefore, to perceive the agitation of the two lovers. The one who fled was agitated, and the one who remained was equally so. "'Well,' murmured the young girl, as she glanced inquisitively round her, "'this time at least I think I know as much as the most curious woman could possibly wish to know.' Madame felt so embarrassed by this inquisitorial look that, as if she heard Montalais's muttered side remark, she did not speak a word to her maid of honour, but, casting down her eyes, retired at once to her bedroom. Montalais, observing this, stood listening for a moment, and then heard Madame lock and bolt the door. By this she knew that the rest of the evening was at her own disposal, and making, behind the door, which had just been closed, a gesture which indicated but little real respect for the princess, she went down the staircase in search of Malicorne, who was very busily engaged at the moment in watching a courier who, covered with dust, had just left for the Comte de Guiche's apartments. Montalais knew that Malicorne was engaged in a manner of some importance. She therefore allowed him to look round and stretch out his neck as much as he pleased, and it was only when Malicorne had resumed his natural position that she touched him on the shoulder. Well, said Montalais, what is the latest intelligence you have? Monsieur de Guiche is in love with Madame. Fine news, truly. I know something more recent than that. Well, what do you know? That Madame is in love with Monsieur de Guiche. The one is the consequence of the other. Not always, my good Monsieur. Is that remark intended for me? Present company always accepted. Thank you, said Malicorne. Oh, well, and in the other direction, what is stirring? The king wished this evening, after the lottery, to see Mademoiselle de la Vallière. Well, and has he seen her? No, indeed. What do you mean by that? The door was shut and locked. So that? So that the king was obliged to go back again, looking very sheepish, like a thief who has forgotten his crowbar. Good. And in the third place? inquired Montalais. The courier who has just arrived for de Guiche came from Monsieur de Bragelonne. Excellent, said Montalais, clapping her hands together. Why so? Because we have work to do. If we get weary now, something unlucky will be sure to happen. We must divide the work, then, said Malicorne, in order to avoid confusion. Nothing easier, replied Montalais. Three intrigues, carefully nursed and carefully encouraged, will produce one with another, and taking a low average, three love letters a day. Oh, exclaimed Malicorne, shrugging his shoulders, you cannot mean what you say, darling. Three letters a day. That may do for sentimental common people. A musketeer on duty, a young girl at a convent, may exchange letters with their lovers once a day, perhaps, from the top of a ladder, or through a hole in the wall. A letter contains all the poetry their poor hearts have to boast of, but the cases we have in hand require to be dealt with very differently. Well, finish, said Montalais, out of patience with him. Someone may come. Finish? Why, I am only at the beginning. I have still three points as yet untouched. Upon my word, he will be the death of me with his Flemish indifference, exclaimed Montalais. And you will drive me mad with your Italian vivacity. I was going to say that our lovers here will be writing volumes to each other. But what are you driving at? At this. Not one of our lady correspondents will be able to keep the letters they may receive. Very likely. Monsieur de Guiche will not be able to keep his, either. That is probable. Very well, then. I will take care of all that. That is the very thing that is impossible, said Malicorne. Why so? Because you are not your own mistress. Your room is as much La Vallière's as your own, and there are certain persons who will think nothing of visiting and searching a maid of honor's room, so that I am terribly afraid of the queen, who is as jealous as a Spaniard, of the queen mother, who is as jealous as a couple of Spaniards, and last of all of Madame herself, who has jealousy enough for ten Spaniards. You forget someone else. Who? Monsieur. I was only speaking of the women. Let us add them up. We will call Monsieur Number One. De Guiche? Number Two. The Vicomte de Bragelonne? Number Three. And the King? The King? Number Four. Of course the King, who not only will be more jealous but more powerful than all the rest put together. Ah, my dear. Well? Into what a wasp's nest you have thrust yourself. And as yet not quite far enough, if you will follow me into it. Most certainly I will follow you where you like. Yet... Well, yet. While we have the time, I think it will be prudent to turn back. But I, on the contrary, think the wisest course to take is to put ourselves at once at the head of all these intrigues. You will never be able to do it. With you, I could superintend ten of them. 
I am in my element, you must know. I was born to live at the court, as the salamander is made to live in the fire. Your comparison does not reassure me in the slightest degree in the world, my dear Montalais. I have heard it said, and by learned men, too, that, in the first place, there are no salamanders at all, and that, if there had been any, they would have been infallibly baked or roasted on leaving the fire. Your learned men may be very wise as far as salamanders are concerned, but they would never tell you what I can tell you, namely, that our de Montalais is destined, before a month is over, to become the first diplomatist in the court of France. Be it so, but on the condition that I shall be the second. Agreed. An offensive and defensive alliance, of course. Only be very careful of any letters. I will hand them to you as I receive them. What shall we tell the king about madame? That madame is still in love with his majesty. What shall we tell madame about the king? That she would be exceedingly wrong not to humor him. What shall we tell La Vallière about madame? Whatever we choose, for La Vallière is in our power. How so? Every way. What do you mean? In the first place, through the Vicomte de Bragelonne. Explain yourself. You do not forget, I hope, that Monsieur de Bragelonne has written many letters to Mademoiselle de la Vallière? I forget nothing. Well, then, it was I who received, and I who intercepted those letters. And, consequently, it is you who have them still? Yes. Where? Here? Oh, no, I have them safe at Blois, in the little room you know well enough. That dear little room, that darling little room, the antechamber of the palace I intend you to live in one of these days. But, I beg your pardon, you said all those letters are in that little room? Yes. Did you not put them in a box? Of course, in the same box where I put all the letters I received from you, and where I put mine also when your business or your amusements prevented you from coming to our rendezvous. Ah, very good, said Malicorne. Why are you satisfied? Because I see there is a possibility of not having to run to Blois after the letters, for I have them here. You have brought the box away? It was very dear to me, because it belonged to you. Be sure and take care of it, for it contains original documents that will be of priceless value by and by. I am perfectly well aware of that, indeed, and that is the very reason why I laugh as I do, and with all my heart, too. And now, one last word. Why last? Do we need any one to assist us? No one. Valets or maidservants? Bad policy. You will give the letters. You will receive them. We must have no pride in this affair. Otherwise, Monsieur Malicorne and Mademoiselle R., not transacting their own affairs themselves, will have to make up their minds to see them done by others. You are quite right. But what is going on yonder in Monsieur de Guiche's room? Nothing. He is only opening his window. Let us be gone. And they both immediately disappeared, all the terms of the contract being agreed on. The window just opened was, in fact, that of the Comte de Guiche. It was not alone with the hope of catching a glimpse of Madame through her curtains that he seated himself by the open window, for his preoccupation of mind had, at that time, a different origin. He had just received, as we had already stated, the courier who had been dispatched to him by Bragelonne, the latter having written to de Guiche a letter which made the deepest impression upon him, and which he had read over and over again. "'Strange, strange,' he murmured. "'How irresponsible are the means by which destiny hurries men onward to their fate!' Leaving the window in order to approach nearer to the light, he once more read the letter he had just received. "'Calais. My dear Count, I found Monsieur de Wardes at Calais. He has been seriously wounded in an affair with the Duke of Buckingham. De Wardes is, as you know, unquestionably brave, but full of malevolent and wicked feelings. He conversed with me about yourself, for whom he says he has a warm regard, also about Madame, whom he considers a beautiful and amiable woman. He has guessed your affection for a certain person. He also talked to me about the lady for whom I have so ardent a regard, and showed the greatest interest on my behalf in expressing a deep pity for me, accompanied, however, by dark hints which alarmed me at first, but which I at last looked upon as the result of his unusual love of mystery. These are the facts. He had received news of the court. You will understand, however, that it was only through Monsieur de Lorraine. The report goes, so says the news, that a change has taken place in the king's affections. You know whom that concerns. Afterwards, the news continues, people are talking about one of the maids of honor, respecting whom various slanderous reports are being circulated. These vague phrases have not allowed me to sleep. I have been deploring, ever since yesterday, that my diffidence and vacillation of purpose, notwithstanding a certain obstinacy of character I may possess, have left me unable to reply to these insinuations. In a word, M. de Wardes was setting off for Paris, and I did not delay his departure with explanations, for it seemed rather hard, I confess, to cross-examine a man whose wounds are hardly yet closed. 
In short, he travelled by short stages, as he was anxious to leave, he said, in order to be present at a curious spectacle the court cannot fail to offer within a short time. He added a few congratulatory words, accompanied by vague sympathising expressions. I could not understand the one any more than the other. I was bewildered by my own thoughts, and tormented by a mistrust of this man, a mistrust which, you know better than any one else, I have never been able to overcome. As soon as he left, my perceptions seemed to become clearer. It is hardly possible that a man of de Wardes's character should not have communicated something of his own malicious nature to the statement he made to me. It is not unlikely, therefore, that in the strange hints de Wardes threw out in my presence there may be a mysterious signification, which I might have some difficulty in applying either to myself or to someone with whom you are acquainted. Being compelled to leave as soon as possible in obedience to the king's commands, the idea did not occur to me of running after de Wardes in order to ask him to explain his reserve, but I have dispatched a courier to you with this letter, which will explain in detail my various doubts. I regard you as myself. You have reflected and observed. It will be for you to act. M. de Wardes will arrive very shortly. Endeavour to learn what he meant, if you do not already know. M. de Wardes, moreover, pretended that the Duke of Buckingham left Paris on the very best of terms with Madame. This was an affair which would have unhesitatingly made me draw my sword, had I not felt I was under the necessity of dispatching the King's mission before undertaking any quarrel whatsoever. Burn this letter, which Olivant will hand you. Whatever Olivant says, you may confidently rely on. Will you have the goodness, my dear Comte, to recall me to the remembrance of Mademoiselle de la Vallière, whose hands I kiss with the greatest respect? Your devoted de Bragelonne. P.S. If anything serious should happen, we should be prepared for everything. Dispatch a courier to me with this one single word. Come, and I will be in Paris within six and thirty hours after the receipt of your letter. De Guiche sighed, folded up the letter a third time, and, instead of burning it as Raoul had recommended him to do, placed it in his pocket. He felt it needed reading over and over again. "'How much distress of mind, yet what sublime confidence he shows!' murmured the Comte. "'He has poured out his whole soul in this letter. He says nothing of the Comte de la Fere, and speaks of his respect for Louise. He cautions me on my own account, and entreats me on his.' Ah, continued de Guiche, with a threatening gesture, you interfere in my affairs, Monsieur de Wardes, do you? Very well, then, I will shortly occupy myself with yours. As for you, poor Raoul, you who entrust your heart to my keeping, be assured I will watch over it. With this promise, de Guiche begged Malicorne to come immediately to his apartments, if possible. Malicorne acknowledged the invitation with an activity which was the first result of his conversation with Montalais. And when de Guiche, who thought that his motive was undiscovered, cross-examined Malicorne, the latter, who appeared to be working in the dark, soon guessed his questioner's motives. The consequence was, that after a quarter of an hour's conversation, during which de Guiche thought he had ascertained the whole truth with regard to La Valliere and the king, he had learned absolutely nothing more than his own eyes had already acquainted him with, while Malicorne learned, or guessed, that Raoul, who was absent, was fast becoming suspicious, and that de Guiche intended to watch over the treasure of the Hesperides. Malicorne accepted the office of dragon. De Guiche fancied he had done everything for his friend, and soon began to think of nothing but his personal affairs. The next evening, de Wardes's return and first appearance at the king's reception was announced. When that visit had been paid, the convalescent waited on Monsieur de Guiche, taking care, however, to be at Monsieur's apartments before the visit took place. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 12 How De Ward was received at court. Monsieur had received de Ward with that marked favor light and frivolous minds bestow on every novelty that comes in their way. De Ward, who had been absent for a month, was like fresh fruit to him. To treat him with marked kindness was an infidelity to old friends, and there is always something fascinating in that. Moreover, it was a sort of reparation to de Ward himself nothing consequently could exceed the favorable notice monsieur took of him the chevalier de lorraine who feared this rival but a little but who respected a character and disposition only to parallel to his own in every particular with the addition of a bulldog courage he did not himself possess 
received de wardes with a greater display of regard and affection than even monsieur had done de guiche as we have said was there also but kept in the background waiting very patiently until all these interchanges were over de wardes while talking to the others and even to monsieur himself had not for a moment lost sight of de guiche who he instinctively felt was there on his account as soon as he had finished with the others he went up to de guiche they exchanged the most courteous compliments after which de wardes returned to monsieur and the other gentlemen in the midst of these congratulations madame was announced she had been informed of de wardes arrival and knowing all the details of his voyage and duel she was not sorry to be present at the remarks she knew would be made without delay by one who she felt assured was her personal enemy two or three of her ladies accompanied her de wardes saluted madame in the most graceful and respectful manner and as a commencement of hostilities announced in the first place that he could furnish the duke of buckingham's friends with the latest news about him this was a direct answer to the coldness with which madame had received him the attack was a vigorous one and madame felt the blow but without appearing to have even noticed it he rapidly cast a glance at monsieur and at de guiche the former colored and the latter turned very pale madame alone preserved an unmoved countenance but as she knew how many unpleasant thoughts and feelings her enemy could awaken in the two persons who were listening to him she smilingly bent forward towards the traveller as if to listen to the news he had brought but he was speaking of other matters madame was brave even to imprudence if she were to retreat it would be inviting an attack so after the first disagreeable impression had passed away she returned to the charge have you suffered much from your wounds monsieur de war she inquired for we have been told that you had the misfortune to get wounded it was now de wardes turn to wince he bit his lips and replied no madame hardly at all indeed and yet in this terribly hot weather the sea breezes were very fresh and cool madame and then i had one consolation indeed what was it the knowledge that my adversary's sufferings were still greater than my own ah you mean he was more seriously wounded than you were i was not aware of that said the princess with utter indifference oh madame you are mistaken or rather you pretend to misunderstand my remark i did not say that he was a greater sufferer in body than myself but his heart was very seriously affected de guiche comprehended instinctively from what direction the struggle was approaching he ventured to make a sign to madame as if entreating her to retire from the contest but she without acknowledging de guiche's gesture without pretending to have noticed it even and still smiling continued is it possible she said that the duke of buckingham's heart was touched i had no idea until now that a heart wound could be cured alas madame replied de wardes politely every woman believes that and it is this belief that gives them that superiority to man which confidence begets you misunderstand altogether dearest said the prince impatiently monsieur de wardes means that the duke of buckingham's heart had been touched not by the sword but by something sharper ah very good very good exclaimed madame it is a jest of monsieur de wardes very good but i should like to know if the duke of buckingham would appreciate the jest it is indeed a very great pity he is not here monsieur de wardes the young man's eyes seemed to flash fire oh he said as he clenched his teeth there is nothing i should like better de guiche did not move madame seemed to expect that he would come to her assistance monsieur hesitated the chevalier de lorraine advanced and continued the conversation madame he said de wardes knows perfectly well that for a buckingham's heart to be touched is nothing new and what he has said has already taken place instead of an ally i have two enemies murmured madame 
two determined enemies and in league with each other and she changed the conversation to change the conversation is as every one knows a right possessed by princes which etiquette requires all to respect the remainder of the conversation was moderate enough in tone the principal actors had rehearsed their parts madame withdrew easily and monsieur who wished to question her on several matters offered her his hand on leaving the chevalier was seriously afraid that an understanding might be established between the husband and wife if he were to leave them quietly together he therefore made his way to monsieur's apartments in order to surprise him on his return and to destroy with a few words all the good impressions madame might have been able to sow in his heart de guiche advanced towards de wardes who was surrounded by a large number of persons and thereby indicated his wish to converse with him de wardes at the same time showing by his looks and by a movement of his head that he perfectly understood him there was nothing in these signs to enable strangers to suppose they were otherwise than upon the most friendly footing de guiche could therefore turn away from him and wait until he was at liberty he had not long to wait for de wardes freed from his questioners approached de guiche and after a fresh salutation they walked side by side together you have made a good impression since your return my dear de wardes said the comte excellent as you see and your spirits are just as lively as ever better and a very great happiness too why not everything is so ridiculous in this world everything so absurd around us you are right you are of my opinion then i should think so and what news do you bring us from yonder i none at all i have come to look for news here but tell me you surely must have seen some people at bologna one of our friends for instance it is no great time ago some people one of our friends your memory is short ah true bragelonne you mean exactly so who was on his way to fulfil a mission with which he was entrusted to king charles the second precisely well then did he not tell you or did not you tell him i do not precisely know what i told him i must confess but i do know what i did not tell him de wardes was finesse itself he perfectly well knew from de guiche's tone and manner which was cold and dignified that the conversation was about to assume a disagreeable turn he resolved to let it take what course it pleased and to keep strictly on his guard may i ask you what you did not tell him inquired de guiche all about la valliere la valliere what is it and what was that strange circumstance you seem to have known over yonder which bragelonne who was here on the spot was not acquainted with do you really ask me that in a serious manner nothing more so what you a member of the court living in madame's household a friend of monsieur's a guest at their table the favorite of our lovely princess guiche colored violently from anger what princess are you alluding to he said i am only acquainted with one my dear fellow i am speaking of madame herself are you devoted to another princess then come tell me de guiche was on the point of launching out but he saw the drift of the remark a quarrel was imminent between the two young men de wardes wished the quarrel to be only in madame's name while de guiche would not accept it except on la valliere's account from this moment it became a series of feigned attacks which would have continued until one of the two had been touched home de guiche therefore resumed all the self-possession he could command there is not the slightest question in the world of madame in this matter my dear de wardes said guiche but simply of what you were talking about just now what was i saying that you had concealed certain things from bragelonne certain things which you know as well as i do replied de wardes no upon my honor nonsense if you tell me what they are i shall know but not otherwise i swear what i who have just arrived from a distance of sixty leagues 
and you who have not stirred from this place, who have witnessed with your own eyes that which rumor informed me of at Calais? Do you now tell me seriously that you do not know what is it about? Oh, Comte, this is hardly charitable of you. As you like, De Ward, but I again repeat, I know nothing. You are truly discreet. Well, perhaps it is very prudent of you. And so you will not tell me anything, will not tell me any more than you told Bragelonne? You are pretending to be deaf, I see. I am convinced that Madame could not possibly have more command over herself than you have. Double hypocrite, murmured Guiche to himself. You are again returning to the old subject. Very well, then, continued de Wardes, since we find it so difficult to understand each other about La Valliere and Bragelonne, let us speak about your own affairs. Nay, said de Guiche, I have no affairs of my own to talk about. You have not said anything about me, I suppose, to Bragelonne, which you cannot repeat to my face? No, but understand me, Guiche, that however much I may be ignorant of certain matters, I am quite as conversant with others. If, for instance, we were conversing about the intimacies of the Duke of Buckingham at Paris, as I did during my journey with the Duke, I could tell you a great many interesting circumstances. Would you like me to mention them? De Guiche passed his hand over his forehead, which was covered in perspiration. No, no, he said, a hundred times no. I have no curiosity for matters which do not concern me. The Duke of Buckingham is for me nothing more than a simple acquaintance, whilst Raoul is an intimate friend. I have not the slightest curiosity to learn what happened to the Duke, while I have, on the contrary, the greatest interest in all that happened to Raoul. In Paris? Yes, in Paris, or Bologna. You understand I am on the spot. If anything should happen, I am here to meet it whilst Raoul is absent, and has only myself to represent him, so Raoul's affairs before my own. But he will return? Not, however, until his mission is completed. In the meantime, you understand, evil reports cannot be permitted to circulate about him without my looking into them, and for a better reason still, that he will remain some time in London, said de Ward, chuckling. You think so? said de guiche simply think so indeed do you suppose he was sent to london for no other purpose than to go there and return again immediately no no he was sent to london to remain there ah de wardes said de guiche grasping de wardes hand that is a very serious suspicion concerning bragelonne which completely confirms what he wrote to me from bologna de wardes resumed his former coldness of manner his love of raillery had led him too far and by his own imprudence he had laid himself open to attack well tell me what did he write to you about he inquired he told me that you had artfully insinuated some injurious remarks against la valliere and that you had seemed to laugh at his great confidence in that young girl well it is perfectly true i did so said de wardes and i was quite ready at the time to hear from the vicomte de bragelonne that which every man expects from another whenever anything may have been said to displease him in the same way for instance if i were seeking a quarrel with you i should tell you that madame after having shown the greatest preference for the duke of buckingham is at this moment supposed to have sent the handsome duke away for your benefit oh that would not wound me in the slightest degree my dear de wardes said de guiche smiling notwithstanding the shiver that ran through his whole frame why such a favor would be too great a happiness i admit that but if i absolutely wished to quarrel with you i should try and invent a falsehood perhaps and speak to you about a certain arbor where you and that illustrious princess were together i should speak also of certain gratifications of certain kissings of the hand and you who are so secret on all occasions so hasty so punctilious well said de guiche interrupting him with a smile upon his lips although he almost felt as if he were going to die i swear i should not care for that nor should i in any way contradict you 
for you must know, my dear marquis, that for all matters which concern myself I am a block of ice. But it is a very different thing when an absent friend is concerned, a friend who, on leaving, confided his interest to my safe keeping. For such a friend, de Wardes, believe me, I am like fire itself. I understand you, Monsieur de Guiche. In spite of what you say, there cannot be any question between us, just now, either of Bragelonne or of this insignificant girl, whose name is La Valliere. At this moment, some of the younger courtiers were crossing the apartment, and having already heard the few words which had just been pronounced, were able also to hear those which were about to follow. De Wardes observed this, and continued aloud. Oh, if La Valliere were a coquette like Madame, whose innocent flirtations, I am sure, were, first of all, the cause of the Duke of Buckingham being sent back to England, and afterwards were the reason of your being sent into exile, for you will not deny, I suppose, that Madame's pretty ways really had a certain influence over you. The courtiers drew nearer to the speakers, St. Agno at their head, and then Monicamp. But, my dear fellow, whose fault was that? said de Guiche, laughing. I am a vain, conceited fellow, I know, and everybody else knows it too. I took seriously that which was only intended as a jest, and got myself exiled for my pains. But I saw my error. I overcame my vanity, and I obtained my recall, by making the amende honorable, and by promising myself to overcome this defect and the consequence is that i am so thoroughly cured that i now laugh at the very thing which three or four days ago would have almost broken my heart but raoul is in love and is loved in return he cannot laugh at the reports which disturb his happiness reports which you seem to have undertaken to interpret when you know marquis as i do as these gentlemen do as every one does in fact that all such reports are pure calumny calumny exclaimed de wardes furious at seeing himself caught in the snare by de guiche's coolness of temper certainly calumny look at this letter from him in which he tells me you have spoken ill of mademoiselle de la valliere and where he asks me if what you reported about this young girl is true or not do you wish me to appeal to these gentlemen de wardes to decide and with admirable coolness de guiche read aloud the paragraph of the letter which referred to la valliere and now continued de guiche there is no doubt in the world as far as i am concerned that you wished to disturb bragelonne's peace of mind and that your remarks were maliciously intended de wardes looked round him to see if he could find support from any one but at the idea that de wardes had insulted either directly or indirectly the idol of the day every one shook his head and de wardes saw that he was in the wrong messieurs said de guiche intuitively divining the general feeling my discussion with monsieur de wardes refers to a subject so delicate in its nature that is most important no one should hear more than you have already heard close the doors then i beg you and let us finish our conversation in the manner which becomes two gentlemen one of whom has given the other the lie messieurs messieurs exclaimed those who were present is it your opinion then that i was wrong in defending mademoiselle de la valliere said de guiche in that case i pass judgment upon myself and am ready to withdraw the offensive words i may have used to monsieur de wardes the deuce certainly not said saint agno mademoiselle de la valliere is an angel virtue and purity itself said monicamp you see monsieur de wardes said de guiche i am not the only one who undertakes the defence of that poor girl i entreat you therefore messieurs a second time to leave us you see it is impossible we could be more calm and composed than we are it was the very thing the courtiers wished some went out at one door and the rest at the other and the two young men were left alone well played said de wardes to the comte was it not replied the latter how can it be wondered at my dear fellow i have got quite rusty in the country while the command you have acquired over yourself comte confounds me 
a man always gains something in women's society so pray accept my congratulations i do accept them and i will make madame a present of them and now my dear monsieur de ward let us speak as loud as you please do not defy me i do defy you for you are known to be an evil-minded man if you do that you will be looked upon as a coward too and monsieur would have you hanged this evening at his window casement speak my dear de ward speak i have fought already but not quite enough yet i see you would not be sorry to fight me while my wounds are still open no better still the deuce you are unfortunate in the moment you have chosen a duel after the one i have just fought would hardly suit me i have lost too much blood at bologna at the slightest effort my wounds would open again and you would really have too good a bargain true said de guiche and yet on your arrival here your looks and your arms showed there was nothing the matter with you yes my arms are all right but my legs are weak and then i have not had a foil in my hand since that devil of a duel and you i am sure have been fencing every day in order to carry your little conspiracy against me to a successful issue upon my honor monsieur replied de guiche it is six months since i last practised no comte after due reflection i will not fight at least with you i will await bragelonne's return since you say it is bragelonne who finds fault with me oh no indeed you shall not wait until bragelonne's return exclaimed the comte losing all command over himself for you have said that bragelonne might possibly be some time before he returns and in the meanwhile your wicked insinuations would have had their effect yet i shall have my excuse so take care i shall give you a week to finish your recovery that is better we will wait a week yes yes i understand a week will give time to my adversary to make his escape no no i will not give you one day even you are mad monsieur said de wardes retreating a step and you are a coward if you do not fight willingly nay what is more i will denounce you to the king as having refused to fight after having insulted la valliere ah said de wardes you are dangerously treacherous though you pass for a man of honor there is nothing more dangerous than the treachery as you term it of the man whose conduct is always loyal and upright restore me the use of my legs then or get yourself bled till you are as white as i am as to equalize our chances no no i have something better than that to propose what is it we will fight on horseback and will exchange three pistol shots each you are a first-rate marksman i have seen you bring down swallows with single balls and at full gallop do not deny it for i have seen you myself i believe you are right said de wardes and as that is the case it is not unlikely i might kill you you would be rendering me a very great service if you did i will do my best is it agreed give me your hand upon it there it is but on one condition however name it that not a word shall be said about it to the king not a word i swear i will go and get my horse then and i mine where shall we meet in the plain i know an admirable place shall we go together why not and both of them on their way to the stables passed beneath madame's windows which were faintly lighted a shadow could be seen behind the lace curtains there is a woman said de wardes smiling who does not suspect that we are going to fight to die perhaps on her account End of chapter twelve recording by dion gines salt lake city utah Chapter Thirteen of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter Thirteen: The Combat. De Wade and De Guiche selected their horses and saddled them with their own hands with holster saddles de guiche having two pairs of pistols went to his apartments to get them 
and after having loaded them, gave the choice to De Wad, who selected the pair he had made use of twenty times before, the same, indeed, with which De Guiche had seen him kill swallows flying. "'You will not be surprised,' he said, "'if I take every precaution. "'You know the weapons well, "'and consequently I am only making the chances equal.' your remark was quite useless replied de guiche and you have done no more than you are entitled to do now said de wade i beg you to have the goodness to help me mount for i still experience a little difficulty in doing so in that case we had better settle the matter on foot no once in the saddle i shall be all right very good then we will not speak of it again said de guiche as he assisted de wade to mount his horse and now continued the young man in our eagerness to murder one another we have neglected one circumstance what is that that it is quite dark and we shall almost be obliged to grope about in order to kill oh said de guiche you are as anxious as i am that everything should be done in the proper order yes but i do not wish people to say that you have assassinated me any more than supposing i were to kill you I should myself like to be accused of such a crime. Did any one make a similar remark about your duel with the Duke of Buckingham? said de Guiche. It took place precisely under the same conditions as ours. Very true, but there was still light enough to see by, and we were up to our middles almost in the water. Besides, there were a good number of spectators on shore looking at us. De Guiche reflected for a moment, and the thought which had already presented itself to him became more confirmed, that de Wad wished to have witnesses present in order to bring back the conversation about Madame, and to give a new turn to the combat. He avoided saying a word in reply, therefore, and as de Wad once more looked at him interrogatively, he replied, by a movement of the head, that it would be best to let things remain as they were. The two adversaries consequently set off, and left the chateau by the same gate, close to which we may remember to have seen Montalais and Malicon together. The night, as if to counteract the extreme heat of the day, had gathered the clouds together in masses, which were moving slowly along from the west to the east. The vault above, without a clear spot anywhere visible, or without the faintest indication of thunder, seemed to hang heavily over the earth and soon began by the force of the wind to split into streamers like a huge sheet torn to shreds large and warm drops of rain began to fall heavily and gathered the dust into globules which rolled along the ground at the same time the hedges which seemed conscious of the approaching storm the thirsty plants the drooping branches of the trees exhaled a thousand aromatic odors which revived in the mind tender recollections, thoughts of youth, endless life, happiness, and love. How fresh the earth smells, said de Wad. It is a piece of coquetry to draw us to her. By the by, replied de Guiche, several ideas have just occurred to me, and I wish to have your opinion upon them. Relative to? Relative to our engagement. It is quite some time, in fact, that we should begin to arrange matters is it to be an ordinary combat and conducted according to established custom let me first know what your established custom is that we dismount in any particular open space that may suit us fasten our horses to the nearest object meet each without our pistols in our hands and afterwards retire for a hundred and fifty paces in order to advance on each other very good that is precisely the way in which i killed poor foliva three weeks ago at saint denis i beg your pardon but you forgot one circumstance what is that that in your duel with foliva you advanced towards each other on foot your swords between your teeth and your pistols in your hands true while now on the contrary as you cannot walk you yourself admit that we shall have to mount our horses again and charge and the first who wishes to fire will do so that is the best course no doubt but it is quite dark we must make allowances for more missed shots than would be the case in the daytime very well each will fire three times 
the pair of pistols already loaded, and one reload. Excellent. Where shall our engagement take place? Have you any preference? No. You see that small wood which lies before us? The wood which is called Rochine? Exactly. You know it? Perfectly. You know that there is an open glade in the center? Yes. Well, this glade is admirably adapted for such a purpose, with a variety of roads, by paths, paths, ditches, windings, and avenues. We could not find a better spot. I am perfectly satisfied, if you are so. We are at our destination, if I am not mistaken. Yes, look at the beautiful open space in the center. The faint light which the stars afford seems concentrated in this spot. The woods which surround it seem, with their barriers, to form its natural limits. Very good. Do as you say. Let us first settle the conditions. These are mine. If you have any objection to make, you will state it. I am listening. If the horse be killed, its rider will be obliged to fight on foot. That is a matter of course, since we have no change of horses here. But that does not oblige his adversary to dismount. His adversary will, in fact, be free to act as he likes. The adversaries, having once met in close contact, cannot quit each other under any circumstances, and may consequently fire muzzle the muzzle. Agreed. Three shots, and no more will do, I suppose. Quite sufficient, I think. Here are powder and balls for your pistols. Measure out three charges. Take three balls. I will do the same. Then we will throw the rest of the powder and balls away. And we will solemnly swear, said De Wade, that we have neither balls nor powder about us. Agreed, and I swear it, said De Guiche, holding his hand towards heaven, a gesture which De Wade imitated. And now, my dear Comte, said De Wade, allow me to tell you that I am in no way your dupe. You already are, or soon will be, the accepted lover of Madame. I have detected your secret, and you are afraid I shall tell others of it. You wish to kill me, to ensure my silence. That is very clear, and in your place I should do the same. De Guiche hung down his head. Only, continued de Wade triumphantly, was it really worth while, tell me, to throw this affair of Bragelonne's on my shoulders? But take care, my dear fellow, in bringing the wild boar to bay you enrage him to madness. In running down the fox, you endow him with the ferocity of the jaguar. The consequence is that, brought to bay by you, I shall defend myself to the very last. You will be quite right to do so. Yes, but take care. I shall work more harm than you think. In the first place, as a beginning, you will readily suppose that I have not been absurd enough to lock up my secret, or your secret, rather, in my own breast. There is a friend of mine who resembles me in every way, a man whom you know very well, who shares my secret with me. So pray understand that if you kill me, my death will not have been of much service to you, whilst on the contrary, if I kill you, and everything is possible, you know. You understand? De Guise shuddered. If I kill you, continued de Wade, you will have secured two mortal enemies to Madame who will do their very utmost to ruin her. Oh, monsieur, exclaimed de Guiche furiously, do not reckon upon my death so easily. Of the two enemies you speak of, I trust most heartily to dispose of one immediately, and the other at the earliest opportunity. The only reply de Wade made was a burst of laughter, so diabolical in its sound, that a superstitious man would have been terrified. But de Guiche was not so impressionable as that, I think, he said, that everything is now settled, Monsieur de Ward. So have the goodness to take your place first, unless you would prefer me to do so. By no means, said de Ward, I shall be delighted to save you the slightest trouble. And spurring his horse to a gallop, he crossed the wide open space, and took his stand at the point of the circumference of the crossroad, immediately opposite to where de Guiche was stationed. De Guiche remained motionless. At this distance of a hundred paces, the two adversaries were absolutely invisible to each other, being completely concealed by the thick shade of elms and chestnuts. A minute elapsed amidst the profoundest silence. At the end of the minute, each of them, in the deep shade in which he was concealed, 
heard the double click of the trigger as they put the pistols on full cock. De Guiche, adopting the usual tactics, put his horse to a gallop, persuaded that he should render his safety doubly sure by the movement, as well as by the speed of the animal. He directed his course in a straight line towards the point where, in his opinion, de Wad would be stationed, and he expected to meet de Wad about halfway, but in this he was mistaken. He continued his course, presuming that his adversary was impatiently awaiting his approach. When, however, he had gone about two-thirds of the distance, he beheld the trees suddenly illuminated, and a ball flew by, cutting the plume of his hat in two. Nearly at the same moment, and as if the flash of the first shot had served to indicate the direction of the other, a second report was heard, and a second ball passed through the head of de Guiche's horse, a little below the ear. The animal fell. These two reports, proceeding from the very opposite direction, in which he expected to find de Watt, surprised him a great deal, but as he was a man of amazing self-possession, he prepared himself for his horse falling but not so completely however that the toe of his boot escaped being caught under the animal as it fell very fortunately the horse in its dying agonies moved so as to enable him to release the leg which was less entangled than the other de guiche rose felt himself all over and found that he was not wounded at the very moment he had felt the horse tottering under him he placed his pistols in the holsters afraid that the force of the fall might explode one at least if not both of them by which he would have been disarmed and left utterly without defence once on his feet he took the pistols out of the holsters and advanced toward the spot where by the light of the flash he had seen de wad appear de wad had at the first shot accounted for the manoeuvre than which nothing could have been simpler instead of advancing to meet de guiche or remaining in his place to await his approach de wad had for about fifteen paces followed the circle of the shadow which hid him from his adversary's observation and at the very moment when the latter presented his flank in his career he had fired from the place where he stood taking careful aim and assisted instead of being inconvenienced by the horse's gallop it has been seen that notwithstanding the darkness the first ball passed hardly more than an inch above de guiche's head de wad had so confidently relied upon his aim that he thought he had seen de guiche fall his astonishment was extreme when he saw he still remained erect in his saddle he hastened to fire his second shot but his hand trembled and he killed the horse instead it would be a most fortunate chance for him if de guiche were to remain held fast under the animal before he could have freed himself de wad would have loaded his pistol and had de guiche at his mercy but de guiche on the contrary was up and had three shots to fire de guiche immediately understood the position of affairs it would be necessary to exceed de wad in rapidity of execution he advanced therefore so as to reach him before he should have had time to reload his pistol de wad saw him approaching like a tempest the ball was rather tight and offered some resistance to the ramrod to load carelessly would be simply to lose his last chance to take the proper care in loading meant fatal loss of time or rather throwing away his life he made his horse bound on one side de guiche turned round also and at the moment the horse was quiet again fired and the ball carried off de wad's hat from his head de wad now knew that he had a moment's time at his own disposal he availed himself of it in order to finish loading his pistol de guiche noticing that his adversary did not fall threw the pistol he had just discharged aside and walked straight toward de wad elevating the second pistol as he did so he had hardly proceeded more than two or three paces when de wad took aim at him as he was walking and fired an exclamation of anger was de guiche's answer the comte's arm contracted and dropped motionless by his side and the pistol fell from his grasp his anxiety was excessive i am lost murmured de wad he is not mortally wounded at the very moment however de guiche was about to raise his pistol against de wad the head shoulders and limbs of the comte seemed to collapse he heaved a deep-drawn sigh tottered and fell at the feet of de wad's horse that is all right said de wad and gathering up the reins he struck his spurs into the horse's sides 
the horse cleared the comte's motionless body and bore duad rapidly back to the chateau when he arrived there he remained a quarter of an hour deliberating within himself as to the proper course to be adopted in his impatience to leave the field of battle he had omitted to ascertain whether de guiche were dead or not a double hypothesis presented itself to de wad's agitated mind either de guiche was killed or de guiche was wounded only if he were killed why should he leave his body in that manner to the tender mercies of the wolves it was a perfectly useless piece of cruelty for if de guiche were dead he certainly could not breathe a syllable of what had passed if he were not killed why should he de wad in leaving him there uncared for allow himself to be regarded as a savage incapable of one generous feeling this last consideration determined his line of conduct de wad immediately instituted inquiries after monicom he was told that monicom had been looking after de guiche and not knowing where to find him had retired to bed de wad went and awoke the sleeper without any delay and related the whole affair to him which monicom listened to in perfect silence but with an expression of momentarily increasing energy of which his face could hardly have been supposed capable it was only when the wad had finished that manicom uttered the words let us go as they proceeded manicom became more and more excited and in proportion as the wad related the details of the affair to him his countenance assumed every moment a darker expression and so he said when the wad had finished you think he is dead alas i do and you fought in that manner without witnesses he insisted upon it it is very singular what do you mean by saying it is singular that it is very unlike m de guiche's disposition you do not doubt my word i suppose hum hum you do doubt it then a little but i shall doubt it more than ever i warn you if i find the poor fellow is really dead m manicombe monsieur de wad it seems you intend to insult me just as you please the fact is i never did like people who come and say i have killed such and such a gentleman in a corner it is a great pity but i killed him in a perfectly honorable manner it has an ugly appearance monsieur de wad silence we have arrived in fact the glade could now be seen and in the open space lay the motionless body of the dead horse to the right of the horse upon the dark grass with his face against the ground the poor comte lay bathed in his blood he had remained in the same spot and did not even seem to have made the slightest movement manicombe threw himself on his knees lifted the comte in his arms and found him quite cold and steeped in blood he let him gently fall again then stretching out his hand and feeling all over the ground close to where the comte lay he sought until he found de guiche's pistol by heaven he said rising to his feet pale as death and with the pistol in his hand you are not mistaken he is quite dead dead repeated de wad yes and his pistol is still loaded added monicom looking into the pan but i told you that i took aim as he was walking towards me and fired at him at the very moment he was going to fire at me are you quite sure that you fought with him monsieur de wad i confess that i am very much afraid it has been a foul assassination nay nay no exclamations you have had your three shots and his pistol is still loaded you have killed his horse and he de guiche one of the best marksmen in france has not touched even either your horse or yourself well monsieur de wade you have been very unlucky in bringing me here all the blood in my body seems to have mounted to my head and i verily believe that since so good an opportunity presents itself i shall blow your brains out on the spot so monsieur de wade recommend yourself to heaven monsieur manicom you cannot think of such a thing on the contrary i am thinking of it very strongly would you assassinate me without the slightest remorse at least for the present are you a gentleman i have given a great many proofs of that let me defend my life then at least very likely in order i suppose that you may do to me what you have done to poor de guiche and manicom slowly raised his pistol to the height of de wad's breast and with arms stretched out and a fixed determined look on his face took a careful aim de wad did not attempt a flight he was completely terrified 
in the midst however of this horrible silence which lasted about a second but which seemed an age to de wad a faint sigh was heard oh exclaimed de wad he still lives help de guiche i am about to be assassinated manicamp fell back a step or two and the two young men saw the comte raise himself slowly and painfully upon one hand manicamp threw the pistol away a dozen paces and ran to his friend uttering a cry of delight de wad wiped his forehead which was covered with a cold perspiration it was just in time he murmured where are you hurt inquired manicamp of de guiche and whereabouts are you wounded de guiche showed him his mutilated hand and his chest covered with blood comte exclaimed de wad i am accused of having assassinated you speak i implore you and say that i fought loyally perfectly so said the wounded man monsieur de wad fought quite loyally and whoever says the contrary will make an enemy of me then sir said manicamp assist me in the first place to carry this gentleman home and i will afterwards give you every satisfaction you please or if you are in a hurry you can do better still let us staunch the blood from the comte's wounds here with your pocket-handkerchief and mine and then as there are two shots left we can have them between us thank you said de wad twice already in one hour i have seen death too close at hand to be agreeable i don't like his look at all and i prefer your apologies manicamp burst out laughing and guiche too in spite of his sufferings the two young men wished to carry him but he declared he felt quite strong enough to walk alone the ball had broken his ring finger and his little finger and then had glanced along his side but without penetrating deeply into his chest it was the pain rather than the seriousness of the wound therefore which had overcome de guiche manicamp passed his arm under one of the count's shoulders and duade did the same with the other and in this way they brought him back to fontainebleau to the house of the same doctor who had been present at the death of the franciscan aramis's predecessor End of chapter thirteen recording by dion gines salt lake city utah chapter fourteen of louisa de la valliere this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter fourteen The King's Supper. The king, while these matters were being arranged, was sitting at the supper table, and the not very large number of guests for that day had taken their seats too, after the usual gesture intimating the royal permission. At this period of Louis the fourteenth's reign, although etiquette was not governed by the strict regulations subsequently adopted, the french court had entirely thrown aside the traditions of good fellowships and patriarchal affability existing in the time of henry the fourth which the suspicious mind of louis the thirteenth had gradually replaced with pompous state and ceremony which he despaired of being able fully to realize the king therefore was seated alone at a small separate table which like the desk of a president overlooked the adjoining tables although we say a small table we must not omit to add that this small table was the largest one there moreover it was the one on which were placed the greatest number and quantity of dishes consisting of fish game meat fruit vegetables and preserves the king was young and full of vigor and energy very fond of hunting addicted to all violent exercises of the body possessing besides like all members of the bourbon family a rapid digestion and an appetite speedily renewed louis the fourteenth was a formidable table companion he delighted in criticizing his cooks but when he honored them by praise and commendation the honor was overwhelming the king began by eating several kinds of soup either mixed together or taken separately he intermixed or rather separated each of the soups by a glass of old wine he ate quickly and somewhat greedily porthos who from the beginning had out of respect been waiting for a jog of d'artagnan's arm seeing the king make such rapid progress turned to the musketeer and said in a low voice it seems as if one might go on now his majesty is very encouraging from the example he sets look 
"'The king eats,' said D'Artagnan, "'but he talks at the same time. "'Try and manage matters in such a manner "'that if he should happen to address a remark to you, "'he will not find you with your mouth full, "'which would be very disrespectful. "'The best way in that case,' said Porthos, "'is to eat no supper at all. "'And yet I am very hungry, I admit, "'and everything looks and smells most invitingly, "'as if appealing to all my senses at once.' don't think of not eating for a moment said d'artagnan that would put his majesty out terribly the king has a saying that he who works well eats well and he does not like people to eat indifferently at his table how can i avoid having my mouth full if i eat said porthos all you have to do replied the captain of the musketeers is simply to swallow what you have in it whenever the king does you the honor to address a remark to you very good said porthos and from that moment he began to eat with a certain well-bred enthusiasm the king occasionally looked at the different persons who were at table with him and an connoisseur could appreciate the different dispositions of his guests monsieur du vallon he said porthos was enjoying a salmi de lievre and swallowed half of the back his name pronounced in such a manner made him start and by a vigorous effort of his gullet he absorbed the whole mouthful sire replied porthos in a stifled voice but sufficiently intelligible nevertheless let those fillets d'agneau be handed to monsieur du vallon said the king do you like brown meats monsieur du vallon sire i like everything replied porthos d'artagnan whispered everything your majesty sends me Porthos repeated, "'Everything your majesty sends me,' an observation which the king apparently received with great satisfaction. "'People eat well who work well,' replied the king, delighted to have in tete-a-tete -tete a guest who could eat as Porthos did. Porthos received the dish of lamb and put a portion of it on his plate. "'Well,' said the king. "'Exquisite,' said Porthos calmly. "'Have you as good mutton in your part of the country, Monsieur du Vallon? continued the king sire i believe that from my own province as everywhere else the best of everything is sent to paris for your majesty's use but on the other hand i do not eat lamb in the same way your majesty does ah ah and how do you eat it generally i have a lamb dressed whole whole yes sire in what manner monsieur du vallon in this sire my cook who is a german first stuffs the lamb in question with small sausages he procures from strasbourg force-meat balls from troyes and larks from pithiviers by some means or other which i am not acquainted with he bones the lamb as he would do a fowl leaving the skin on however which forms a brown crust all over the animal when it is cut in beautiful slices in the same way as an enormous sausage a rose-coloured gravy pours forth which is as agreeable to the eye as it is exquisite to the palate, and Porthos finished by smacking his lips. The king opened his eyes with delight, and while cutting some of the Fessane au which was handed to him, he said, That is a dish I should very much like to taste, Monsieur du Vallon. Is it possible? A whole lamb? Absolutely an entire lamb, sire. Pass those pheasants to Monsieur du Vallon. I perceive he is an amateur the order was immediately obeyed then continuing the conversation he said and you do not find the lamb too fat no sire the fat falls down at the same time as the gravy does and swims on the surface then the servant who carves removes the fat with a spoon which i have had expressly made for that purpose where do you reside inquired the king at pierrefonds sire at pierrefonds where is that monsieur du vallon near belle isle oh no sire pierrefonds is in the sosone i thought you alluded to the lamb on account of the salt marshes no sire i have marshes which are not salt it is true but which are not the less valuable on that account the king had now arrived at the entremont but without losing sight of porthos who continued to play his part in the best manner you have an excellent appetite monsieur du vallon said the king and you make an admirable guest at table ah sire if your majesty were ever to pay a visit to pierrefonds we would both of us eat our lamb together 
for your appetite is not an indifferent one by any means. D'Artagnan gave Porthos a kick under the table, which made Porthos color up. At your majesty's present happy age, said Porthos, in order to repair the mistake he had made, I was in the musketeers, and nothing could ever satisfy me then. Your majesty has an excellent appetite, as I have already had the honor of mentioning, but you select what you eat with quite too much refinement to be called for one moment a great eater. The king seemed charmed at his guest's politeness. Will you try some of these creams, he said to Porthos? Sire, your majesty treats me with far too much kindness to prevent me speaking the whole truth pray do so monsieur du vallon well sire with regard to sweet dishes i only recognize pastry and even that should be rather solid all these frothy substances swell the stomach and occupy a space which seems to me to be too precious to be so badly tenanted ah gentlemen said the king indicating porthos by a gesture here is indeed a model of gastronomy it was in such a manner that our fathers who so well knew what good living was used to eat while we added his majesty do nothing but tantalize with our stomachs and as he spoke he took the breast of a chicken with ham while porthos attacked a dish of partridges and quails the cupbearer filled his majesty's glass give monsieur du vallon some of my wine said the king this was one of the greatest honors of the royal table d'artagnan pressed his friend's knee if you could only manage to swallow the half of that boar's head i see yonder said he to porthos i shall believe you to be a duke and peer within the next twelve months presently said porthos phlegmatically i shall come to that by and by in fact it was not long before it came to the boar's turn for the king seemed to take pleasure in urging on his guest he did not pass any of the dishes to porthos until he had tasted them himself and he accordingly took some of the boar's head porthos showed that he could keep pace with his sovereign and instead of eating the half as d'artagnan had told him he ate three-fourths of it it is impossible said the king in an undertone that a gentleman who eats so good a supper every day and who has such beautiful teeth can be otherwise than the most straightforward upright man in my kingdom do you hear said d'artagnan in his friend's ear yes i think i am rather in favor said porthos balancing himself on his chair oh you are in luck's way the king and porthos continued to eat in the same manner to the great satisfaction of the other guests some of whom from emulation had attempted to follow them but were obliged to give up halfway the king soon began to get flushed and the reaction of the blood to his face announced that the moment of repletion had arrived it was then that louis the fourteenth instead of becoming gay and cheerful as most good livers generally do became dull melancholy and taciturn porthos on the contrary was lively and communicative d'artagnan's foot had more than once to remind him of this peculiarity of the king the dessert now made its appearance the king had ceased to think anything further of porthos he turned his eyes anxiously towards the entrance door and he was heard occasionally to inquire how it happened that m de saint Agno was so long in arriving at last at the moment when his majesty was finishing a pot of preserved plums with a deep sigh saint Agno appeared the king's eyes which had become somewhat dull immediately began to sparkle the comte advanced towards the king's table and louis rose at his approach every one got up at the same time including porthos who was just finishing an almond cake capable of making the jaws of a crocodile stick together the supper was over end of chapter fourteen recording by dion gines salt lake city utah chapter fifteen of louise de la valliere this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas Chapter 15. After Supper The king took Saint-Agnon by the arm and passed into the adjoining apartment. "'What has detained you, comte?' said the king. "'I was bringing the answer, sire,' replied the comte. "'She has taken a long time to reply to what I wrote her.' 
Sire, your majesty deigned to write in verse, and Mademoiselle de la Valliere wished to repay your majesty in the same coin, that is to say, in gold. Verses, saint Agnon, exclaimed the king in ecstasy, give them to me at once. And Louis broke the seal of a little letter, enclosing the verses which history had preserved entire for us, and which are more meritorious in invention than in execution. Such as they were, however, the king was enchanted with them, and exhibited his satisfaction by unequivocal transports of delight. But the universal silence which reigned in the rooms warned Louis, so sensitively particular with regard to good breeding, that his delight must give rise to various interpretations. He turned aside and put the note in his pocket, and then advancing a few steps, which brought him again to the threshold of the door close to his guests, he said, Monsieur du Vallon, I have seen you today with the greatest pleasure, and my pleasure will be equally great to see you again. Porthos bowed, as the Colossus of Rhodes would have done, and retired from the room with his face towards the king. Monsieur d'Artagnan, continued the king, you will await my orders in the gallery. I am obliged to you for having made me acquainted with Monsieur du Vallon. Gentlemen, addressing himself to the other guests, I return to Paris tomorrow on account of the departure of the Spanish and Dutch ambassadors. Until tomorrow, then. The apartment was immediately cleared of the guests. The king took Saint-Agnon by the arm, made him read La Valliere's verses over again, and said, What do you think of them? Charming, sire. They charm me, in fact, as if they were known. Oh, the professional poets would be jealous of them. But it was not likely they will know anything about them. Did you give her mine? Oh, sire, she positively devoured them. They were very weak, I am afraid. That is not what Mademoiselle de la Valliere said of them. Do you think she was pleased with them? I am sure of it, sire. I must answer then. Oh, sire, immediately after supper? Your majesty will fatigue yourself. You are quite right. Study after eating is notoriously injurious. The labour of a poet especially so, and besides, there is great excitement prevailing at Mademoiselle de la Valliere's. What do you mean? With her, as with all the ladies of the court. Why? On account of poor de Guiche's accident. Has anything serious happened to de Guiche, then? Yes, sire, he has one hand nearly destroyed, a hole in his breast. In fact, he is dying. Good heavens, who told you that? Manicon brought him back just now to the house of a doctor, here in Fontainebleau, and the rumour soon reached us all. Brought back? Poor de Guiche, how did it happen? Ah, that is the very question, how did it happen? You say that in a very singular manner, saint -Aignan. Give me the details. What does he say himself? He says nothing, sire, but others do. What others? Those who brought him back, sire. Who are they? I do not know, sire, but Monsieur de Manicon knows. Monsieur de Manicon is one of his friends. As everybody is, indeed, said the king. Oh, no, returned saint -Aignan. You are mistaken, sire. Everyone is not precisely a friend of Monsieur de Guiche. How do you know that? Does your majesty require me to explain myself? Certainly I do. Well, sire, I believe I have heard something said about a quarrel between two gentlemen. When? This very evening, before your majesty's supper was served. That can hardly be. I have issued such stringent and severe ordinances with respect to duelling, that no one, I presume, would dare to disobey them. In that case, heaven preserve me from excusing any one, exclaimed saint -Aignan. Your majesty commanded me to speak, and I spoke accordingly. Tell me, then, in what way the Comte de Guiche has been wounded. Sire, it is said to have been at a boar hunt. This evening? Yes, sire. One of his hands shattered and a hole in his breast. Who was at the hunt with Monsieur de Guiche? I do not know, sire. But Monsieur de Manicon knows, or ought to know. You are concealing something from me, saint -Aignan. Nothing, sire, I assure you. Then explain to me how the accident happened. Was it a musket that burst? Very likely, sire. But yet, on reflection, it could hardly have been that, for de Guiche's pistol was found close by him, still loaded. His pistol? But a man does not go to a boar hunt with a pistol, I should think. Sire, it is also said that de Guiche's horse was killed, and that the horse is still to be found in the wide open glade in the forest. His horse? Guiche, go on horseback to a boar hunt? Saint-Aignan, I do not understand a syllable of what you have been telling me. 
Where did this affair happen? At the Rond Point, in that part of the forest called the Bois Rochard. That will do. Call Monsieur d'Artagnan. Saint-Aignan obeyed, and the musketeer entered. Monsieur d'Artagnan, said the king, you will leave this place by the little door of the private staircase. Yes, sire. You will mount your horse. Yes, sire. You will proceed to the Rond Point du Bois Rochard. Do you know the spot? Yes, sire. I have fought there twice. What? exclaimed the king, amazed at the reply. Under the edict, sire, of Cardinal Richelieu, returned D'Artagnan, with his usual impassibility. That is very different, monsieur. You will, therefore, go there, and will examine the locality very carefully. A man has been wounded there, and you will find a horse lying dead. You will tell me what your opinion is upon the whole affair. Very good, sire. As a matter of course, it is your own opinion I require, and not that of any one else. You shall have it in an hour's time, sire. I prohibit your speaking with any one, whoever it may be, except with the person who must give me a lantern, said D'Artagnan. Ah, that is a matter of course, said the king, laughing at the liberty, which he tolerated in no one but his captain of the musketeers. D'Artagnan left by the little staircase. Now, let my physician be sent for, said Louis. Ten minutes afterwards the king's physician arrived, quite out of breath. "'You will go, monsieur,' said the king to him, "'and accompany monsieur de Saint-Aignan, wherever he may take you. "'You will render me an account of the state of the person you may see "'in the house you will be taken to.' "'The physician obeyed without a remark, "'as at that time people began to obey Louis the Fourteenth, "'and left the room preceding Saint-Aignan. "'Do you, Saint-Aignan, send Manicon to me?' before the physician can possibly have spoken to him, and Saint-Aignan left in his turn. End of chapter 15Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 16 Showing in what way D'Artagnan discharged the mission with which the king had entrusted him. While the king was engaged in making these last-mentioned arrangements in order to ascertain the truth, D'Artagnan, without losing a second, ran to the stable, took down the lantern, saddled his horse himself, and proceeded towards the place his majesty had indicated. According to the promise he had made, he had not accosted any one, and, as we have observed, he had carried his scruples so far as to do without the assistance of the stable helpers altogether. D'Artagnan was one of those who in moments of difficulty pride themselves on increasing their own value. By dint of hard galloping, he in less than five minutes reached the wood, fastened his horse to the first tree he came to, and penetrated to the broad open space on foot. He then began to inspect most carefully, on foot and with his lantern in his hand, the whole surface of the rond-point, went forward, turned back again, measured, examined, and after half an hour's minute inspection, he returned silently to where he had left his horse, and pursued his way in deep reflection and at a foot-pace to Fontainebleau. Louis was waiting in his cabinet. He was alone and with a pencil was scribbling on paper certain lines which D'Artagnan, at the first glance, recognized as unequal and very much touched up. The conclusion he arrived at was that they must be verses. The king raised his head and perceived D'Artagnan. "'Well, monsieur,' he said, "'do you bring me any news?' "'Yes, sire.' "'What have you seen?' "'As far as probability goes, sire,' D'Artagnan began to reply. "'It was certainty I requested of you.' I will approach it as near as I possibly can. The weather was very well adapted for investigations of the character I have just made. It has been raining this evening, and the roads were wet and muddy. Well, the result, Monsieur d'Artagnan. Sire, your majesty told me that there was a horse lying dead in the crossroad of the Bois Rochin, and I began, therefore, by studying the roads. I say the roads because the centre of the crossroad is reached by four separate roads. The one that I myself took was the only one that presented any fresh traces. 
Two horses had followed it side by side. Their eight feet were marked very distinctly in the clay. One of the riders was more impatient than the other, for the footprints of the one were invariably in advance of the other, about half a horse's length. Are you quite sure they were travelling together? said the king. Yes, sire. The horses are two rather large animals of equal pace, horses well used to manoeuvres of all kinds, for they wheeled round the barrier of the rond-point together. Well, and after? The two cavaliers paused there for a minute, no doubt to arrange the conditions of the engagement. The horses grew restless and impatient. One of the riders spoke, while the other listened and seemed to have contented himself by simply answering. His horse pawed the ground, which proves that his attention was so taken up by listening that he let the bridle fall from his hand. A hostile meeting did take place then? Undoubtedly. Continue, you are a very accurate observer. One of the two cavaliers remained where he was standing, the one, in fact, who had been listening. The other crossed the open space, and at first placed himself directly opposite to his adversary. The one who had remained stationary traversed the rond-point at a gallop, about two-thirds of its length, thinking that by this means he would gain upon his opponent, but the latter had followed the circumference of the wood. You are ignorant of their names, I suppose. Completely so, sire. Only he who followed the circumference of the wood was mounted on a black horse. How do you know that? I found a few hairs of his tail among the brambles which bordered the side of the ditch. Go on. As for the other horse, there can be no trouble in describing him, since he was left dead on the field of battle. And what was the cause of his death? A ball which passed through his brain. Was the ball that of a pistol or a gun? It was a pistol bullet, sire. Besides, the manner in which the horse was wounded explained to me the tactics of the man who had killed it. He had followed the circumference of the wood in order to take his adversary in flank. Moreover, I followed his foot-tracks on the grass. The tracks of the black horse, do you mean? Yes, sire. Go on, Monsieur d'Artagnan. As your majesty now perceives the position of the two adversaries, I will, for a moment, leave the cavalier who had remained stationary for the one who started off at a gallop. Do so. The horse of the cavalier who rode at full speed was killed on the spot. How do you know that? The cavalier had not time even to throw himself off his horse, and so fell with it. I observed the impression of his leg, which, with a great effort, he was enabled to extricate from under the horse. The spur, pressed down by the weight of the animal, had ploughed up the ground. Very good. And what did he do as soon as he rose up again? He walked straight up to his adversary, who still remained upon the verge of the forest. Yes, sire. Then, having reached a favourable distance, he stopped firmly, for the impression of both his heels are left in the ground quite close to each other, fired, and missed the adversary. How do you know he did not hit him? I found a hat with a ball through it. Ah, a proof, then, exclaimed the king. Insufficient, sire, replied D'Artagnan coldly. It is a hat without any letters indicating its ownership, without arms, a red feather, as all hats have, the lace even has nothing particular in it. Did the man with the hat through which the bullet had passed fire a second time? Oh, sire, he had already fired twice. How did you ascertain that? I found the waddings of the pistol. And what became of the bullet which did not kill the horse? It cut in two the feather of the hat belonging to him against whom it was directed, and broke a small birch at the other end of the open glade. In that case, then, the man on the black horse was disarmed, whilst his adversary had still one more shot to fire. Sire, while the dismounted rider was extricating himself from his horse, the other was reloading his pistol. Only he was much agitated while he was doing it, and his hand trembled greatly. How do you know that? Half the charge fell to the ground, and he threw the ramrod aside, not having time to replace it in the pistol. Monsieur d'Artagnan, this is marvellous, you tell me. It is only close observation, sire, and the commonest highwayman could tell as much. The whole scene is before me from the manner in which you relate it. I have, in fact, reconstructed it in my own mind, with merely a few alterations. And now, said the king, let us return to the dismounted cavalier. 
You were saying that he walked toward his adversary while the latter was loading his pistol. Yes, but at the very moment he himself was taking aim, the other fired. Oh, said the king, and the shot? The shot told terribly, sire. The dismounted cavalier fell upon his face, after having staggered forward three or four paces. Where was he hit? In two places. In the first place, in his right hand, and then, by the same bullet, in his chest. But how could you ascertain that? inquired the king, full of admiration. By a very simple means. The butt-end of the pistol was covered with blood, and the trace of the bullet could be observed with fragments of a broken ring. The wounded man, in all probability, had the ring finger and the little finger carried off. As far as the hand goes, I have nothing to say. But the chest? Sire, there were two small pools of blood at a distance of about two feet and a half from each other. At one of these pools of blood, the grass was torn up by the clenched hand. At the other, the grass was simply pressed down by the weight of the body. Poor de Guiche, exclaimed the king. Ah, it was Monsieur de Guiche, then, said the musketeer quietly. I suspected it, but did not venture to mention it to your majesty. And what made you suspect it? I recognized the de Grammont arms upon the holsters of the dead horse. And you think he is seriously wounded? Very seriously, since he fell immediately and remained a long time in the same place. However, he was able to walk, as he left the spot supported by two friends. You met him returning then? No, but I observed the footprints of three men. The one on the right and the one on the left walked freely and easily, but the one in the middle dragged his feet as he walked. Besides, he left traces of blood at every step he took. Now, monsieur, since you saw the combat so distinctly that not a single detail seems to have escaped you, tell me something about de Guiche's adversary. Oh, sire, I do not know him. And yet you see everything very clearly. Yes, sire, I see everything, but I do not tell all I see. And since the poor devil has escaped, your majesty will permit me to say that I do not intend to denounce him. And yet he is guilty since he has fought a duel, monsieur. Not guilty in my eyes, sire, said D'Artagnan coldly. Monsieur, exclaimed the king, are you aware of what you are saying? Perfectly, sire. But according to my notions, a man who fights a duel is a brave man. Such, at least, is my own opinion. But your majesty may have another. It is but natural, for you are master here. Monsieur d'Artagnan, I ordered you, however, d'Artagnan interrupted the king by a respectful gesture. You ordered me, sire, to gather what particulars I could, respecting a hostile meeting that had taken place. Those particulars you have. If you order me to arrest Monsieur de Guiche's adversary, I will do so, but do not order me to denounce him to you, for in that case I will not obey. Very well, arrest him then. Give me his name, sire. The king stamped his foot angrily, but after a moment's reflection he said, You are right, ten times, twenty times, a hundred times right. That is my opinion, sire, and I am happy that, this time, it accords with your majesty's. One more word. Who assisted Guiche? I do not know, sire. But you speak of two men. There was a person present, then a second. There was no second, sire. Nay, more than that, when Monsieur de Guiche fell, his adversary fled without giving him any assistance. The miserable coward, exclaimed the king. The consequence of your ordinances, sire. If a man has fought well and fairly, and has already escaped one chance of death, he naturally wishes to escape the second. Monsieur de Bouteville cannot be forgotten very easily. And so men turn to cowards. No, they become prudent. And he has fled then, you say? Yes, and as far as his horse could possibly carry him. In what direction? In the direction of the chateau. Well, and after that? Afterwards, as I have had the honour of telling your majesty, two men on foot arrived who carried Monsieur de Guiche back with them. What proof have you that these men arrived after the combat? A very evident proof, sire. At the moment the encounter took place, the rain had just ceased. The ground had not had time to imbibe the moisture, and was consequently soaked. The footsteps sank in the ground. But while Monsieur de Guiche was lying there in a fainting condition, the ground became firm again, and the footsteps made a less sensible impression. Louis clapped his hands together in sign of admiration. 
"Monsieur d'Artagnan," he said, "you are positively the cleverest man in my kingdom." "The identical thing Monsieur de Richelieu thought, and Monsieur de Mazarin said, sire." "And now it remains for us to see if your sagacity is at fault." "Oh, sire, a man may be mistaken, _humanum est errare_," said the musketeer, philosophically. "In that case you are not human, Monsieur d'Artagnan, for I believe you are never mistaken." "Your majesty said that we were going to see whether such was the case or not." "Yes." "In what way, may I venture to ask?" "I have sent for M. de Manicamp, and M. de Manicamp is coming." "And M. de Manicamp knows the secret?" "De Guiche has no secrets from M. de Manicamp." D'Artagnan shook his head. "No one was present at the combat, I repeat, and unless M. de Manicamp was one of the two men who brought him back." "Hush!" said the king, "he is coming. Remain, and listen attentively." "Very good, sire." And at that very same moment, Manicamp and Saint-Aignan appeared at the threshold of the door. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 17 The Encounter. The king signified with an imperious gesture, first to the musketeer, then to Saint Agno. On your lives, not a word. D'Artagnan withdrew, like a sentinel, to a corner of the room. saint Agno, in his character of a favorite, leaned over the back of the king's chair. Manicom, with his right foot properly advanced, a smile upon his lips, and his white and well-formed hands gracefully disposed, advanced to make his reverence to the king, who returned the salutation by a bow. "'Good evening, Monsieur de Manicom,' he said. "'Your Majesty did me the honor to send for me,' said Manicom. "'Yes, in order to learn from you all the details "'of the unfortunate accident which has befallen the Comte de Guiche. "'Oh, sire, it is grievous indeed. "'You were there?' "'Not precisely, sire. "'But you arrived on the scene of the accident a few minutes after it took place?' sire about half an hour afterwards and where did the accident happen i believe sire the place is called the rond ponte du borochina oh the rendezvous of the hunt the very spot sire good give me all the details you are acquainted with respecting this unhappy affair monsieur de manicom perhaps your majesty has already been informed of them and i fear to fatigue you with useless repetition no do not be afraid of that manicom looked round him he saw only d'artagnan leaning with his back against the wainscot d'artagnan calm kind and good-natured as usual and saint agno whom he had accompanied and who still leaned over the king's armchair with an expression of countenance equally full of good feeling he determined therefore to speak out your majesty is perfectly aware he said that accidents are very frequent in hunting in hunting do you say i mean sire when an animal is brought to bay ah ah said the king it was when the animal was brought to bay then that the accident happened alas sire unhappily it was the king paused for a moment before he said what animal was being hunted a wild boar sire and what could possibly have possessed Guiche to go to a wild boar hunt by himself? That is but a clownish idea of sport, only fit for that class of people who, unlike the Maréchal de Grammont, have no dogs and huntsmen to hunt as gentlemen should do. Manicom shrugged his shoulders. Youth is very rash, he said sententiously. Well, go on, said the king. At all events, continued Manicom, not venturing to be too precipitate and hasty, and letting his words fall very slowly one by one, at all events, sire, poor de Guiche went hunting, all alone. Quite alone, indeed. What a sportsman! And is not Monsieur de Guiche aware that the wild boar always stands at bay? That is the very thing that really happens, sire. 
he had some idea then of the beast being there yes sire some peasants had seen it among their potatoes footnote potatoes were not grown in france at that time la cicla insists that the error is theirs and that dumas meant tomatoes End of footnote. and what kind of animal was it a short thick beast you may as well tell me monsieur that de guiche had some idea of committing suicide for i have seen him hunt and he is an active and vigorous hunter whenever he fires at an animal brought to bay and held in check by the dogs he takes every possible precaution and yet he fires with a carbine and on this occasion he seems to have faced the boar with pistols only manicamp started a costly pair of pistols excellent weapons to fight a duel with a man and not a wild boar what an absurdity there are some things sire which are difficult of explanation you are quite right and the event which we are now discussing is certainly one of them go on during the recital saint aignan who probably would have made a sign to manicamp to be careful what he was about found that the king's glance was constantly fixed upon himself so that it was utterly impossible to communicate with manicamp in any way as for d'artagnan the statue of silence at athens was far more noisy and far more expressive than he manicamp therefore was obliged to continue in the same way he had begun and so contrived to get more and more entangled in his explanation sire he said this is probably how the affair happened guiche was waiting to receive the boar as it rushed towards him on foot or on horseback inquired the king on horseback he fired upon the brute and missed his aim and then it dashed upon him and the horse was killed ah your majesty knows that then i have been told that a horse has been found lying dead in the crossroads of the barochine and i presume it was de guiche's horse perfectly true sire it was his well so much for the horse and now for de guiche de guiche once down was attacked and worried by the wild boar and wounded in the hand and in the chest it is a horrible accident but it must be admitted it was de guiche's own fault how could he possibly have gone to hunt such an animal merely armed with pistols he must have forgotten the fable of adonis manicamp rubbed his ear in seeming perplexity very true he said it was very imprudent can you explain it monsieur manicamp sire what is written is written ah you are a fatalist manicamp looked very uncomfortable and ill at ease i am angry with you monsieur manicamp continued the king with me sire yes how was it that you who are de guiche's intimate friend and who knew that he is subject to such acts of folly did not stop him in time manicamp no longer knew what to do the tone in which the king spoke was anything but that of a credulous man on the other hand it did not indicate any particular severity nor did he seem to care very much about the cross-examination there was more of raillery in it than menace and you say then continued the king that it was positively de guiche's horse that was found dead quite positive sire did that astonish you no sire for your majesty will remember that at the last hunt m de saint mar had a horse killed under him and in the same way yes but that one was ripped open of course sire had de guiche's horse been ripped open like m de saint mar's horse i should not have been astonished manicamp opened his eyes very wide am i mistaken resumed the king was it not in the frontal bone that de guiche's horse was struck you must admit monsieur de manicamp that is a very singular place for a wild boar to attack you are aware sire that the horse is a very intelligent animal and he doubtless endeavored to defend himself but a horse defends himself with his heels and not with his head in that case the terrified horse may have slipped or fallen down said manicamp and the boar you understand sire the boar oh i understand that perfectly as far as the horse is concerned but how about his rider well that too is simple enough the boar left the horse and attacked the rider and as i have already had the honor of informing your majesty 
shattered de guiche's hand at the very moment he was about to discharge his second pistol at him and then with a gouge of his tusk made that terrible hole in his chest nothing is more likely really monsieur de manicamp you are wrong in placing so little confidence in your own eloquence and you can tell a story most admirably your majesty is exceedingly kind said manicamp saluting him in the most embarrassed manner from this day henceforth i will prohibit any gentleman attached to my court going out to similar encounter really one might just as well permit duelling manicamp started and moved as if he were about to withdraw is your majesty satisfied delighted but do not withdraw yet monsieur de manicamp said louis i have something to say to you well well thought d'artagnan there is another who is not up to the mark and he uttered a sigh which might signify oh the men of our stamp where are they now at this moment an usher lifted up the curtain before the door and announced the king's physician ah exclaimed louis here comes monsieur valot who has just been to see monsieur de guiche we shall now hear news of the man maltreated by the boar manicamp felt more uncomfortable than ever in this way at least added the king our conscience will be quite clear and he looked at d'artagnan who did not seem in the slightest degree discomposed End of chapter seventeen recording by dion gines salt lake city utah chapter eighteen of louisa de la valliera this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines louisa de la valliera by alexandra dumas chapter eighteen the physician monsieur valu entered the position of the different persons present was precisely the same the king was seated saint Agno leaning over the back of his armchair d'artagnan with his back against the wall and manicamp still standing well monsieur valu said the king did you obey my directions with the greatest alacrity sire you went to the doctor's house in fontainebleau yes sire and you found monsieur de guiche there i did sire what state was he in speak unreservedly in a very sad state indeed sire the wild boar did not quite devour him however devour whom de guiche what wild boar the boar that wounded him monsieur de guiche wounded by a boar so it is said at least by a poacher rather or by a jealous husband or an ill-used lover who in order to be revenged fired upon him what is it that you say monsieur valu were not monsieur de guiche's wounds produced by defending himself against a wild boar monsieur de guiche's wounds are the result of a pistol bullet that broke his ring finger and the little finger of the right hand and afterwards buried itself in the intercostal muscles of the chest a bullet are you sure monsieur de guiche was wounded by a bullet exclaimed the king pretending to look much surprised indeed i am sire so sure in fact that here it is and he presented to the king a half-flattened bullet which the king looked at but did not touch did he have that in his chest poor fellow he asked not precisely the ball did not penetrate but was flattened as you see either upon the trigger of the pistol or upon the right side of the breastbone good heavens said the king seriously you said nothing to me about this monsieur de manicamp sire what does all this mean then this invention about hunting a wild boar at nightfall come speak monsieur sire it seems then that you are right said the king turning round towards his captain of musketeers and that a duel actually took place the king possessed to a greater extent than any one else the faculty enjoyed by the great in power or position of compromising and dividing those beneath him manicamp darted a look full of reproaches at the musketeer d'artagnan understood the look at once 
and not wishing to remain beneath the weight of such an accusation, advanced a step forward and said, Sire, your majesty commanded me to go and explore the place where the crossroads meet in the Borochine, and to report to you, according to my own ideas, what had taken place there. I submitted my observations to you, but without denouncing any one. It was your majesty yourself who was the first to name the Comte de Guiche. Well, monsieur, well, said the king haughtily, you have done your duty, and I am satisfied with you. But you, monsieur de Manicamp, have failed in yours, for you have told me a falsehood. A falsehood, sire, the expression is a hard one. Find a more accurate, then. Sire, I will not attempt to do so. I have already been unfortunate enough to displease your majesty, and it will, in every respect, be far better for me to accept most humbly any reproaches you may think proper to address to me. You are right, monsieur. Whoever conceals the truth from me risks my displeasure. Sometimes, sire, one is ignorant of the truth. No further falsehood, monsieur, or I double the punishment. Manicom bowed and turned pale. D'Artagnan again made another step forward, determined to interfere, if the still increasing anger of the king attained certain limits. You see, monsieur, continued the king, that it is useless to deny the thing any longer. Monsieur de Guiche has fought a duel. I do not deny it, sire, and it would have been truly generous on your majesty's part not to have forced me to tell a falsehood. Forced? Who forced you? Sire, Monsieur de Guiche is my friend. Your majesty has forbidden duels under pain of death. A falsehood might save my friend's life, and I told it. Good, murmured D'Artagnan. An excellent fellow, upon my word. Instead of telling a falsehood, monsieur, you should have prevented him from fighting, said the king. Oh, sire, your majesty, who is the most accomplished gentleman in France, knows quite as well as any of us other gentlemen that we have never considered monsieur de bouville dishonored for having suffered death on the place de grave that which does in truth dishonor a man is to avoid meeting his enemy not to avoid meeting his executioner well monsieur that may be so said louis the fourteenth i am desirous of suggesting a means of your repairing all if it be a means of which a gentleman may avail himself, I shall most eagerly seize the opportunity. The name of Monsieur de Guiche's adversary? Oh, oh, murmured D'Artagnan. Are we going to take Louis the Thirteenth as a model? Sire, said Manicom, with an accent of reproach. You will not name him, then, said the king. Sire, I do not know him. Bravo, murmured D'Artagnan. Monsieur de Manicom, hand your sword to the captain. Manicom bowed very gracefully, unbuckled his sword, smiling as he did so, and handed it for the musketeer to take. But saint Agno advanced hurriedly between him and D'Artagnan. Sire, he said, will your majesty permit me to say a word? Do so, said the king, delighted, perhaps, at the bottom of his heart, for someone to step between him and the wrath he felt that had carried him too far. Manicom, you are a brave man, and the king will appreciate your conduct. But to wish to serve your friends too well is to destroy them. Manicom, you know the name the king asks you for? It is perfectly true. I do know it. You will give it up, then? If I felt I ought to have mentioned it, I should have already done so. Then I will tell it, for I am not so extremely sensitive on such points of honor as you are you are at liberty to do so but it seems to me however oh a truce to magnanimity i will not permit you to go to the bastille in that way do you speak or i will manicom was keen-witted enough and perfectly understood that he had done quite sufficient to produce a good opinion of his conduct it was now only a question of persevering in such a manner as to regain the good graces of the king speak monsieur he said to saint Agno. I have on my own behalf done all that my conscience told me to do, and it must have been very importunate, he added, turning towards the king, 
since its mandates led me to disobey your majesty's commands but your majesty will forgive me i hope when you learn that i was anxious to preserve the honor of a lady of a lady said the king with some uneasiness yes sire a lady was the cause of this duel manicamp bowed if the position of the lady in question warrants it he said i shall not complain of your having acted with so much circumspection on the contrary indeed sire everything which concerns your majesty's household or the household of your majesty's brother is of importance in my eyes in my brother's household repeated louis the fourteenth with a slight hesitation the cause of the duel was a lady belonging to my brother's household do you say or to madame's ah to madame's yes sire well and this lady is one of the maids of honor of her royal highness madame la duchesse d'orleans for whom monsieur de guiche fought do you say yes sire and this time i tell no falsehood louis seemed restless and anxious gentlemen he said turning towards the spectators of the scene will you have the goodness to retire for a moment i wish to be alone with monsieur manicamp i know he has some important communication to make for his own justification and which he will not venture before witnesses put up your sword monsieur de manicamp manicamp returned his sword to his belt the fellow decidedly has his wits about him murmured the musketeer taking saint agnaud by the arm and withdrawing with him he will get out of it said the latter in d'artagnan's ear and with honor too comte manicamp cast a glance of recognition at saint agnaud and the captain which luckily passed unnoticed by the king come come said d'artagnan as he left the room i had an indifferent opinion of the new generation well i was mistaken after all there is some good in them i perceive Ballou preceded the favorite and the captain leaving the king and manicamp alone in the cabinet End of chapter 18 recording by dion gines salt lake city utah chapter 19 of louisa de la valliera this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines louisa de la valliera by alexander dumas chapter 19 wherein d'artagnan perceives that it was he who was mistaken and manicamp who was right the king determined to be satisfied that no one was listening went himself to the door and then returned precipitately and placed himself opposite manicamp and now we are alone monsieur de manicamp explain yourself with the greatest frankness sire replied the young man and in the first place pray understand added the king that there is nothing to which i personally attach a greater importance than the honor of any lady that is the very reason sire why i endeavor to study your delicacy of sentiment and feeling yes i understand it all now you say that it was one of the maids of honor of my sister-in-law who was the subject of dispute and that the person in question de guiche's adversary the man in point of fact whom you will not name but whom monsieur de saint agnaud will name monsieur yes you say however that this man insulted some one belonging to the household of madame yes sire mademoiselle de la valliere ah said the king as if he had expected the name and yet as if its announcement had caused him a sudden pang ah it was mademoiselle de la valliere who was insulted i did not say precisely that she was insulted sire but at all events i merely say that she was spoken of in terms far from respectful a man dares to speak in disrespectful terms of mademoiselle de la valliere and yet you refuse to tell me the name of the insulter sire i thought it was quite understood that your majesty had abandoned the idea of making me denounce him perfectly true monsieur returned the king controlling his anger besides i shall know in good time the name of this man whom i shall feel it is my duty to punish manicamp perceived that they had returned to the question again as for the king he saw he had allowed himself to be hurried away a little too far and therefore continued and i will punish him 
not because there is any question of Mademoiselle de la Valliere, although I esteem her very highly, but because a lady was the object of the quarrel, and I intend that lady shall be respected at my court, and that quarrel shall be put a stop to altogether. Manicom bowed. And now, Monsieur de Manicom, continued the king, what was said about Mademoiselle de la Valliere? Cannot your majesty guess? I? Your majesty can imagine the character of the jest in which young men permit themselves to indulge. They very probably said that she was in love with someone, the king ventured to remark. Probably so. But Mademoiselle de la Valliere has a perfect right to love anyone she pleases, said the king. That is the very point de Guiche maintained. And on account of which he fought, do you mean? Yes, sire, the sole and only cause. The king colored, and you do not know anything more, then? In what respect, sire? In the very interesting respect which you are now referring to. What does your majesty wish to know? Why, the name of the man with whom La Valliere is in love, and whom de Guiche's adversary disputed her right to love sire i know nothing i have heard nothing and have learnt nothing even accidentally but de guiche is a noble-hearted fellow and if momentarily he substituted himself in the place or stead of la valliere's protector it was because that protector was himself of too exalted a position to undertake her defence these words were more than transparent they made the king blush but this time with pleasure he struck Manicom gently on the shoulder. Well, well, Monsieur de Manicom, you are not only a ready, witty fellow, but a brave gentleman besides, and your friend de Guiche is a paladin quite after my own heart. You will express that to him from me. Your majesty forgives me, then? Completely. And I am free? The king smiled and held out his hand to Manicom, which he took and kissed respectfully. And then added the king, you relate stories so charmingly i sire you told me in the most admirable manner the particulars of the accident which happened to de guiche i can see the wild boar rushing out of the wood i can see the horse fall down fighting with his head and the boar rush from the horse to the rider you do not simply relate a story well you positively paint its incidents sire i think your majesty condescends to laugh at my expense said Manicom. On the contrary, said Louis seriously, I have so little intention of laughing, Monsieur de Manicom, that I wish you to relate this adventure to everyone. The adventure of the hunt? Yes, in the manner you told it to me, without changing a single word. You understand? Perfectly, sire. And you will relate it, then? Without losing a minute. Very well, and now summon Monsieur d'Artagnan i hope you are no longer afraid of him oh sire from the very moment i am sure of your majesty's kind disposition i no longer fear anything call him then said the king manicom opened the door and said gentlemen the king wishes you to return d'artagnan saint Agno, and valou entered gentlemen said the king i summon you for the purposes of saying that monsieur manicom's explanation has entirely satisfied me d'artagnan glanced at valou and saint agno as much to say well did i not tell you so the king led manicom to the door and then in a low tone of voice said see that monsieur de guiche takes good care of himself and particularly that he recovers as soon as possible i am very desirous of thanking him in the name of every lady but let him take special care that he does not begin again were he to die a hundred times sire he would begin again if your majesty's honor were in any way called in question this remark was direct enough but we have already said that the incense of flattery was very pleasing to the king and provided he received it he was not very particular as to its quality very well very well he said as he dismissed manicom i will see de guiche myself and make him listen to reason and as manicom left the apartment the king turned round towards the three spectators of this scene and said tell me monsieur d'artagnan how does it happen that your sight is so imperfect you whose eyes are generally so very good my sight bad sire 
certainly it must be the case since your majesty says so but in what respect may i ask why with regard to what occurred in the borochine ah ah certainly you pretended to have seen the tracks of two horses to have detected the footprints of two men and have described the particulars of an engagement which you assert took place nothing of the sort occurred pure illusion on your part ah ah said d'artagnan exactly the same with the galloping to and fro of the horses and the other indications of a struggle it was the struggle of de guiche against the wild boar and absolutely nothing else only the struggle was a long and a terrible one it seems ah ah continued d'artagnan and when i think that i almost believed it for a moment but then you told it with such confidence i admit sire that i must have been very short-sighted said d'artagnan with a readiness of humor which delighted the king you do admit it then admit it sire most assuredly i do so now that you see the thing in quite a different light from that in which i saw it half an hour ago and to what then do you attribute this difference in your opinion oh a very simple thing sire half an hour ago i returned from borochine where i had nothing to light me but a stupid stable lantern while now while now i have all the wax lights of your cabinet and more than that your majesty's own eyes which illuminate everything like the blazing sun at noonday the king began to laugh and saint Agno broke out into convulsions of merriment it is precisely like monsieur valot said d'artagnan resuming the conversation where the king had left off he has been imagining all along that not only was monsieur de guiche wounded by a bullet but still more that he extracted it even from his chest upon my word said valot i assure you now did you not believe that continued d'artagnan yes said valot not only did i believe it but at this very moment i would swear it well my dear doctor you have dreamt it i have dreamt it monsieur de guiche's wound a mere dream the bullet a dream so take my advice and prate no more about it well said returned the king monsieur d'artagnan's advice is sound do not speak of your dream to any one monsieur valot and upon the word of a gentleman you will have no occasion to repent it good evening gentlemen a very sad affair indeed is a wild boar hunt a very serious thing indeed repeated d'artagnan in a loud voice is a wild boar hunt and he repeated it in every room through which he passed and left the chateau taking valot with him and now we are alone said the king to saint Agno. what is the name of de guiche's adversary saint Agno looked at the king oh do not hesitate said the king you know that i am bound beforehand to forgive de wad said saint Agno. very good said louis the fourteenth and then retiring to his own room added to himself to forgive is not to forget end of chapter nineteen Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Chapter 20 of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 20 showing the advantage of having two strings to one's bow manicamp quitted the king's apartment delighted at having succeeded so well when just as he reached the bottom of the staircase and was passing a doorway he felt that someone suddenly pulled him by the sleeve he turned round and recognized mandelet who was waiting for him in the passage and who in a very mysterious manner with her body bent forward and in a low tone of voice said to him follow me monsieur and without any delay if you please where to mademoiselle inquired manicamp in the first place a true knight would not have asked such a question but would have followed me without requiring any explanation well mademoiselle i am quite ready to conduct myself as a true knight no it is too late and you cannot take the credit of it we are going to madame's apartment so come at once 
"Ah, ah!" said Manicamp, "lead on, then." And he followed Montalais, who ran before him as light as Galatea. "This time," said Manicamp, as he followed his guide, "I do not think that stories about hunting expeditions would be acceptable. We will try, however, and if need be well, if there should be any occasion for it, we must try something else." Montalais still ran on. "How fatiguing it is," thought Manicamp, "to have need of one's head and legs at the same time." At last, however, they arrived. Madame had just finished undressing, and it was in a most elegant deshabille. But it must be understood that she had changed her dress before she had any idea of being subjected to the emotions now agitating her. She was waiting with the most restless impatience and Montalais and Manicamp found her standing near the door. At the sound of their approaching footsteps, Madame came forward to meet them. Ah, she said, at last. Here is Monsieur Manicamp, replied Montalais. Manicamp bowed with the greatest respect. Madame signed to Montalais to withdraw, and she immediately obeyed. Madame followed her with her eyes in silence until the door closed behind her, and then, turning towards Manicamp, said, what is the matter and is it true as i am told monsieur de manicamp that some one is lying wounded in the chateau yes madame unfortunately so monsieur de guiche yes monsieur de guiche repeated the princess i had in fact heard it rumored but not confirmed and so in truth is it monsieur de guiche who has been thus unfortunate monsieur de guiche himself madame are you aware, Monsieur de Manicamp, said the princess hastily, that the king has the strongest antipathy to duels? Perfectly so, madame, but a duel with a wild beast is not answerable. Oh, you will not insult me by supposing that I credit the absurd fable, with what object I cannot tell, respecting Monsieur de Guiche having been wounded by a wild boar? No, no, monsieur, the real truth is known and in addition to the inconvenience of his wound m de guiche runs the risk of losing his liberty if not his life alas madame i am well aware of that but what is to be done you have seen the king yes madame what did you say to him i told him how m de guiche went to the chase and how a wild boar rushed forth out of the Beaurochin, how m de guiche fired at it and how in fact the furious brute dashed at de guiche killed his horse, and grievously wounded himself. And the king believed that? Implicitly. Oh, you surprise me, Monsieur de Manicamp, you surprise me very much. And Madame walked up and down the room, casting a searching look from time to time at Manicamp, who remained motionless and impassable in the same place. At last she stopped. And yet, she said, everyone here seems unanimous in giving another cause for this wound. "'What cause, madame?' said Manicamp. "'May I be permitted, without indiscretion, to ask your highness? "'You ask such a question? "'You, Monsieur de Guiche's intimate friend, his confidant, indeed. "'Oh, madame, his intimate friend, yes. "'Confidant, no. "'De Guiche is a man who can keep his own secrets, "'who has some of his own, certainly, "'but who never breathes a syllable about them. "'De Guiche is discretion itself, madame.' very well then those secrets which m de guiche keeps so scrupulously i shall have the pleasure of informing you of said the princess almost spitefully for the king may possibly question you a second time and if on the second occasion you were to repeat the same story to him he possibly might not be very well satisfied with it but madame i think your highness is mistaken with regard to the king his majesty was perfectly satisfied with me i assure you in that case, permit me to assure you, Monsieur de Manicamp, it only proves one thing, which is that His Majesty is very easily satisfied. I think your highness is mistaken in arriving at such an opinion. His Majesty is well known not to be contented except with very good reason. And do you suppose that he will thank you for your officious falsehood, when he will learn to-morrow that Monsieur de Guiche had, on behalf of his friend Monsieur de Bragelonne, a quarrel which ended in a hostile meeting a quarrel on m de bragelonne's account said manicamp with the most innocent expression in the world what does your royal highness do me the honor to tell me what is there astonishing in that m de guiche is susceptible irritable 
and easily loses his temper. On the contrary, madame, I know M. de Guiche to be very patient, and never susceptible or irritable, except upon very good grounds. But is not friendship a just ground, said the princess? Oh, certainly, madame, and particularly for a heart like his. Very good. You will not deny, I suppose, that M. de Bragelonne is M. de Guiche's good friend? A great friend. Well, then, M. de Guiche has taken M. de Bragelonne's part, and as M. de Bragelonne was absent and could not fight, he fought for him. Manicom began to smile, and moved his head and shoulders very slightly, as much as to say, Oh, if you will positively have it so, but speak at all events said the princess out of patience speak i of course it is quite clear you are not of my opinion and that you have something to say i have only one thing to say madame name it that i do not understand a single word of what you have just been telling me what you do not understand a single word about m de guiche's quarrel with m de wad exclaimed the princess almost out of temper manicom remained silent a quarrel, she continued, which arose out of a conversation scandalous in its tone and purport, and more or less well-founded, respecting the virtue of a certain lady. Ah, of a certain lady, that is quite another thing, said Manicom. You begin to understand, do you not? Your Highness will excuse me, but I dare not. You dare not, said Madame, exasperated. Very well, then. Wait one moment. I will dare madame madame exclaimed manicom as if in great dismay be careful of what you are going to say it would seem monsieur that if i happen to be a man you would challenge me notwithstanding his majesty's edicts as monsieur de guiche challenged monsieur de wad and that too on account of the virtue of mademoiselle de la valliere of mademoiselle de la valliere exclaimed manicom starting backwards as if that was the very last name he had expected to hear pronounced. "'What makes you start in that manner, Monsieur de Manicom?' said Madame, ironically. "'Do you mean to say you would be impertinent enough to suspect that young lady's honor? "'Madame, in the whole course of this affair, there has not been the slightest question of Mademoiselle de la Valliere's honor. "'What, when two men have almost blown each other's brains out on a woman's behalf, do you mean to say she has nothing to do with the affair, and that her name has not been called in question at all? I do not think you so good a courtier, Monsieur de Manicom. Pray forgive me, madame, said the young man, but we are very far from understanding one another. You do me the honor to speak one language while I am speaking altogether another. I beg your pardon, but I do not understand your meaning." forgive me then but i fancied i understood your highness to remark that de guiche and de wad had fought on mademoiselle de la valliere's account certainly on account of mademoiselle de la valliere i think you said repeated manicom i do not say that monsieur de guiche personally took an interest in mademoiselle de la valliere but i say that he did so as representing or acting on behalf of another on behalf of another come do not always assume such a bewildered look does not every one here know that m de bragelonne is affianced to mademoiselle de la valliere and that before he went on the mission with which the king entrusted him he charged his friend m de guiche to watch over that interesting young lady there is nothing more for me to say then your highness is well informed of everything i beg you to understand that clearly manicom began to laugh which almost exasperated the princess who was not as we know of a very patient disposition madame resumed the discreet manicom saluting the princess let us bury this affair altogether in forgetfulness for it will probably never be quite cleared up oh as far as that goes there is nothing more to do and the information is complete the king will learn that m de guiche has taken up the cause of this little adventuress who gives herself all the airs of a grand lady. He will learn that M. de Bragelonne, having nominated his friend M. de Guiche, his guardian in ordinary, the latter immediately fastened, as he was required to do, upon the Marquis de Wade, who ventured to trench upon his privileges. Moreover, you cannot pretend to deny, M. Manicom, you who know everything so well, that the king on his side casts a longing eye upon this famous treasure, 
and that he will bear no slight grudge against M. de Guiche for constituting himself its defender. Are you sufficiently well informed now, or do you require anything further? If so, speak, monsieur. No, madame, there is nothing more I wish to know. Learn, however, for you ought to know it, monsieur de Manicamp, learn that his majesty's indignation will be followed by terrible consequences in princes of a similar temperament to that of his majesty the passion which jealousy causes sweeps down like a whirlwind which you will temper madame i exclaimed the princess with a gesture of indescribable irony i and by what title may i ask because you detest injustice madame and according to your account then it would be an injustice to prevent the king arranging his love affairs as he pleases you will intercede however in m de guiche's favor you are mad monsieur said the princess in a haughty tone of voice on the contrary i am in the most perfect possession of my senses and i repeat you will defend m de guiche before the king why should i because the cause of m de guiche is your own madame said manicamp with ardor kindling in his eyes what do you mean by that i mean madame that with respect to the defence which m de guiche undertook in m de bragelonne's absence i am surprised that your highness has not detected a pretext in la valliere's name having been brought forward a pretext but a pretext for what repeated the princess hesitatingly for manicamp's steady look had just revealed something of the truth to her i trust madame said the young man i have said sufficient to induce your highness not to overwhelm before his majesty my poor friend de guiche against whom all the malevolence of a party bitterly opposed to your own will now be directed you mean on the contrary i suppose that all those who have no great affection for mademoiselle de la valliere and even perhaps a few of those who have some regard for her will be angry with the comte oh madame why will you push your obstinacy to such an extent and refuse to open your ears and listen to the counsel of one whose devotion to you is unbounded must i expose myself to the risk of your displeasure am i really to be called upon to name contrary to my own wish the person who was the real cause of this quarrel the person said madame blushing must i continued manicamp tell you how poor de guiche became irritated furious exasperated beyond all control at the different rumors now being circulated about this person must i if you persist in this woeful blindness and if respect should continue to prevent me naming her must i i repeat recall to your recollection the various scenes which monsieur had with the duke of buckingham and the insinuations which were reported respecting the duke's exile must i remind you of the anxious care the comte always took in his efforts to please to watch to protect that person for whom alone he lives for whom alone he breathes well i will do so and when i shall have made you recall all the particulars i refer to you will perhaps understand how it happened that the comte having lost all control over himself and having been for some time past almost harassed to death by duat became at the first disrespectful expression which the latter pronounced respecting the person in question inflamed with passion and panted only for an opportunity of avenging the affront the princess concealed her face with her hands monsieur monsieur she exclaimed do you know what you are saying and to whom you are speaking and so madame pursued manicamp as if he had not heard the exclamations of the princess nothing will astonish you any longer neither the comte's ardor in seeking the quarrel nor his wonderful address in transferring it to a quarter foreign to your own personal interests that latter circumstance was indeed a marvellous instance of tact and perfect coolness and if the person in whose behalf the comte so fought and shed his blood does in reality owe some gratitude to the poor wounded sufferer it is not on account of the blood he has shed or the agony he has suffered but for the steps he has taken to preserve from comment or reflection an honor which was more precious to him than his own oh cried madame as if she had been alone is it possible the quarrel was on my account manicamp felt he could now breathe for a moment and gallantly had he won the right to do so madame on her side remained for some time plunged in a painful reverie 
Her agitation could be seen by her quick respiration, by her drooping eyelids, by the frequency with which she pressed her hand upon her heart. But in her, coquetry was not so much a passive quality as, on the contrary, a fire which sought for fuel to maintain itself, finding anywhere and everywhere what it required. If it be as you assert, she said, the Comte will have obliged two persons at the same time, for Monsieur de Bragelonne also owns a deep debt of gratitude to Monsieur de Guiche, and with far greater reason indeed, because everywhere and on every occasion Mademoiselle de la Valliere will be regarded as having been defended by this generous champion. Manicom perceived that there still remained some lingering doubt in the princess's heart, a truly admirable service indeed he said is the one he has rendered to mademoiselle de la valliere a truly admirable service to monsieur de bragelonne the duel has created a sensation which in some respects casts a dishonorable suspicion upon that young girl a sensation indeed which will embroil her with the vicomte the consequence is that de wad's pistol bullet has had three results instead of one it destroys at the same time the honor of a woman the happiness of a man and perhaps it has wounded to death one of the best gentlemen in france oh madame your logic is cold even calculating it always condemns it never absolves manicom's concluding words scattered to the winds the last doubt which lingered not in madame's heart but in her mind she was no longer a princess full of scruples nor a woman with her ever-returning suspicions but one whose heart has just felt the mortal chill of a wound wounded to death she murmured in a faltering voice oh monsieur de manicom did you not say wounded to death manicom returned no other answer than a deep sigh and so you said that the comte is dangerously wounded continued the princess yes madame one of his hands is shattered and he has a bullet lodged in his breast gracious heavens resumed the princess with a feverish excitement this is horrible monsieur de manicom a hand shattered do you say and a bullet in his breast and that coward that wretch that assassin de wad did it manicom seemed overcome by a violent emotion he had in fact displayed no little energy in the latter part of his speech as for madame she entirely threw aside all regard for the formal observances of propriety society imposes for when with her passion spoke in accents either of anger or sympathy nothing could restrain her impulses madame approached manicom who had subsided in a chair as if his grief were a sufficiently powerful excuse for his infraction of the laws of etiquette monsieur she said seizing him by the hand be frank with me manicom looked up is monsieur de guiche in danger of death doubly so madame he replied in the first place on account of the hemorrhage which has taken place an artery having been injured in the hand and next in consequence of the wound in his breast which may the doctor is afraid at least have injured some vital part he may die then die yes madame and without even having had the consolation of knowing that you have been told of his devotion you will tell him i yes are you not his friend i oh no madame i will tell only monsieur de guiche if indeed he is still in a condition to hear me i will only tell him what i have seen that is your cruelty to him oh monsieur you will not be guilty of such barbarity indeed madame i shall speak the truth for nature is very energetic in a man of his age the physicians are clever men, and if by chance the poor Comte should survive his wound, I should not wish him to die of a wound of the heart after surviving one of the body. Manicom rose, and with an expression of profoundest respect, seemed to be desirous of taking leave. At least, monsieur, said madame, stopping him with almost a suppliant air, you will be kind enough to tell me in what state your wounded friend is, and who is the physician who attends him as regards the state he is in madame he is seriously ill his physician is monsieur valot his majesty's private medical attendant monsieur valot is moreover assisted by a professional friend to whose house monsieur de guiche has been carried what he is not in the chateau said madame alas madame the poor fellow was so ill that he could not even be conveyed thither give me the address monsieur said the princess hurriedly 
I will send to inquire after him. Rue de Fura, a brick-built house with white outside blinds. The doctor's name is on the door. You are returning to your wounded friend, Monsieur de Manicamp? Yes, madame. You will be able then to do me a service. I am at your highness's orders. Do what you intended to do. Return to Monsieur de Guiche. Send away all those whom you may find there, and have the kindness yourself to go away too. Madame, let us waste no time in useless explanations. Accept the fact as I present it to you. See nothing in it beyond what is really there, and ask nothing further than what I tell you. I am going to send one of my ladies, perhaps two, because it is now getting late. I do not wish them to see you, or rather I do not wish you to see them. These are scruples you can understand, you particularly, Monsieur de Manicamp, who seem capable of divining so much. Oh, madame, perfectly, I can even do better still. I will proceed, or rather walk, in advance of your attendance. It will, at the same time, be the means of showing them the way more accurately, and of protecting them if the occasion arises, though there is no probability of their needing protection. And by this means, then, they would be sure of entering without difficulty, would they not? Certainly, madame, for as I should be the first to pass, I thus remove any difficulties that might chance to be in the way. Very well. Go, go, Monsieur de Manicamp, and wait at the bottom of the staircase. I will go at once, madame. Stay. Manicamp paused. When you hear the footsteps of two women descending the stairs, go out, and without once turning round, take the road which leads to where the poor count is lying. But if, by any mischance, two other persons were to descend, and I were to be mistaken— you will hear one of the two clap her hands together softly. Go. Manicom turned round, bowed once more, and left the room, his heart overflowing with joy. In fact, he knew very well that the presence of Madame herself would be the best balm to apply to his friend's wounds. A quarter of an hour had hardly elapsed when he heard the sound of a door open softly and closed with like precaution. He listened to the light footfalls gliding down the staircase and then heard the signal agreed upon. He immediately went out, and, faithful to his promise, bent his way, without once turning his head, through the streets of Fontainebleau, toward the doctor's dwelling. End of chapter 20 Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah Chapter 21 of Louise de la Vallière this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Louise de la Vallière by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 21. Monsieur Malicorne, the Keeper of the Records of France. Two women, their figures completely concealed by their mantles, and whose masks effectually hid the upper portion of their faces, timidly followed Manicamp's steps. On the first floor, behind curtains of red damask, the soft light of a lamp placed upon a low table faintly illumined the room, at the other extremity of which, on a large bedstead, supported by spiral columns, around which curtains of the same colour as those which deadened the rays of the lamp had been closely drawn, lay de Guiche, his head supported by pillows, his eyes looking as if the mists of death were gathering, his long black hair, scattered over the pillow, set off the young man's hollow temples. It was easy to see that fever was the chief tenant of the chamber. De Guiche was dreaming. His wandering mind was pursuing, through gloom and mystery, one of those wild creations delirium engenders. Two or three drops of blood, still liquid, stained the floor. Manicon hurriedly ran up the stairs, but paused at the threshold of the door, looked into the room, and seeing that everything was perfectly quiet, he advanced towards the foot of the large leathern armchair, a specimen of furniture of the reign of Henry the Fourth. and seeing that the nurse, as a matter of course, had dropped off to sleep, he awoke her and begged her to pass into the adjoining room. Then, standing by the side of the bed, he remained for a moment deliberating whether it would be better to awaken Guiche in order to acquaint him with the good news. But as he began to hear behind the door the rustling of silk dresses and the hurried breathing of his two companions, and as he already saw that the curtain screening the doorway seemed on the point of being impatiently drawn aside, 
he passed round the bed and followed the nurse into the next room. As soon as he had disappeared, the curtain was raised, and his two female companions entered the room he had just left. The one who entered first made a gesture to her companion, which riveted her to the spot where she stood, close to the door, and then resolutely advanced towards the bed, drew back the curtains along the iron rod, and threw them in thick folds behind the head of the bed. She gazed upon the Comte's pallid face, remarked his right hand enveloped in linen, whose dazzling whiteness was emphasized by the counterpane patterned with dark leaves thrown across the couch. She shuddered as she saw a stain of blood growing larger and larger upon the bandages. The young man's breast was uncovered, as though for the cool night air to assist his respiration. A narrow bandage fastened the dressings of the wound, around which a purplish circle of extravasated blood was gradually increasing in size. A deep sigh broke from her lips. She leaned against one of the columns of the bed and gazed through the apertures in her mask upon the harrowing spectacle before her. A hoarse, harsh groan passed like a death rattle through the corn's clenched teeth. The masked lady seized his left hand, which scorched like burning coals, and at the very moment she placed her icy hand upon it, the action of the cold was such that de Guiche opened his eyes, and by a look in which revived intelligence was dawning, seemed as though struggling back again into existence. The first thing upon which he fixed his gaze was this phantom standing erect by his bedside. At that sight his eyes became dilated, but without any appearance of consciousness in them. The lady thereupon made a sign to her companion, who had remained at the door, and in all probability the latter had already received her lesson, for in a clear tone of voice, and without any hesitation whatever, she pronounced these words, Monsieur le Comte, Her Royal Highness Madame is desirous of knowing how you are able to bear your wound, and to express to you, by my lips, her great regret at seeing you suffer. As she pronounced the word Madame, Guiche started. He had not as yet remarked the person to whom the voice belonged, and he naturally turned towards the direction whence it proceeded. But as he felt the cold hand still resting on his own, he again turned towards the motionless figure beside him. "'Was it you who spoke, madame?' he asked in a weak voice. "'Or is there another person in beside you in the room?' "'Yes,' replied the figure in an almost unintelligible voice as she bent down her head. "'Well,' said the wounded man with a great effort, "'I thank you. Tell madame that I no longer regret to die.' since she has remembered me. At the words to die, pronounced by one whose life seemed to hang on a thread, the masked lady could not restrain her tears, which flowed under the mask, and appeared upon her cheeks just where the mask left her face bare. If de Guiche had been in fuller possession of his senses, he would have seen her tears roll like glistening pearls and fall upon his bed. The lady, forgetting that she wore a mask, raised her hand as though to wipe her eyes, and meeting the rough velvet, she tore away her mask in anger and threw it on the floor. At the unexpected apparition before him, which seemed to issue from a cloud, de Guiche uttered a cry and stretched his arms towards her, but every word perished on his lips, and his strength seemed utterly abandoning him. His right hand, which had followed his first impulse, without calculating the amount of strength he had left, fell back again upon the bed and immediately afterwards the white linen was stained with a larger spot than before. In the meantime, the young man's eyes became dim and closed, as if he were already struggling with the messenger of death, and then, after a few involuntary movements, his head fell back motionless on his pillow. His face grew livid. The lady was frightened, but on this occasion, contrary to what is usually the case, fear attracted. She leaned over the young man, gazed earnestly, fixedly at his pale, cold face, which she almost touched, then imprinted a rapid kiss upon de Guiche's left hand, who, trembling as if an electric shock had passed through him, awoke a second time, opened his large eyes, incapable of recognition, and again fell into a state of complete insensibility. Come, she said to her companion, we must not remain here longer. I shall be committing some folly or other. Madame, Madame, your highness is forgetting your mask, said her vigilant companion. Pick it up, replied her mistress, as she tottered almost senseless towards the staircase. 
and as the outer door had been left only half closed, the two women, light as birds, passed through it, and with hurried steps returned to the palace. One of them ascended towards Madame's apartment, where she disappeared. The other entered the rooms belonging to the maids of honour, namely, on the entresol, and having reached her own room, she sat down before a table, and without giving herself time even to breathe, wrote the following letter. This evening, Madame has been to see Monsieur de Guiche. Everything is going well on this side. See that your news is equally exemplary, and do not forget to burn this paper. She folded the letter, and leaving her room with every possible precaution, crossed a corridor which led to the apartments appropriated to the gentleman attached to Monsieur's service. She stopped before a door, under which, having previously knocked twice in a short, quick manner, she thrust the paper and fled. Then, returning to her own room, she removed every trace of her having gone out, and also of having written the letter. Amid the investigations she was so diligently pursuing, she perceived on the table the mask which belonged to Madame, and which, according to her mistress's directions, she had brought back, but had forgotten to restore to her. Oh, oh, she said, I must not forget to do tomorrow what I have forgotten today. As she took hold of the velvet mask by that part which covered the cheek, and feeling that her thumb was wet, looked at it. It was not only wet, but reddened. The mask had fallen upon one of the spots of blood which, we have already said, stained the floor, and from that black velvet outside which had accidentally come into contact with it, the blood had passed through to the inside and stained the white cambric lining. Oh, oh, said Montalais, for doubtless our readers have already recognized her by these various maneuvers. I shall not give back this mask. It is far too precious now. And, rising from her seat, she ran towards a box made of maple wood, which enclosed different articles of toilet and perfumery. No, not here, she said. Such a treasure must not be abandoned to the slightest chance of detection. Then, after a moment's silence, and with a smile that was peculiarly her own, she added, Beautiful mask, stained with the blood of that brave knight, you shall go and join that collection of wonders, La Valliere's and Raoul's letters, that loving collection indeed, which will some day or other form part of the history of France, of European royalty. You shall be placed under Monsieur Malicorne's care, said the laughing girl as she began to undress herself, under the protection of that worthy Monsieur Malicorne, she said, blowing out the taper, who thinks he was born only to become the chief usher of Monsieur's apartments, and whom I will make keeper of the record and historiographer of the House of Bourbon, and of the first houses in the kingdom. Let him grumble now, that discontented Malicorne, she added, as she drew the curtains and fell asleep. End of chapter 21《Chapter Twenty Two of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twenty Two The Journey. The next day being agreed upon for the departure, the king, at eleven o'clock precisely, descended the grand staircase with the two queens and madame in order to enter his carriage drawn by six horses that were pawing the ground in impatience at the foot of the staircase the whole court awaited the royal appearance in the Verachaval croissant in their travelling costumes the large number of saddled horses and carriages of ladies and gentlemen of the court surrounded by their attendants servants and pages formed a spectacle whose brilliancy could scarcely be equalled. The king entered his carriage with the two queens. Madame was in the same one with Monsieur. The maids of honor followed their example and took their seats, two by two, in the carriages destined for them. The weather was exceedingly warm. A light breeze, which early in the morning all had thought would have proved sufficient to cool the air, soon became fiercely heated by the rays of the sun although it was hidden behind the clouds and filtered through the heated vapor which rose from the ground like a scorching wind bearing particles of fine dust against the faces of the travelers madame was the first to complain of the heat 
Monsieur's only reply was to throw himself back in the carriage as though about to faint, and to inundate himself with scents and perfumes, uttering the deepest sighs all the while; whereupon Madame said to him, with her most amiable expression, "Really, monsieur, I fancied that you would have been polite enough, on account of the terrible heat, to have left me my carriage to myself, and to have performed the journey yourself on horseback." "Ride on horseback!" cried the prince, with an accent of dismay which showed how little idea he had of adopting this unnatural advice. "'You cannot suppose such a thing, madame. My skin would peel off if I were to expose myself to such a burning breeze as this.' Madame began to laugh. "'You can take my parasol,' she said. "'But the trouble of holding it,' replied Monsieur, with the greatest coolness, Besides, I have no horse. What? No horse? replied the princess, who, if she did not secure the solitude she required, at least obtained the amusement of teasing. No horse? You are mistaken, monsieur, for I see your favorite bay out yonder. My bay horse? exclaimed the prince, attempting to lean forward to look out of the door but the movement he was obliged to make cost him so much trouble that he soon hastened to resume his immobility. Yes, said madame, your horse, led by Monsieur de Malicorne. Poor beast, replied the prince, how warm it must be. And with these words he closed his eyes, like a man on the point of death. Madame, on her side, reclined indolently in the other corner of the carriage, and closed her eyes also not, however, to sleep, but to think more at her ease. In the meantime, the king, seated in the front of his carriage, the back of which he had yielded up to the two queens, was a prey to that feverish contrariety experienced by anxious lovers, who, without being able to quench their ardent thirst, are ceaselessly desirous of seeing the loved object and then go away partially satisfied without perceiving they have acquired a more insatiable thirst than ever the king whose carriage headed the procession could not from the place he occupied perceive the carriages of the ladies and maids of honor which followed in a line behind it besides he was obliged to answer the eternal questions of the young queen who happy to have with her her dear husband as she called him in utter forgetfulness of royal etiquette invested him with all her affection stifled him with her attentions afraid that some one might come to take him from her or that he himself might suddenly take a fancy to quit her society anne of austria whom nothing at that moment occupied except the occasional cruel throbbings in her bosom looked pleased and delighted and although she perfectly realized the king's impatience tantalizingly prolonged his sufferings by unexpectedly resuming the conversation at the very moment the king absorbed in his own reflections began to muse over his secret attachment everything seemed to combine not alone the little teasing attentions of the queen but also the queen mother's interruptions to make the king's position almost insupportable for he knew not how to control the restless longings of his heart at first he complained of the heat a complaint merely preliminary to others but with sufficient tact to prevent maria theresa guessing his real object understanding the king's remark literally she began to fan him with her ostrich plumes but the heat passed away and the king then complained of cramps and stiffness in his legs and as the carriages at that moment stopped to change horses the queen said shall i get out with you i too feel tired of sitting we can walk on a little distance the carriage will overtake us and we can resume our places presently the king frowned it is a hard trial a jealous woman makes her husband submit to whose fidelity she suspects when although herself a prey to jealousy she watches herself so narrowly that she avoids giving any pretext for an angry feeling the king therefore in the present case could not refuse he accepted the offer alighted from the carriage gave his arm to the queen 
and walked up and down with her, while the horses were being changed. As he walked along, he cast an envious glance upon the, the courtiers, who were fortunate enough to be on horseback. The queen soon found out that the promenade she had suggested afforded the king as little pleasure as he had experienced from driving. She accordingly expressed a wish to return to her carriage, and the king conducted her to the door, but did not get in with her. He stepped back a few paces and looked along the file of carriages for the purpose of recognizing the one in which he took so strong an interest. At the door of the sixth carriage he saw La Valliere's fair countenance, as the king thus stood motionless, wrapped in thought, without perceiving that everything was ready, and that he alone was causing the delay, he heard a voice close beside him, addressing him in the most respectful manner. It was Monsieur Malicorne, in a complete costume of an equerry, holding over his left arm the bridles of a couple of horses. "'Your Majesty asked for a horse, I believe,' he said. "'A horse? Have you one of my horses here?' inquired the king, trying to remember the person who had addressed him, and whose face was not as yet familiar to him. "'Sire,' replied Malicorne, "'in all events I have a horse here which is at your Majesty's service.' And Malicorne pointed at Monsieur's bay horse, which Madame had observed it was a beautiful creature royally caparisoned this is not one of my horses monsieur said the king sire it is a horse out of his royal highness's stables but he does not ride when the weather is as hot as it is now louis did not reply but approached the horse which stood pawing the ground with its foot malicorne hastened to hold the stirrup for him but the king was already in the saddle restored to good humor by this lucky accident the king hastened toward the queen's carriage where he was anxiously expected and notwithstanding maria theresa's thoughtful and preoccupied air he said i have been fortunate enough to find this horse and i intend to avail myself of it i felt stifled in the carriage adieu ladies then bending gracefully over the arched neck of his beautiful steed he disappeared in a second Anne of Austria leaned forward in order to look after him as he rode away. He did not get very far, for when he reached the sixth carriage he reined in his horse suddenly and took off his hat. He saluted La Valliere, who uttered a cry of surprise as she saw him, blushing at the same time with pleasure. Montalais, who occupied the other seat in the carriage, made the king a most respectful bow and then with all the tact of a woman she pretended to be exceedingly interested in the landscape and withdrew herself into the left-hand corner the conversation between the king and la valliere began as all lovers conversations generally do namely by eloquent looks and by a few words utterly devoid of common sense the king explained how warm he had felt in his carriage so much so indeed that he could almost regard the horse he then rode as a blessing thrown in his way and he added my benefactor is an exceedingly intelligent man for he seemed to guess my thoughts intuitively i have now only one wish that of learning the name of the gentleman who so cleverly assisted his king out of his dilemma and extricated him from his cruel position montalais during this colloquy the first words of which had awakened her attention, had slightly altered her position, and contrived so as to meet the king's look as he finished his remark. It followed very naturally that the king looked inquiringly as much at her as at La Valliere. She had every reason to suppose that it was herself who was appealed to, and consequently might be permitted to answer. She therefore said, sire the horse which your majesty is riding belongs to monsieur and was being led by one of his royal highness's gentlemen and what is that gentleman's name may i ask mademoiselle monsieur de malicorne sire the name produced its usual effect for the king repeated it smilingly yes sire replied ara stay it is the gentleman who is galloping on my left hand and she pointed out malicorne 
who, with a very sanctified expression, was galloping by the side of the carriage, knowing perfectly well that they were talking of him at that very moment, but sitting in his saddle as if he were deaf and dumb. Yes, said the king, that is the gentleman. I remember his face, and will not forget his name, said the king, looking tenderly at La Valliere. Ara had now nothing further to do. She had let Mollycorn's name fall. The soil was good. All that was now left to be done was to let the name take root, and the event would bear fruit in due season. She consequently threw herself back in her corner, feeling perfectly justified in making as many agreeable signs of recognition as she liked to Mollycorn, since the latter had had the happiness of pleasing the king. As will readily be believed, Montelais was not mistaken, and Mollycorn, with his quick ear and his sly look, seemed to interpret her remark as, all goes on well, the whole being accompanied by a pantomimic action, which he fancied conveyed something resembling a kiss. Alas, mademoiselle, said the king, after a moment's pause, the liberty and freedom of the country is soon about to cease. Your attendance on madame will be more strictly enforced, and we shall see each other no more. Your majesty is too much attached to madame, replied Louisa, not to come and see her very frequently, and whenever your majesty may chance to pass across the apartment. Ah, said the king in a tender voice, which was gradually lowered in its tone, to perceive is not to see and yet it seems that it would be quite sufficient for you. Louisa did not answer a syllable. A sigh filled her heart almost to bursting, but she stifled it. You exercise a great control over yourself, said the king to Louisa, who smiled upon him with a melancholy expression. Exert the strength you have in loving fondly, he continued, and I will bless heaven for having bestowed it on you. La Valliere still remained silent, but raised her eyes, brimful of affection, toward the king. Louis, as if overcome by this burning glance, passed his hand across his forehead, and, pressing the sides of his horse with his knees, made him bound several paces forward. La Valliere, leaning back in her carriage, with her eyes half-closed, gazed fixedly upon the king, whose plumes were floating in the air she could not but admire his graceful carriage his delicate and nervous limbs which pressed his horse's sides and the regular outline of his features which his beautiful curling hair set off to great advantage revealing occasionally his small and well-formed ear in fact the poor girl was in love and she reveled in her innocent affection in a few moments the king was again by her side did you not perceive he said how terribly your silence affects me oh mademoiselle how pitilessly inexorable you would become if you would ever to resolve to break off all acquaintance with any one and then too i think you changeable in fact in fact i dread this deep affection which fills my whole being oh sire you are mistaken said la valliere if ever i love it will be for all my life if you love you say exclaimed the king you do not love now then she hid her face in her hands you see said the king that i am right in accusing you you must admit you are changeable capricious a coquette perhaps oh no sire be perfectly satisfied as to that no i say again no no Promise me, then, that to me you will always be the same. Oh, always, sire, that you will never show any of that severity which would break my heart, none of that fickleness of manner which would be worse than death to me. Oh, no, no. Very well, then. But listen, I like promises. I like to place under the guarantee of an oath, under the protection of heaven. In fact, everything which interests my heart and my affections. Promise me, or rather swear to me, that if in the life we are about to commence, a life which will be full of sacrifice, 
mystery, anxiety, disappointment, and misunderstanding. Swear to me that if we should in any way deceive or misunderstand each other, or should judge each other unjustly, for that, indeed, would be criminal in love such as ours, swear to me, Louisa. She trembled with agitation to the very depths of her heart. It was the first time she had heard her name pronounced in that manner by her royal lover. As for the king, taking off his glove and placing his hand within the carriage, he continued, Swear that never in all our quarrels will we allow one night even to pass by, if any misunderstanding should arise between us without a visit, or at least a message from either, in order to convey consolation and repose to the other. La Valliere took her lover's burning hand between her own cool palms, and pressed it softly until a movement of the horse, frightened by the proximity of the wheels, obliged her to abandon her happiness. She had vowed as he desired. Return, sire, she said, return to the queen. I foresee a storm yonder, which threatens my peace of mind and yours. Louis obeyed, saluted Mademoiselle de Montalais, and set off at a gallop to rejoin the queen. As he passed Monsieur's carriage, he observed that he was fast asleep, although Madame, on her part, was wide awake. As the king passed her, she said, What a beautiful horse, sire! Is it not Monsieur's bay horse? The young queen kindly asked, Are you better now, sire? End of chapter 22 Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah Chapter 23 of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 23. Triumph Feminate. On the king's arrival in Paris, he sat at the council which had been summoned and worked for a certain portion of the day. The queen remained with the queen mother, and burst into tears as soon as she had taken leave of the king. Ah, madame, she said, the king no longer loves me. What will become of me? A husband always loves his wife when she is like you, replied Anne of Austria. A time may come when he will love another woman instead of me. What do you call loving? Always thinking of a person always seeking her society. Do you happen to have remarked, said Anne of Austria, that the king has ever done anything of the sort? No, madame, said the young queen hesitatingly. What is there to complain of, then, Marie? You will admit that the king leaves me. The king, my daughter, belongs to his people, and that is the very reason why he no longer belongs to me and that is the reason, too, why I shall find myself, as so many queens before me, forsaken and forgotten, whilst glory and honor will be reserved for others. Oh, my mother, the king is so handsome! How often will others tell him that they love him, and how much, indeed, they must do so! It is very seldom, indeed, that women love the man in loving the king, but if such a thing happened, which I doubt, you would be better to wish, Marie, that such women should really love your husband. In the first place, the devoted love of a mistress is a rapid element of the dissolution of a lover's affection. And then, by dint of loving, the mistress loses all influence over her lover, whose power of wealth she does not covet, caring only for his affection wish therefore that the king should love but lightly and that his mistress should love with all her heart oh my mother what power may not a deep affection exercise over him and yet you say you are resigned quite true quite true i speak absurdly there is a feeling of anguish however which i can never control and that is the king may make a happy choice may find a home with all the tender influences of home not far from that we can offer him a home with children round him the children of another woman oh madame i should die if i were but to see the king's children marie marie 
replied the queen mother with a smile, and she took the young queen's hand in her own. Remember what I am going to say, and let it always be a consolation to you. The king cannot have a dauphin without you. With this remark, the queen mother quitted her daughter-in-law in order to meet Madame, whose arrival in the grand cabinet had just been announced by one of the pages. Madame had scarcely taken time to change her dress. Her face revealed her agitation, which betrayed a plan, the execution of which occupied while the result disturbed her mind. I came to ascertain, she said, if your majesties are suffering any fatigue from our journey. Not at all, said the queen mother. A little, replied Maria Theresa. I have suffered from annoyance more than anything else, said madame. How was that? inquired Anne of Austria. The fatigue the king undergoes in riding about on horseback. That does the king good. And it was I who advised him, said Maria Theresa, turning pale. Madame said not a word in reply, but one of those smiles which were peculiarly her own flitted for a moment across her lips, without passing over the rest of her face. Then, immediately changing the conversation, she continued, We shall find Paris precisely the Paris we quitted, the same intrigues, plots, and flirtations going on. Intrigues? What intrigues do you allude to? inquired the queen mother. People are talking a good deal about Monsieur Fouquet and Madame Placy Valere, who makes up the number to about ten thousand, replied the queen mother. But what are the plots you speak of? We have, it seems, certain misunderstandings with Holland to settle. What about? Monsieur has been telling me the story of the medals. Oh, exclaimed the young queen. You mean those medals struck in Holland, on which a cloud is seen passing across the sun, which is the king's device? You are wrong in calling that a plot. It is an insult, but so contemptible that the king can well despise it, replied the queen mother. Well, what are the flirtations which are alluded to? Do you mean that of Madame de Lone? No, no, nearer ourselves than that. Casa de Usted murmured the queen mother and without moving her lips in her daughter-in-law's ear without being overheard by madame who thus continued you know the terrible news oh yes monsieur de guiche's wound and you attribute it i suppose as every one else does to an accident which happened to him while hunting yes of course said both the queens together their interest awakened madame drew closer to them as she said in a low tone of voice it was a duel ah said anne of austria in a severe tone for in her ears the word duel which had been forbidden in france all the time she reigned over it had a strange sound a most deplorable duel which has nearly cost monsieur two of his best friends and the king two of his best servants what was the cause of the duel inquired the young queen animated by a secret instinct flirtation repeated madame triumphantly the gentlemen in question were conversing about the virtue of a particular lady belonging to the court one of them thought that pelet was a very second-rate person compared to her the other pretended that the lady in question was an imitation of venus alluring mars and thereupon the two gentlemen fought as fiercely as hector and achilles venus alluring mars said the young queen in a low tone of voice without venturing to examine into the allegory very deeply who is the lady inquired anne of austria abruptly you said i believe she was one of the ladies of honor did i say so replied madame yes at least i thought i heard you mention it are you not aware that such a woman is of ill omen to a royal house is it not mademoiselle de la valliere said the queen mother yes indeed that plain-looking creature i thought she was affianced to a gentleman who certainly is not at least so i have heard either monsieur de guiche or monsieur de war very possibly madame the young queen took up a piece of tapestry and began to broider with an affectation of tranquillity her trembling fingers contradicted what were you saying about venus and mars pursued the queen mother is there a mars also 
She boasts of that being the case." "Did you say she boasts of it?" "That was the cause of the duel." "And M. de Guiche upheld the cause of Mars?" "Yes, certainly, like the devoted servant he is." "The devoted servant of whom?" exclaimed the young queen, forgetting her reserve in allowing her jealous feeling to escape. "Mars, not to be defended except at the expense of Venus," replied Madame. "M. de Guiche maintained the perfect innocence of Mars, and no doubt affirmed that it was all a mere boast." "And M. de Wardes," said Anne of Austria, quietly, "spread the report that Venus was within her rights, I suppose?" "Oh! De Wardes," thought Madame, "you shall pay dearly for the wound you have given that noblest, best of men." And she began to attack De Wardes with the greatest bitterness, thus discharging her own and De Guiche's debt, with the assurance that she was working the future ruin of her enemy. She said so much, in fact, that had Monacamp been there, he would have regretted he had shown such firm regard for his friend, inasmuch as it resulted in the ruin of his unfortunate foe. I see nothing in the whole affair but one cause of mischief, and that is La Valliere herself, said the queen mother. The young queen resumed her work with perfect indifference of manner, while Madame listened eagerly. I do not yet quite understand what you said just now about the danger of coquetry, resumed Anne of Austria. It is quite true, Madame hastened to say, that if the girl had not been a coquette, Mars would not have thought at all about her. The repetition of this word Mars brought a passing color to the queen's face, but she still continued her work. I will not permit that, in my court, gentlemen should be set against each other in this manner, said Anne of Austria calmly. Such manners were useful enough, perhaps, in days when the divided nobility had no other rallying point than mere gallantry. At that time, women, whose sway was absolute and undivided, were privileged to encourage men's valor by frequent trials of their courage. But now, thank heaven, there is but one master in France, and to him every instinct of the mind, every pulse of the body are due. I will not allow my son to be deprived of any single one of his servants. And she turned towards the young queen, saying, What is to be done with this La Valliere? La Valliere? said the queen, apparently surprised. I do not even know the name. And she accompanied this remark by one of those cold, fixed smiles only to be observed on royal lips. Madame was herself a princess great in every respect, great in intelligence, great by birth, by pride. The queen's reply, however, completely astonished her, and she was obliged to pause for a moment in order to recover herself. She is one of my maids of honor, she replied with a bow. In that case, retorted Maria Theresa in the same tone, it is your affair, my sister, and not ours. I beg your pardon, resumed Anne of Austria. It is my affair, and I perfectly well understand, she pursued, addressing a look full of intelligence at Madame, Madame's motive for saying what she has just said. Everything which emanates from you, madame, said the English princess, proceeds from the lips of wisdom. If we send this girl back to her own family, said Maria Theresa gently, we must bestow a pension upon her, which I will provide for out of my income, exclaimed madame. No, no, interrupted Anne of Austria, no disturbance, I beg. The king dislikes that the slightest disrespectful remark should be made of any lady. Let everything be done quietly. Will you have the kindness, madame, to send for this girl here? And you, my daughter, will have the goodness to retire to your own room. The dowager queen's entreaties were commands, and as Maria Theresa rose to return to her apartments, madame rose in order to send a page to summon La Valliere. End of chapter 23 Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah Chapter Twenty Four of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter Twenty Four. The First Quarrel. 
la valliere entered the queen mother's apartments without in the least suspecting that a serious plot was being concerted against her she thought it was for something connected with her duties and never had the queen mother been unkind to her when such was the case besides not being immediately under the control or direction of anne of austria she could only have an official connection with her to which her own gentleness of disposition and the rank of the august princess made her yield on every occasion with the best possible grace she therefore advanced towards the queen mother with that soft and gentle smile which constituted her principal charm and as she did not approach sufficiently close anne of austria signed to her to come nearer madame then entered the room and with a perfectly calm air took her seat beside her mother-in-law and continued the work which maria theresa had begun when la valliere instead of the direction which she expected to receive immediately on entering the room perceived these preparations she looked with curiosity if not with uneasiness at the two princesses and seemed full of thought while madame maintained an affectation of indifference that would have alarmed a less timid person even than louisa mademoiselle said the queen mother suddenly without attempting to moderate or disguise her spanish accent which she never failed to do except when she was angry come closer we were talking of you as every one else seems to be doing of me exclaimed la valliere turning pale do you pretend to be ignorant of it are you not aware of the duel between m de guiche and m de Wart? oh madame i heard of it yesterday said la valliere clasping her hands together and you did not foresee this quarrel why should i madame because two men never fight without a motive and because you must be aware of the motive which awakened the animosity of the two in question i am perfectly ignorant of it madame a persevering denial is a very commonplace mode of defence and you who have great pretensions to be witty and clever ought to avoid commonplaces what else have you to say oh madame your majesty terrifies me with your cold severity of manner but i do not understand how i can have occurred your displeasure or in what respect people concern themselves about me then i will tell you m de guiche has been obliged to undertake your defence my defence yes he is a gallant knight and beautiful adventuresses like to see such brave knights couch lances in their honour but for my part i hate fields of battle and above all i hate adventures and take my remark as you please la valliere sank at the queen's feet who turned her back upon her she stretched out her hands toward madame who laughed in her face a feeling of pride made her rise to her feet i have begged your majesty to tell me what is the crime i am accused of i can claim this at your hands and i see i am condemned before i am even permitted to justify myself ah indeed cried anne of austria listen to her beautiful phrases madame and to her fine sentiments she is an inexhaustible well of tenderness and heroic expressions one can easily see young lady that you have cultivated your mind in the society of crowned heads la valliere felt struck to the heart she became not whiter but as white as a lily and all her strength forsook her i wish to inform you interrupted the queen disdainfully that if you continue to nourish such feelings you will humiliate us to such a degree that we shall be ashamed of appearing before you be simple in your manners by the by i am informed that you are affianced is it the case la valliere pressed her hand over her heart which was wrung with a fresh pang answer when you are spoken to yes madame to a gentleman yes madame his name the vicomte de bragelonne are you aware that it is an exceedingly fortunate circumstance for you mademoiselle that such is the case and without fortune or position as you are or without any very great personal advantages you ought to bless heaven for having procured you such a future as seems to be in store for you la valliere did not reply where is the vicomte de bragelonne pursued the queen in england said madame where the report of this young lady's success will not fail to reach him 
oh heaven murmured la valliere in despair very well mademoiselle said anne of austria we will get this young gentleman to return and send you away somewhere with him if you are of a different opinion for girls have strange views and fancies at times trust to me i will put you in a proper path again i have done as much for girls who are not as good as you are probably la valliere ceased to hear the queen who pitilessly added i will send you somewhere by yourself where you will be able to indulge in a little serious reflection reflection calms the ardor of the blood and swallows up the illusions of youth i suppose you understand what i have been saying madame not a word i am innocent of everything your majesty supposes oh madame you are a witness of my despair i love i respect your majesty so much it would be far better not to respect me at all said the queen with a chilling irony of manner it would be far better if you were not innocent do you presume to suppose that i should be satisfied simply to leave you unpunished if you had committed the fault oh madame you are killing me no acting if you please or i will precipitate the denouement of this play leave the room return to your own apartment and i trust my lesson may be of service to you madame said la valliere to the duchess of d'orleans whose hand she seized in her own do you who are so good intercede for me i replied the latter with an insulting joy i good ah oh, mademoiselle you think nothing of the kind and with a rude hasty gesture she repulsed the young girl's grasp la valliere instead of giving away as from her extreme pallor and her tears the two princesses possibly expected suddenly resumed her calm and dignified air she bowed profoundly and left the room well said anne of austria to madame do you think she will begin again i always suspect those gentle patient characters replied madame nothing is more full of courage than a patient heart nothing more self-reliant than a gentle spirit i feel i may almost venture to assure you she will think twice before she looks at the god mars again so long as she does not obtain the protection of his buckler i do not care retorted madame a proud defiant look of the queen mother was the reply to this objection which was by no means deficient in finesse and both of them almost sure of their victory went to look for maria theresa who had been waiting for them with impatience it was about half-past six in the evening and the king had just partaken of refreshment he lost no time but the repast finished and the business matters settled he took saint Agnew by the arm and desired him to lead the way to la valliere's apartments the courtier uttered an exclamation well what is that for it is a habit you will have to adopt and in order to adopt a habit one must make a beginning oh sire said saint Agnew, it is hardly possible for every one can be seen entering or leaving those apartments if however some pretext or other were made use of if your majesty for instance would wait until madame were in her own apartments no pretext no delays i have had enough of these impediments and mysteries i cannot perceive in what respect the king of france dishonors himself by conversing with an amiable and clever girl evil be to him who evil thinks will your majesty forgive an excess of zeal on my part speak freely how about the queen true true i always wish the most entire respect to be shown to her majesty well then this evening only will i pay mademoiselle de la valliere a visit and after to-day i will make use of any pretext you like to-morrow we will devise all sorts of means to-night i have no time saint Agno made no reply he descended the steps preceding the king and crossed the different courtyards with a feeling of shame which the distinguished honor of accompanying the king did not remove the reason was that saint Agno wished to stand well with madame as well as with the queens and also that he did not on the other hand want to displease mademoiselle de la valliere and in order to carry out so many promising affairs it was difficult to avoid jostling against some obstacle or other besides the windows of the young queen's rooms those of the queen mother's and of madame herself looked out upon the courtyard of the maids of honor 
to be seen therefore accompanying the king would be effectually to quarrel with three great and influential princesses whose authority was unbounded for the purpose of supporting the ephemeral credit of a mistress the unhappy saint aignan who had not displayed a very great amount of courage in taking la valliere's part in the park of fontainebleau did not feel any braver in the broad daylight and found a thousand defects in the poor girl which he was most eager to communicate to the king but his trial soon finished the courtyards were crossed not a curtain was drawn aside nor a window opened the king walked hastily because of his impatience and the long legs of saint agno who preceded him at the door however saint agno wished to retire but the king desired him to remain a delicate consideration on the king's part which the courtier could very well have dispensed with he had to follow louis into la valliere's apartment as soon as the king arrived the young girl dried her tears but so precipitately that the king perceived it he questioned her most anxiously and tenderly and pressed her to tell him the cause of her emotion nothing is the matter sire she said and yet you were weeping oh no indeed sire look saint agno and tell me if i am mistaken saint agno ought to have answered but he was too much embarrassed at all events your eyes are red mademoiselle said the king the dust of the road merely sire no no you no longer possess the air of supreme contentment which renders you so beautiful and so attractive you do not look at me why avoid my gaze he said as she turned aside her head in heaven's name what is the matter he inquired beginning to lose command over himself nothing at all sire and i am perfectly ready to assure your majesty that my mind is as free from anxiety as you could possibly wish your mind at ease when i see you are embarrassed at the slightest thing has any one annoyed you no no sire i insist upon knowing if such really be the case said the prince his eyes sparkling no one sire no one has in any way offended me in that case pray resume your gentle air of gaiety or that sweet melancholy look which i so loved in you this morning for pity's sake do so yes sire yes the king tapped the floor impatiently with his foot saying such a change is positively inexplicable and he looked at saint agno who had also remarked la valliere's particular lethargy as well as the king's impatience it was futile for the king to entreat and as useless for him to try to overcome her depression the poor girl was completely overwhelmed the appearance of an angel would hardly have awakened her from her torpor the king saw in her repeated negative replies a mystery full of unkindness he began to look around the apartment with a suspicious air there happened to be in la valliere's room a miniature of athos the king remarked that this portrait bore a strong resemblance to bragelonne for it had been taken when the count was quite a young man he looked at it with a threatening air la valliere in her misery far indeed from thinking of this portrait could not conjecture the cause of the king's preoccupation and yet the king's mind was occupied with a terrible remembrance which had more than once taken possession of his mind but which he had always driven away he recalled the intimacy existing between the two young people from their birth their engagement and that athos himself had come to solicit la valliere's hand for raoul he therefore could not but suppose that on her return to paris la valliere had found news from london awaiting her and that this news had counterbalanced the influence he had been enabled to exert over her he immediately felt himself stung as it were by feelings of the wildest jealousy and again questioned her with increased bitterness la valliere could not reply unless she were to acknowledge everything which would be to accuse the queen and madame also and the consequence would be that she would have to enter into an open warfare with these two great and powerful princesses she thought within herself that as she made no attempt to conceal from the king what was passing in her own mind the king ought to be able to read in her heart in spite of her silence and that had he really loved her he would have understood and guessed everything what was sympathy then if not that divine flame which possesses the property of enlightening the heart 
and of saving lovers the necessity of an expression of their thoughts and feelings. She maintained her silence, therefore, sighing and concealing her face in her hands. These sighs and tears, which had at first distressed, then terrified Louis the Fourteenth, now irritated him. He could not bear opposition, the opposition which tears and sighs exhibited any more than opposition of any other kind. His remarks, therefore, became bitter, urgent, and openly aggressive in their nature. This was a fresh cause of distress for the poor girl. From that very circumstance, therefore, which she regarded as an injustice on her lover's part, she drew sufficient courage to bear not only her other troubles, but this one also. The king next began to accuse her in direct terms. La Valliere did not even attempt to defend herself. She endured all his accusations without according any other reply than that of shaking her head, without any other remark than that which escapes the heart in deep distress, a prayerful appeal to heaven for help. But this ejaculation, instead of calming the king's displeasure, rather increased it. He, moreover, saw himself seconded by St. Agno, for St. Agno, as we have observed, having seen the storm increasing, and not knowing the extent of the regard of which Louis the Fourteenth was capable, felt, by anticipation, all the collected wrath of the three princesses, and the near approach of poor La Valliere's downfall, and he was not true knight enough to resist the fear that he himself might be dragged down in the impending ruin. St. Agno did not reply to the king's questions except by short dry remarks, pronounced half aloud, and by abrupt gestures, whose object was to make things worse and bring about a misunderstanding, the result of which would be to free him from the annoyance of having to cross the courtyards in open day, in order to follow his illustrious companion to La Valliere's apartments. In the meantime, the king's anger momentarily increased. He made two or three steps towards the door as if to leave the room, but returned. The young girl did not, however, raise her head, although the sound of his footsteps might have warned her that her lover was leaving her. He drew himself up for a moment before her with his arms crossed. For the last time, mademoiselle, he said, will you speak? Will you assign a reason for this change, this fickleness, for this caprice? "'What can I say?' murmured La Valliere. "'Do you not see, sire, that I am completely overwhelmed at this moment, "'that I have no power of will, or thought, or speech? "'Is it so difficult, then, to speak the truth? "'You could have told me the whole truth in fewer words "'than those in which you have expressed yourself. "'But the truth about what, sire? "'About everything.' "'La Valliere was just on the point of revealing the truth to the king. "'Her arms made a sudden movement as if they were about to open.' but her lips remained silent, and her hands again fell listlessly by her side. The young girl had not yet endured sufficient unhappiness to risk the necessary revelation. "'I know nothing,' she stammered out. "'Oh!' exclaimed the king. "'This is no longer mere coquetry or caprice. It is treason.' And this time nothing could restrain him. The impulse of his heart was not sufficient to induce him to turn back and he darted out of the room with a gesture full of despair. St. Agno followed him, wishing for nothing better than to quit the place. Louis the Fourteenth did not pause until he reached the staircase, and grasping the balustrade, said, "'You see how shamefully I have been duped?' "'How, sire?' inquired the favorite. De Guiche fought on the Vicomte de Bragelonne's account, and this Bragelonne, oh, St. Agno, she still loves him. I vow to you, St. Agno, that if, in three days from now, there were to remain but an atom of, of affection for her in my heart, I should die from very shame. And the king resumed his way to his own apartments. I told your majesty how it would be, murmured St. Agno, continuing to follow the king, and timidly glancing up at the different windows. Unfortunately, their return was not, like their arrival, unobserved. A curtain was suddenly drawn aside. Madame was behind it she had seen the king leave the apartments of the maids of honor and as soon as she observed that his majesty had passed she left her own apartments with hurried steps and ran up the staircase that led to the room the king had just left end of chapter twenty four recording by dion Drynes, salt lake city utah
Chapter 25 of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 25 Despair. As soon as the king was gone, la Valliere raised herself from the ground and stretched out her arms as if to follow and detain him but when, having violently closed the door, the sound of his retreating footsteps could be heard in the distance, she had hardly sufficient strength left to totter towards and fall at the foot of her crucifix. There she remained, broken-hearted, absorbed, and overwhelmed by her grief, forgetful and indifferent to everything but her profound sorrow, a grief she only vaguely realized, as though by instinct in the midst of this wild tumult of thought la valliere heard her door open again she started and turned round thinking it was the king who had returned she was deceived however for it was madame who had appeared at the door what did she now care for madame again she sank down her head supported by her prie chair it was madame agitated angry and threatening but what was that to her mademoiselle said the princess standing before la valliere this is very fine i admit to kneel and pray and make a pretence of being religious but however submissive you may be in your address to heaven it is desirable that you should pay some little attention to the wishes of those who reign and rule here below la valliere raised her head painfully in token of respect not long since continued madame a certain recommendation was addressed to you i believe la valliere's fixed and wild gaze showed how complete her forgetfulness or ignorance was the queen recommended you continued madame to conduct yourself in such a manner that no one could be justified in spreading any reports about you la valliere darted an inquiring look towards her i will not continued madame allow my household which is that of the first princess of the blood to set an evil example to the court you would be the cause of such an example i beg you to understand therefore in the absence of any witness of your shame for i do not wish to humiliate you that you are from this moment at perfect liberty to leave and that you can return to your mother at blois la valliere could not sink lower nor could she suffer more than she had already suffered her countenance did not even change but she remained kneeling with her hands clasped like the figure of the magdalene did you hear me said madame a shiver which passed through her whole frame was la valliere's only reply and as the victim gave no other signs of life madame left the room and then her very respiration suspended and her blood almost congealed as it were in her veins la valliere by degrees felt that the pulsation of her wrists her neck and temples began to throb more and more painfully these pulsations as they gradually increased soon changed into a species of brain fever and in her temporary delirium she saw the figures of her friends contending with her enemies floating before her vision she heard too mingled together in her deafened ears words of menace and words of fond affection she seemed raised out of her existence as though it were upon the wings of a mighty tempest and in the dim horizons of the path along which her delirium hurried her she saw the stone which covered her tomb upraised and the grim appalling texture of eternal night revealed to her distracted gaze but the horror of the dream which possessed her senses faded away and she was again restored to the habitual resignation of her character a ray of hope penetrated her heart as a ray of sunlight streams into the dungeon of some unhappy captive her mind reverted to the journey from fontainebleau she saw the king riding beside her carriage telling her that he loved her asking for her love in return requiring her to swear and himself to swear too that never should an evening pass by if ever a misunderstanding were to arise between them without a visit a letter a sign of some kind being sent to replace the troubled anxiety of the evening with the calm repose of the night it was the king who had suggested that who had imposed a promise on her and who had sworn it to himself it was impossible therefore she reasoned that the king should fail in keeping the promise which he had himself exacted from her 
unless indeed louis was a despot who enforced love as he enforced obedience unless too the king were so indifferent that the first obstacle in his way was sufficient to arrest his further progress the king that kind protector who by a word a single word could relieve her distress of mind the king even joined her persecutors oh his anger could not possibly last now that he was alone he would be suffering all that she herself was a prey to but he was not tied hand and foot as she was he could act could move about could come to her while she could do nothing but wait and the poor girl waited and waited with breathless anxiety for she could not believe it possible that the king would not come it was now about half past ten he would either come to her or write to her or send some kind word by monsieur de saint agnon if he were to come oh how she would fly to meet him how she would thrust aside that excess of delicacy which she now discovered was misunderstood how eagerly she would explain it is not i who do not love you it is the fault of others who will not allow me to love you and then it must be confessed that she reflected upon it and also the more she reflected louis appeared to her to be less guilty in fact he was ignorant of everything what must he have thought of the obstinacy with which she remained silent impatient and irritable as the king was known to be it was extraordinary that he had been able to preserve his temper so long and yet had it been her own case she undoubtedly would not have acted in such a manner she would have understood have guessed everything yes but she was nothing but a poor simple-minded girl and not a great and powerful monarch oh if he would but come if he would but come how eagerly she would forgive him for all he had just made her suffer how much more tenderly she would love him because she had so cruelly suffered and so she sat with her head bent forward in eager expectation towards the door her lips slightly parted as if and heaven forgive her for the mental exclamation they were awaiting the kiss which the king's lips had in the morning so sweetly indicated when he pronounced the word love if the king did not come at least he would write it was a second chance a chance less delightful certainly than the other but which would show an affection just as strong only more timid in its nature oh how she would devour his letter how eager she would be to answer it and when the messenger who had brought it had left her how she would kiss it read it over and over again press to her heart the lucky paper which would have brought her peace of mind tranquillity and perfect happiness at all events if the king did not come if the king did not write he could not do otherwise than send saint agnon or saint agnon could not do otherwise than come of his own accord even if it were a third person how openly she would speak to him the royal presence would not be there to freeze her words upon her tongue and then no suspicious feeling would remain a moment longer in the king's heart everything with la valliere heart and look body and mind was concentrated in eager expectation she said to herself that there was an hour left in which to indulge hope that until midnight struck the king might come or write or send that at midnight only would every expectation vanish every hope be lost whenever she heard any stir in the palace the poor girl fancied she was the cause of it whenever she heard any one pass in the courtyard below she imagined they were messengers of the king coming to her eleven o'clock struck then a quarter past eleven then half past the minutes dragged slowly on in this anxiety and yet they seemed to pass too quickly and now it struck a quarter to twelve midnight midnight was near the last the final hope that remained with the last stroke of the clock the last ray of light seemed to fade away and with the last ray faded her final hope and so the king himself had deceived her it was he who had been the first to fail in keeping the oath which he had sworn that very day twelve hours only between his oath and his perjured vow it was not long alas to have preserved the illusion and so not only did the king not love her but he despised her whom every one ill-treated he despised her to the extent even of abandoning her to the shame of an expulsion which was equivalent to having an ignominious sentence passed on her and yet it was he the king himself who was the first cause of this ignominy 
A bitter smile, the only symptom of anger which during this long conflict had passed across the angelic face, appeared upon her lips. What, in fact, now remained on earth for her, after the king was lost to her? Nothing. But heaven still remained, and her thoughts flew thither. She prayed that the proper course for her to follow might be suggested. It is from heaven, she thought, that I expect everything. It is from heaven I ought to expect everything. And she looked at her crucifix with a devotion full of tender love. There, she said, hangs before me a master who never forgets, and never abandons those who neither forget nor abandon him. It is to him alone that we must sacrifice ourselves. And thereupon, could any one have gazed into the recesses of that chamber, they would have seen the poor despairing girl adopt a final resolution, and determine upon one less plan in her mind. Then, as her knees were no longer able to support her, she gradually sank down upon the pre and with her head pressed against the wooden cross, her eyes fixed, and her respiration short and quick. She watched for the earliest rays of approaching daylight. At two o'clock in the morning she was still in the same bewilderment of mind, or rather the same ecstasy of feeling. Her thoughts had almost ceased to hold the communion with things of the world, and when she saw the pale violet tints of early dawn visible over the roofs of the palace, and vaguely revealing the outlines of the ivory crucifix which she held embraced, she rose from the ground with a newborn strength, kissed the feet of the divine martyr, descended the staircase leading from the room, and wrapped herself from head to foot in a mantle as she went along. She reached the wicket at the very moment the guard of the musketeers opened the gate to admit the first relief guard belonging to one of the Swiss regiments, and then, gliding behind the soldiers, she reached the street before the officer in command of the patrol had even thought of asking who the young girl was who was making her escape from the palace at so early an hour. End of chapter 25 Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah Chapter 26 of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 26 The Flight. La Valliere followed the patrol as it left the courtyard. The patrol bent its steps towards the right, by the Rue saint Honoré, and mechanically La Valliere turned to the left. Her resolution was taken, her determination fixed. She wished to betake herself to the convent of the Carmelites at Chaillot, the superior of which enjoyed a reputation for severity, which made the worldly-minded people of the court tremble. La Valliere had never seen Paris, she had never gone out on foot, and so would have been unable to find her way, even had she been in a calmer frame of mind than was then the case. And this may explain why she ascended, instead of descending, the Rue saint Honoré. Her only thought was to get away from the Palais Royal, and this she was doing. She had heard it said, the Chaillot looked out upon the Seine, and she accordingly directed her steps towards the Seine. She took the Rue de Coq, and not being able to cross the Louvre, bore towards the church of saint germain l'Auxerre, proceeding along the site of the colonnade, which was subsequently built there by Perrault. In a very short time she reached the quays. Her steps were rapid and agitated. She scarcely felt the weakness which reminded her of having sprained her foot when very young, and which obliged her to limp slightly. At any other hour in the day, her countenance would have awakened the suspicions of the least clear-sighted, attracted the attention of the most indifferent. But at half-past two in the morning, the streets of Paris are almost, if not quite, deserted, and scarcely is any one to be seen but the hard-working artisan on his way to earn his daily bread, or the roistering idlers of the streets, who are returning to their homes after a night of riot and debauchery. For the former the day was beginning, 
and for the latter it was just closing. La Valliere was afraid of both faces, in which her ignorance of Parisian types did not permit her to distinguish the type of probity from that of dishonesty. The appearance of misery alarmed her, and all she met seemed either vile or miserable. Her dress, which was the same she had worn during the previous evening, was elegant even in its careless disorder, for it was the one in which she had presented herself to the Queen Mother, and moreover, when she drew aside the mantle which covered her face in order to enable her to see the way she was going, her pallor and her beautiful eyes spoke an unknown language to the men she met. And unconsciously, the poor fugitive seemed to invite the brutal remarks of the one class, or to appeal to the compassion of the other. La Valliere still walked on in the same way, breathless and hurried, until she reached the top of the Place de Greve. She stopped from time to time, placed her hand upon her heart, leaned against a wall until she could breathe freely again, and then continued on her course more rapidly than before. On reaching the Place de Greve, La Valliere suddenly came upon a group of three drunken men, reeling and staggering along, who were just leaving a boat which they had made fast to the quay. The boat was freighted with wines, and it was apparent that they had done ample justice to the merchandise. They were celebrating their convivial exploits in three different quays, when suddenly, as they reached the end of the railing leading down to the quay, they found an obstacle in their path, in the shape of this young girl. La Valliere stopped, while they, on their part, at the appearance of the young girl dressed in court costume, also halted, and seizing each other by the hand, they surrounded La Valliere, singing, O oh, all ye weary whites who mope alone, come drink and sing and laugh round Venus's throne. La Valliere at once understood that the men were insulting her, and wished to prevent her passing. She tried to do so several times, but her efforts were useless. Her limbs failed her. She felt she was on the point of falling, and uttered a cry of terror. At the same moment, the circle which surrounded her was suddenly broken through, in a most violent manner. One of her insulters was knocked to the left, Another fell rolling over and over to the right, close to the water's edge, while the third could hardly keep his feet. An officer of the musketeers stood face to face with the young girl, with threatening brow and hand raised to carry out his threat. The drunken fellows, at the sight of the uniform, made their escape with what speed their staggering limbs could lend them all the more eagerly for the proof of strength which the wearer of the uniform had just afforded them. "'Is it possible,' exclaimed the musketeer, "'that it can be Mademoiselle de la Valliere?' La Valliere, bewildered by what had just happened, and confounded by hearing her name pronounced, looked up and recognised D'Artagnan. "'Oh, Monsieur D'Artagnan!' It is indeed I. And at the same moment she seized his arm. You will protect me, will you not? she added in a tone of entreaty. Most certainly I will protect you. But in heaven's name, where are you going at this hour? I am going to Chaillot. You are going to Chaillot, by way of La Rappe. Why, mademoiselle, you are turning your back upon it. In that case, monsieur, be kind enough to put me in the right way, and to go with me a short distance. Most willingly. But how does it happen that I have found you here? By what merciful intervention were you sent to my assistance? I almost seem to be dreaming, or to be losing my senses. I happen to be here, mademoiselle, because I have a house in the Place de Greve, at the sign of the Notre-Dame. 
the rent of which I went to receive yesterday, and where I, in fact, passed the night, and I also wished to be at the palace early, for the purposes of inspecting my posts. "'Thank you,' said La Valliere. "'That is what I was doing,' said D'Artagnan to himself. "'But what is she doing? And why is she going to Chaillot at such an hour?' and he offered her his arm, which she took, and began to walk with increased precipitation, which ill-concealed, however, her weakness. D'Artagnan perceived it, and proposed to La Valliere that she should take a little rest, which she refused. "'You are ignorant, perhaps, where Chaillot is?' inquired D'Artagnan. "'Quite so. "'It is a great distance. "'That matters very little.' "'It is at least a league. "'I can walk it.' "'D'Artagnan did not reply. "'He could tell, merely by the tone of a voice, "'when a resolution was real or not. "'He rather bore along than accompanied La Valliere "'until they perceived the elevated ground of Chaillot. "'What house are you going to, mademoiselle?' inquired D'Artagnan. "'To the Carmelites, monsieur.' "'To the Carmelites?' repeated D'Artagnan, in amazement. "'Yes, and since heaven has directed you towards me "'to give me your support on my road, "'accept both my thanks and my adieu.' "'To the Carmelites? Your adieu? "'Are you going to become a nun?' exclaimed D'Artagnan. "'Yes, monsieur.' "'What? You?' There was in this you, which we have marked by three notes of exclamation, in order to render it as expressive as possible, there was, we repeat, in this you, a complete poem. It recalled to La Valliere her old recollections of Blois, and her new recollections of Fontainebleau. It said to her, "'You!' who might be happy with Raoul, you, who might be powerful with Louis, you, about to become a nun. Yes, monsieur, she said, I am going to devote myself to the service of heaven and to renounce the world entirely. But are you not mistaken with regard to your vocation? Are you not mistaken? "'in supposing it to be the will of heaven?' "'No, since heaven has been pleased to throw you in my way. "'Had it not been for you, "'I should certainly have sunk from fatigue on the road, "'and since heaven, I repeat, has thrown you in my way, "'it is because it has willed that I should carry out my intention.' "'Oh!' said D'Artagnan, doubtingly. That is rather a subtle distinction, I think. Whatever it may be, returned the young girl, I have acquainted you with the steps I have taken, and with my fixed resolution. And now I have one last favour to ask of you, even while I return you my thanks. The King is entirely ignorant of my flight from the Palais Royal, and is ignorant also of what I am about to do. "'The king ignorant, you say?' exclaimed D'Artagnan. "'Take care, mademoiselle. You are not aware of what you are doing. No one ought to do anything with which the king is unacquainted, especially those who belong to the court.' I no longer belong to the court, monsieur. D'Artagnan looked at the young girl with increasing astonishment. Do not be uneasy, monsieur, she continued. I have well calculated everything, and were it not so, it would now be too late to reconsider my resolution. All is decided. Well, mademoiselle, what do you wish me to do? In the name of that sympathy which misfortune inspires, 
by your generous feeling, and by your honour as a gentleman, I entreat you to promise me one thing. Name it. Swear to me, Monsieur d'Artagnan, that you will not tell the king that you have seen me, and that I am at the Carmelites. I will not swear that, said d'Artagnan, shaking his head. Why? Because I know the king, I know you, I know myself even, nay, the whole human race, too well. No, no, I will not swear that. In that case, cried La Valliere, with an energy of which one would hardly have thought her capable, instead of the blessing which I should have implored for you until my dying day, I will invoke a curse, for you are rendering me the most miserable creature that ever lived. We have already observed that D'Artagnan could easily recognize the accents of truth and sincerity, and he could not resist this last appeal. He saw by her face how bitterly she suffered from a feeling of degradation. He remarked her trembling limbs, how her whole slight and delicate frame was violently agitated by some internal struggle, and clearly perceived that resistance might be fatal. "'I will do as you wish, then,' he said. "'Be satisfied, mademoiselle. I will say nothing to the king.' "'Oh, thank you, thank you!' exclaimed La Valliere. "'You are the most generous man breathing.' And in her extreme delight she seized hold of D'Artagnan's hands and pressed them between her own. D'Artagnan, who felt himself quite overcome, said, "'This is touching upon my word. She begins where others leave off.' And La Valliere, who in the bitterness of her distress had sunk upon the ground, rose and walked towards the convent of the Carmelites, which could now, in the dawning light, be perceived just before them. D'Artagnan followed her at a distance. The entrance door was half open. She glided in like a shadow, and thanking D'Artagnan by a parting gesture, disappeared from his sight. When D'Artagnan found himself quite alone, he reflected very profoundly upon what had just taken place. "'Upon my word,' he said, "'this looks very much like what is called a false position. To keep such a secret as that is to keep a burning coal in one's breeches pocket and trust that it may not burn the stuff. And yet not to keep it, when I have sworn to do so, is dishonourable. It generally happens that some bright idea or other occurs to me as I am going along. But I am very much mistaken if I shall not now have to go a long way in order to find the solution of this affair. Yes, but which way to go? Oh, towards Paris, of course. That is the best way, after all. Only one must make haste, and in order to make haste, four legs are better than two, and I, unhappily, only have two. A horse, a horse, as I heard them say at the theatre in London, my kingdom for a horse. And now I think of it, it need not cost me so much as that, for at the Barriere de la Confrance there is a guard of musketeers, and instead of one horse I need, I shall find ten there. So in pursuance of this resolution, which he adopted with his usual rapidity, d'Artagnan immediately turned his back upon the heights of Chaillot, reached the guard-house, took the fastest horse he could find there, and was at the palace in less than ten minutes. It was striking five as he reached the Palais Royal. The king, he was told, had gone to bed at his usual hour, having been long engaged with Monsieur Colbert, 
and in all probability was still sound asleep. Come, said D'Artagnan, she spoke the truth. The king is ignorant of everything. If he only knew one half of what has happened, the Palais Royal, by this time, would be turned upside down. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twenty Seven. Showing how Louis, on his part, had passed the time from ten to half-past twelve at night. When Louis left the apartments of the maids of honour, he found Colbert awaiting him, to take directions for the next day's ceremony, as the king was then to receive the Dutch and Spanish ambassadors. Louis the Fourteenth had serious causes of dissatisfaction with the Dutch. The States had already been guilty of many mean shifts and evasions with France and without perceiving, or without caring, about the chances of a rupture, they again abandoned the alliance with his most Christian majesty, for the purpose of entering into all kinds of plots with Spain. Louis the Fourteenth, at his accession, that is to say, at the death of Cardinal Mazarin, had found this political question roughly sketched out, the solution was difficult for a young man, but as at that time the king represented the whole nation, anything that the head resolved upon, the body could be found ready to carry out. Any sudden impulse of anger, the reaction of young hot blood upon the brain, would be quite sufficient to change an old form of policy and create another system altogether. The part that diplomatists had to play in those days was that of arranging among themselves the different coups d'etat which their sovereign masters might wish to effect. Louis was not in that calm frame of mind which was necessary to enable him to determine on a wise course of policy. Still much agitated from the quarrel he had just had with La Valliere, he walked hastily into his cabinet dimly desirous of finding an opportunity of producing an explosion after he had controlled himself for so long a time. Colbert, as he saw the king enter, knew the position of affairs at a glance, understood the king's intentions, and resolved, therefore, to manoeuvre a little. When Louis requested to be informed what it would be necessary to say on the morrow, Colbert began by expressing his surprise that His Majesty had not been properly informed by M. Fouquet. M. Fouquet, he said, is perfectly acquainted with the whole of this Dutch affair. He received the dispatches himself direct. The King, who was accustomed to hear M. Colbert speak in not over-scrupulous terms of M. Fouquet, allowed this remark to pass unanswered and merely listened. Colbert noticed the effect it had produced, and hastened to back out, saying that M. Fouquet was not on all occasions as blamable as at the first glance might seem to be the case, inasmuch as at the moment he was greatly occupied. The king looked up. "'What do you allude to?' he said. "'Sire,' Men are but men, and M. Fouquet has his defects as well as his great qualities. Ah, defects! Who is without them, M. Colbert? Your Majesty hardly, said Colbert boldly, for he knew how to convey a good deal of flattery in a light amount of blame. Like the arrow which cleaves the air notwithstanding its weight, thanks to the light feathers which bear it up. 
the king smiled. "'What defect has Monsieur Fouquet, then?' he said. "'Still the same, sire. It is said he is in love.' "'In love? With whom?' "'I am not quite sure, sire. I have very little to do with matters of gallantry.' At all events, you know, since you speak of it. I have heard a name mentioned. Whose? I cannot now remember whose, but I think it is one of Madame's maids of honour. The king started. You know more than you like to say, Monsieur Colbert, he murmured. I assure you, no, sire. At all events, Madame's maids of honour are all known, and in mentioning their names to you, you will perhaps recollect the one you allude to. No, sire. At least try. It would be useless, sire. Whenever the name of any lady who runs the risk of being compromised is concerned, my memory is like a coffer of bronze, the key of which I have lost. A dark cloud seemed to pass over the mind as well as across the face of the king. Then, wishing to appear as if he were perfect master of himself and his feelings, he said, "'And now, for the affair concerning Holland.' "'In the first place, sire, at what hour will your majesty receive the ambassadors?' "'Early in the morning.' Eleven o'clock? "'That is too late.' Say nine o'clock. That will be too early, sire. For friends, that would be a matter of no importance. One does what one likes with one's friends. But for one's enemies, in that case, nothing could be better than if they were to feel hurt. I should not be sorry, I confess, to have to finish altogether with these marsh birds, who annoy me with their cries. It shall be precisely as your majesty desires. At nine o'clock, therefore, I will give the necessary orders. Is it to be a formal audience? No, I wish to have an explanation with them, and not to embitter matters, as is always the case when many persons are present. But at the same time, I wish to clear up everything with them, in order not to have to begin over again. Your Majesty will inform me of the persons you wish to be present at the reception. I will draw out a list. Let us speak of the ambassadors. What do they want? Allies with Spain, they gain nothing. Allies with France, they lose much. How is that? Allied with Spain, they see themselves bounded and protected by the possessions of their allies. They cannot touch them, however anxious they may be to do so. From Antwerp to Rotterdam is but a step, and that by way of the Scheldt and the Meuse. If they wish to make a bite at the Spanish cake, you, sire, the son-in-law of the King of Spain, could, with your cavalry, sweep the earth from your dominions to Brussels in a couple of days. Their design is, therefore, only to quarrel so far with you, and only to make you suspect Spain so far as will be sufficient to induce you not to interfere with their own affairs. It would be far more simple, I should imagine, replied the king, to form a solid alliance with me by means of which I should gain something, while they would gain everything. Not so, for if by chance they were to have you, or France rather, as a boundary, your majesty is not an agreeable neighbour. Young, ardent, warlike, the king of France might inflict some serious mischief on Holland, especially if he were to get near her. I perfectly understand, Monsieur Colbert, and you have explained it very clearly. 
but be good enough to tell me the conclusion you have arrived at. Your Majesty's own decisions are never deficient in wisdom. What will these ambassadors say to me? They will tell your Majesty that they are ardently desirous of forming an alliance with you, which will be a falsehood. They will tell Spain that the three powers ought to unite so as to check the prosperity of England, and that will equally be a falsehood. For at present the natural ally of your Majesty is England, who has ships while we have none. England, who can counteract Dutch influence in India. England, in fact, a monocle country, to which your Majesty is attached by ties of relationship. Good. But how would you answer? I should answer, sire, with the greatest possible moderation of tone, that the disposition of Holland does not seem friendly towards the court of France, that the symptoms of public feeling among the Dutch are alarming as regards your Majesty, that certain medals have been struck with insulting devices. Towards me? exclaimed the young king, excitedly. Oh, no, sire, no. Insulting is not the word. I was mistaken. I ought to have said, immeasurably flattering to the Dutch. Oh, if that be so, the pride of the Dutch is a matter of indifference to me, said the king, sighing. Your Majesty is right, a thousand times right. However, it is never a mistake in politics, your Majesty knows better than myself, to exaggerate a little, in order to obtain a concession in your own favour. If your Majesty were to complain, as if your susceptibility were offended, you would stand in a far higher position with them. "'What are these medals you speak of?' inquired Louis. "'For if I allude to them, I ought to know what to say.' "'Upon my word, sire, I cannot very well tell you. Some overweeningly conceited device. That is the sense of it. The words have little to do with the thing itself. Very good. I will mention the word medal, and they can understand it if they like. Oh, they will understand without any difficulty. Your Majesty can also slip in a few words about certain pamphlets which are being circulated. Never. Pamphlets befoul those who write them, much more than those against whom they are written. Monsieur Colbert, I thank you. You can leave now. Do not forget the hour I have fixed, and be there yourself. Sire, I await your Majesty's list. True, returned the King. He began to meditate. He had not thought of the list in the least. The clock struck half-past eleven. The king's face revealed a violent conflict between pride and love. The political conversation had dispelled a good deal of the irritation which Louis had felt, and La Vallière's pale, worn features, in his imagination, spoke a very different language from that of the Dutch medals or the Batavian pamphlets. He sat for ten minutes debating within himself whether he should or should not return to La Vallière. But Colbert, having with some urgency respectfully requested that the list might be furnished him, the king was ashamed to be thinking of mere matters of affection where important state affairs required his attention. He therefore dictated, The Queen Mother, The Queen, Madame, Madame de Motteville, Madame de Châtillon, Madame de Navailles, and for the men, Monsieur le Prince, Monsieur de Gramont, Monsieur de Manicon, 
Monsieur de Saint-Aignan, and the officers on duty. The ministers? asked Colbert. As a matter of course, and the secretaries also. Sire, I will leave at once in order to get everything prepared. The orders will be at the different residences to-morrow. Say rather to-day, replied Louis mournfully, as the clock struck twelve. It was the very hour when poor La Valliere was almost dying from anguish and bitter suffering. The king's attendants entered, it being the hour of his retirement to his chamber. The queen, indeed, had been waiting for more than an hour. Louis accordingly retreated to his bedroom with a sigh. But as he sighed, he congratulated himself on his courage, and applauded himself for having been as firm in love as in affairs of state. End of chapter 27